Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Not exactly. You dress like a preacher. If you'll excuse me. Back up, fancy pants. If you ain't no preacher, I figure I'm making you dance some for the folks. You think you can hoorah me? Dude, I said dance. Dance or the next shot will take off one of your toes. I don't think I'd like that. Doc, no. All right, so and put up the gun. Marshal, you got a wild and woolly town here. Marshal, you move aside. I'm going to make this grinning dude kick up his heels for us. I'd say that might be quite a trick, Thorne. Unless he's changed a lot since I last met him. Have you, Doc? Not for the good, Matt. <laughs> I was afraid. Oh, you pacey face tender foot. I said for Shut you... Shut up, Thorne. He's drunk, Doc. He's dead. You just don't know it yet. I'll take it good if you'd meet me later at my office. All right, Matt. To you. Well, that's sure a lot of talk. Now I'm going to shoot that dude's boot heels. Fire one shot and I'll pistol with you, Thorn. What's that? You're kind of forgetting who's holding a gun, ain't you? I wasn't forgetting. Oh, my wrist. You broke my wrist. I doubt it. Now let's go to jail. Oh, you can't put me in jail. I'm Thorn Finley. Move. Oh, you wait till I tell Big Jack about this. And I will, too. Do that. He might be grateful to me for saving your neck. You pulled some fool stunts, Thorn, but you've never been closer to dying than just a minute ago. Do you mean from that fancy pants? Oh, I could handle six like him. That makes you a lot of men. I can name a dozen pretty good gun hands who can't handle one of it. What? That's Doc Holliday. <laughs> Salute, Matt. Salute, Doc. <coughs> it sounds worse, Doc. Yeah, I got orders to go to Arizona. <coughs> Air's dry there, better for my lungs. Going? Thought I might. Wyatt invited me to visit him. He and Virgil and Morgan of the law down there. Some little mining town called Tombstone. <laughs> well, it sounds peaceful anyway. If it isn't, it will be by the time White Herb gets through. He is the peacemaking his man I ever met outside of you. <laughs> Matt, who was the teller head down at the depot, anyway? Oh, Thorne? He's just a spoiled kid. Kid? Couldn't be much younger than you. Sure, but Thorne never grew up. His father has coddled him and protected him and gotten him out of scrapes ever since he was a pup. He's never had to be a man. Not with Big Jack wet nursing him. Big Jack... Big Jack Finley. Oh, you know him? I've heard of him. Well, that figures he owns about half of Kansas. Star in a box runs more cows than he can count. Swings a lot of weight and dodge. Yeah, too much. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, somebody said that Doc Holliday had come into town today and he... Oh, excuse me. (laughs) 
It's all right, Chester. Why don't you shake hands with him? Don't mind if I shake with my left hand. It's a kind of habit. Yeah, I know. Mr. Dillon has the same habit. He would. How about dinner tonight, Matt? Sure, sure. <coughs> How long will you be in Dodge? Not long. <coughs> Just till I finish a chore. Uh-huh. That, uh, chore have anything to do with Big Jack Finley? Might say so. It's gonna kill him. Got to close the door, Mr. Finley. You're going to turn my boy loose? Or I'm going to have to do it for you. You got a writ of habeas corpus? Writ? Thorn didn't commit no crime. The charges are drunk and disorderly, disturbing the peace, and attempted assault with a deadly weapon. I was. You still need a writ. But man, Judd and Nathan does what I say, and you know it. Don't you think I can get a writ? I'm sure you can and will. You always do. Then what's the point, Dylan? It's just a lot of useless red tape. It's a law. Close the door on the way out. All right, Thorne. Didn't I tell you Big Jack would get me out? When are you going to learn you can't play? Save the speech. The law can't touch a Finley. You ought to get smart, Marshal. Like you? Sure, like me. Hi, Big Jack. You okay, son? Fine. Anything else, Mr. Finley? Why, yes. Uh, uh, my boy here is a little boisterous sometimes. I know. High-spirited, you understand? Uh-huh. So? So, I want to put a stop to all this nonsense of yours, arresting him every time he kicks up his heels a bit. Now, go on. Well... I'm offering you a job. Let's say, protecting my interests. Two hundred a month. And no work, naturally. <laughs> I see we understand each other perfectly. No work, of course. All I have to do is just shut my eyes whenever Junior here breaks the law, huh? I said we understand each other. There's no need to elaborate on it, Dylan. There's a big need. Only how do I explain to a person like you that some men don't wear a price tag? Huh? How do I explain how I feel about a so-called respectable citizen making the law his private doormat? Hey, you're nothing but the stupid gunman I've always thought you were. I understand you took the part of Doc Holliday against my son. I kept Thorne from committing suicide, yeah. And you sided with a notorious killer against an important citizen of this community. Now I'm telling you, Dylan. I don't want him in Dodge tomorrow. Doc may be a gunfighter, but he's clear with the law, Finley, and a better man than your son will ever be. What? Why, I... That hurts, doesn't it? You... I'm serving notice, Marshal. You run that killer out of Dodge City, or I'll do it myself. <laughs> Big Jack Finley. Cattleman and self-made king of southern Kansas. No better or worse than most of the men carving empires out of the West. Until love for his son blinded him to the fact that Thorn Fenley had gone bad. And from here on, I knew the war was on between Big Jack and me. So Big Jack Fenley's going to run me out of town, huh? No. Unless I do it first. Oh? I do something naughty, Matt? Well, you threaten a man's life. Oh, <laughs> 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 and just between friends, Matt. Anything else, Doc? Not murder. Murder? I can give him an even break. Uh, with you, that's still murder. Uh, don't you think you better tell me about it? Mm hmm. What if I don't tell you? Now, yeah, then my job's to warn Fenley and try to protect him. You're a tough man to be friends with, Matt. It applies to you, too, doesn't it? Guess maybe it does at that. Didn't realize how I put you on the spot by spouting off my good intentions. Sorry. Oh, forget it, forget it. <coughs> you want to talk to me? <coughs> All right. Remember a girl named Ruth Davis? Mm-hmm. 
Died in a riding accident a few months ago. I always wondered if it wasn't suicide. She lost her brother two weeks before that. No accident. No suicide. You sure? Sure. You know, Ruth and her brother ran the ranch alone. Mm -hmm. A man started pestering Ruth and she hated him. Her brother kicked the man off the ranch. This fellow dry gulped Ruth's brother made it look like a robbery. You have any proof of this? Yeah. Ruth was afraid to go to the law, so she sent a letter to me. Here, read it yourself. She says the man was thinly and says she expects him to try and shut her up for good. Well, that doesn't mean it's Big Jack. I went to see Ruth's folks. They had her belongings. Among them, I found this. Hmm. Watch chain. Engraved J.F. on the clasp. Jack Finley. You see why I've got to kill him, Matt? He forced Ruth's horse over that cliff, sure. But do you still think she died accidental? No. But who's responsible is something for a court to decide. Court? With Finley's money and influence, he wouldn't spend five days in jail even if he was convicted, which he wouldn't be. He doesn't own the court. Maybe not, but it's still the most powerful man in the state against a dead girl whose only friend is Doc Holliday. How do you think a judge will decide? Doc, I'm going to ask you a favor. Make it one I can give. I got an idea, but uh, you must let me handle it my way. Give the law a chance. All right, Matt, I can wait. Thank you. I'll keep this letter in chain for a while. All right, but if the law fails, I'll brace Big Jack Finley when he walks out of the courthouse. And you'll be bracing two men, Doc. Finley and me. Fine day. Well, you're up kind of early just to bring me a weather report, aren't you, Judge Nathan? Huh? Oh, well, I I want to see you. Now go right ahead. You mind if I finish shaving? No, no, please do. Uh, just thought I'd chat with you about the Dr. Uh, Finley. Uh oh. Uh, yes. It seems that Big Jack's very upset by your attitude. I'm not surprised. Feels you're a little rough on his boy. I am. Then his boy's a little rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, perhaps Thorn is high-spirited, like uh, yesterday. Yesterday he was just plain high. Tell me, Judge Nathan, how do you like being on Fenley's payroll? Uh, what? You know, you used to be a pretty decent person. Oh, uh, you can't talk to me like... Yes, I can. I'm sending a copy of Thorn's record to the governor. Governor. And with it, I'm sending a list of the writs you've issued to get him out of jail and a copy of the court records. I've only tempered my justice with mercy, that's all. Thorne's been arrested for 18 offenses, convicted of 10, spent no time in jail, and paid a total of $15 in fines. I'd say you've been very merciful. Um, you said you were sending this to the governor. You haven't actually mailed it yet? No. You got an op. Not that I don't feel justified in any decisions I've made, but uh, such a report might cause undue talk at the Capitol. And ruin your political hopes. Well, my conditions are simple. Get off Finley's payroll now. Very well. And give me cooperation from here on, no matter who's involved. Do that and I shelve the report. I'll do it. Mr. Dillon, trouble's a making. What kind of trouble, Chester? It's Big Jack Finley, Mr. Dillon. He's rounding up his crew at the Alifraganza. They're going to ride Doc Holliday out of town on a rail. Did you cut yourself shaving? for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, don't forget, starting Monday, CBS Radio's tremendous news staff will start bringing you the complete coverage of the Democratic Convention in Chicago. 
As you found during the Republican convention, CBS Radio never misses. So starting Monday, stay with CBS Radio all day and evening for the Democratic convention. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. escort you out of town. On a rail? Yeah, that's the general idea. Here, take a shotgun. Yeah, I'll hide it under the covers, modest-like. Yeah. I'll wait against the wall here. Good. That'll put them in a crossfire. If it comes to that. If there's enough of them, we're in a spot. Yeah, likely we are. You're risking your neck to save me some bruises. One I owe you, friend Matt. It's my job. Still one I owe you. Shoot the man who takes another step. You think you're going to stop us, Dylan? I think so. Me and Doc. Doc. Show him, Doc. Sure thing, Marshal. Look, boys, surprise. I sure do love surprises. Dylan, I've got a dozen men with me. Well, sure, about six of them will die, Finley, if you don't crawl out of here fast. And guess who'll die first, Big Jack? You there, Moncrief. I always figured you for some brains. Get your boss out of here, quick. You sure talking sense, Big Jack. Shut up, Moncrief. You showing yellow. Oh, but man, there's nothing here for us to die over. Listen to him, Finley. That greener Doc is holding has 18 buckshot in each barrel. He'll get slaughtered if he triggers that thing. And I'm getting edgy, Finley. And me, if I get a coughing spell, I'm liable to shoot without meaning to. All right, all right. <laughs> this is twice you have made a Finley back down. You'll never get a third chance. Let's get out of here. Matt, when are you going to arrest him? When I'm ready. Not long. I hope not. Getting impatient to see that man dead. your message, Marshal. I hope it's important. It is, Moncrief. How long you been foreman for Big Jack? Fifteen, sixteen years. You know him pretty well. Would he be the kind to kill a girl? No, of course not. Because he'd kill a man if he got mad enough, but he wouldn't kill no girl, Marshal. Well, I have proof that he did. A girl and her brother. But it doesn't set right. I'm hoping you can help. What's your proof, Marshal? The letter that names Finley as the man. Ruth Davis wrote it before she died. Ruth Davis. And this watch chain was found with her belongings. It's engraved on the back. I know. I uh, was with Big Jack when he bought this chain in Chicago. It was right after his wife died. Big Jack wore it all the time? Mm. You uh, rode the right hunch, Marshal. What? Thorne is your man, just like you figure. He had a yen for the Davis girl, but he kept it quiet. Because he didn't want it known, she throwed him over. But the watch chain... Big Jack gave that to Thorne on his 25th birthday. Whole ranch can testify to that. Mm. Good. All right, thank you, Moncrief. You, uh... Gonna try and arrest Thorne? Why? If Big Jack believes Thorne killed that girl, it'll break his heart. Broke her neck. If he don't believe it... Then? He'll protect Thorne. And, Marshal, there's not enough lawmen in the state of Kansas to make Big Jack give up his son. Yeah? 
Yeah, what it... Oh, it's you, Marshal. And, uh, John Holliday. Doc, this is Judge Nathan. Uh, huh? Holliday? Oh, yes, I've heard of you. I've heard of you, too, Judge. Wonder which has heard the worst. Uh-uh. What's that? Uh, why, I, uh... Judge, I'm here on business. Oh, of course. Uh, come in, won't you? In my study here, so we won't be disturbed. Now, what is it, Marshal? I want you to swear out a warrant for Thorn Finley's arrest. Charge murder. You sure you want to go with me, Doc? I'm sure. <coughs> All right, hold up your right hand. Oh, no, Matt, you wouldn't make me a llama. If you go, you go as my deputy. I'm not letting you make this a private fight. And with my friends, if they hear I wore a star. All right, Matt, it's your show. You swear to uphold and enforce the laws of this community, the state of Kansas, and the United States to the best of your ability as deputy marshal, so help you God. All of that? All of that. I swear. Here, pin on this badge. All right, man. You know, I'm feeling this badge is going to cramp my style something terrible. Better breathe our horses going up through this pass. We've still got a good ride ahead. How far? Oh, about ten miles. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Matt? Will they fight? Well... on the other side of the pass behind you. That's being smart, Dylan. Queen will drop you if you touch her gun butt. You're handy at this bushwhacking, aren't you, Thorne? If Doc He's is... all right. My slug seems to have bounced off his thick skull. Good. Yeah, let's pull your teeth. Yeah, better you do it. With your left hand, reach down and across slow. Pull your gun out with your fingertips and toss it away. Nervous? Just cautious. Or maybe this queen doesn't exist, huh, Thorne? Queen! Queen's one of Dad's men, but uh, I pay him extra to work for me. Any more questions? I guess not. There's my gun. The rifle next. I, uh, I got a pen knife in my pants pocket. You know why Holiday came to Dodge? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you do. You wouldn't be riding with him. Well, he's not going to tell any stories to my dad or anyone else. Uh, you can't kill us, you stupid... Not planning on killing you. And what have you got planned? A queen's kind of a magician. He's going to make Holiday just disappear. Folks won't care much about one of his kind. I would. I'd care so much I'd hang you for it. No. No, with Holiday gone, it's your word against mine. And you won't be able to approve a thing, Dylan. You sure of that? I'm sure. Otherwise, I'd take care of you along with Holiday. Now get out and start walking back to town. It's like I told you. Law can't touch a Finley. <laughs> no time for heroics, so I walked. When I reached a turn, I cut back through the rocks, but it was too late. They were gone. And with them, the horses, guns, and Doc Holliday. Two miles up the road, I found my horse turned loose. And with a mind full of cold hate, I raced onto the star in a box. On the front porch of the ranch house was one of Big Jack's men. Hold it right there. Out of my way, mister. I'm in no mood to shake hands. Where are you heading, lawman? You don't hear well. Hey, Dylan! Where's Holly?
holiday for How me. should I know? Get off my ranch. And where's that prize son of yours? What? Trot him out. I want him. Do you now? What on earth for? Thorne, put that gun away. Oh, no. This is just in case the marshal loses his temper. I've lost it, Junior. Sure. Dylan, I've had all I'm going to stand from you. You just think you have. Where's Holiday, Thorne? Where'd Queen take him? Holiday? Why, I haven't the faintest idea. Where is Queen, Dad? The righty fence line, but... See, Marshal, we don't know where your friend is. You're under arrest, Thorne. What's that? Ask him to show the warrant. Here. Read it, Finley. What? Oh, no. No, that's not possible. The judge wouldn't issue a warrant without proof. He has proof, Thorne. This is a lie. Thorne couldn't be guilty of murder. No. Take a look at his face. Son. Daddy's trying to frame me. Don't let him get away with this. No, I won't. I won't. Get out, Dylan. Man, open your eyes. This is not going to help you. You heard me. I don't believe you, your warrant, or your proof. I believe my son. So get off this ranch. Get out of the state. You let me see you again, so help me, I'll kill you myself. Forget me, you're back in the law, you can't. I'm in do my own law. You so do I. Doc Holliday. But you're supposed to be dead. Queen was supposed Queen's to be. the one who's dead. I carry a knife in my boot just for men like him. Thorn. God help me. You are guilty. He sure is. And if he knows any prayers, he'd better get them over with. No, Doc. He goes back with us as our prisoner. You're wrong, Marshal. I'll take care of my son. Dad. Dad, no. You rotten, lying, murderous. Please, pup. please don't. I Dad. should have strangled Stand you in the me. cradle when you were. Stand away, I'll shoot, I'll shoot you all. Manley, look out. I threw myself at Finley and Buck, but set the floor rolling away from Thorn as he raised his gun to fire. Then in the doorway, the blood stained, terrible figure of Doc Holliday went into action. His pale hands blurred over his holster. Ah! Ruth Thorne! Ruth? Thanks, Chester. You sure you won't stay around a while, Doc? Yeah, we're good friends, Matt, but you're a peace officer. I guess I'm not a very peaceful man. <laughs> you could be, Doc. <laughs> no, I'm not going to change, and you shouldn't. Law needs men like you. No, if I stayed there, there's too good a chance I might cross you. Yeah. Then I'd have to meet you over gun barrels, and it's one thing I'm afraid of. So long, Matt. Good luck, Doc. My. I never would have thought Doc Holliday was scared of meeting anyone in a gunfight. Hmm. You don't understand, Chester. Doc's afraid because he might beat me. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Harry Bartell as Doc Holliday, with Lee Millar, Nestor Piva, Ralph Moody, and Tom Tully. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week. As Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Sunday evenings, we invite you to join lovely Doris Day, Spring Byington playing a December Bride, and Audrey Totter as Millie. They're here on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.
city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Morning, Chester. Matt, I've got to talk to you. Sure. Uh, Chester? Uh, you folks will have to excuse me. I, I can't be puttering around the office all day. I'll be in the back if you want me. Yeah? Matt, he's here in Dodge City. I just saw him. He came in on the morning train. You mean Ed Beaudry? Yes. It's been four years, Matt. I'd begun to hope he'd forget. Hope he wouldn't find us. From what you've told me, Beaudry doesn't sound like a man who ever forgets. He's come here looking for Bert. To kill him, he swore he would. Matt, what are we going to do? I don't know. What's Bert think about it? He doesn't know yet. He's busy at the blacksmith shop. Ma Matt, you've got to help us. You're the only real friend we have out here. It might make it easier if I weren't, Jeannie. <laughs> I'm supposed to maintain law and order and dodge. That's my job. Doesn't leave much leeway to mix in on personal quarrels. Well, there's no quarrel. It's just that Ed Beaudry's a hot-tempered fool. Bert never did anything to him. He married you, didn't he? A woman has a right to change her mind, Matt. Maybe Beaudry doesn't think so. Matt, you... You promised me once in Louisville... Yeah. Yeah, I know. All right, Jeannie, go on home and... Uh... Don't say anything to Bert. I'll talk to Beaudry. Thank you. I'll never forget it. I... I... Goodbye, man. Chester. Yes, sir, I'll, I'll be right there, Mr. Dillon. Did Ms. Wells leave? Yeah. Fine couple of Wellses. Did you know them before they came out west? Uh, not Bert. I do, Mrs. Wells. I guess we better drop over to the Texas Trail, Chester. There's a fellow in town planning to do some killing. <laughs> Long time. Are you kidding? Hello, Chester. Uh, Miss Kitty. Uh, come sit down, Matt. Tell me about things. I can't right now, Kitty. We're looking for a fellow. Thought he might have come in here. Sooner or later, they all do. Stranger, Matt? Uh, yeah. He came in on the morning train. His name's Ed Beaudry. Oh, him? There, the bar, Matt. Third from the end, next to Tulsa Jim Nixon. He's buying Irish whiskey for everybody. Thank you, Kitty. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. Watch yourself, Matt. Yeah, sure, Kitty. I'll see you later. All right, bartender. Set up another round of Jamesons for the house. Yeah. Your name, Beaudry? Well, that's right, mister. Matt Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal here. I'd like to talk to you. Fine. Go ahead and talk. Uh, Tulsa... Suppose you'll move on down the bar for a couple of minutes, huh? No, well, now, uh, dear Marshal, this man's a friend of mine. You're not very particular about your friends. Now, go on, Tulsa. Drift. Mr. Beaudry, you, uh, you came here to kill Bert Wells, didn't you? Did I? Well, here's some advice. Don't do it. Take the next train and get out of town. Is that official? Just what's the charge, Marshal? None. Yet. 
Murder if you go through it. Well, not the way I understand it. Murder's one thing. Calling a man in a fair fight, that's another thing. Baudry, I'm the law here in Dodge, and I don't see it as a fair fight. Bert's a blacksmith, and he's not used to handling a gun. You are. Or so I'm told. Who told you, Marshal? I don't know anybody here. And... Wait a minute. Dylan? Yeah. I heard Jeannie mention you. You knew her back in Louisville before she ran off. We'll with leave her out of this, Pudry. So that's it. This isn't official. You're just doing a personal favor for an old friend. Probably a very close friend. Jeannie always did have a weak. I warned you once. All right, hold it. Now get up, Baudry. That was a mistake, Dylan. Now I'll have to kill you, too. I'm not a blacksmith, Baudry. I'll look you up just soon as I've finished with Bert Wells. If you kill Bert, you won't have to look me up. sometime. Has he been bothering Jeannie? No, she just happened to see him get off the train this morning. She came and told me. She shouldn't have done it, Matt. It's not your problem. Maybe it is, Bert. I'm the law in Dodge, and the law doesn't like the idea of personal grudges ended up in a killing. What do you aim to do? Yeah, prevent it if I can. Well, I wish you luck. You haven't worn that gun for two years, Bert. Why start now? I've got no choice, Matt. You know that. You mean you got no chance. If you let Baudry call a showdown, he'll kill you. Maybe. Look, Bert, why don't you take to the prairie, hold up for a week or so while I figure some way of running Baudry out of town, huh? Would you do it, Matt? Hide out and let somebody else do your fighting for you? Well, what I'd That's do is... That's beside the point, Bert. Jeannie. There's a law against killing. And it's Matt's job to enforce it. If you went away, there wouldn't be any fight. Wouldn't be much honor either, Jeannie. Man can't run and still call himself a man. He can run from a mad dog. And that's what Ed Baudry is. He never had any claim on me. It appears he thought he did. Matt, you know where Baudry stand? I talked to him in the Texas Trail. He probably took one of the rooms upstairs. Like to walk over there with me? Well, if that's the way you want it. No, Bert, you... you... I'll get my hat. Be right with you. Matt, you've got to stop it. Yeah? How? I don't know. But there must be something you can do. Yeah, there is. Boy, it's shaping up. I can probably arrest the survivor. Still time to turn back, Bert. Afraid not, Matt. I should have had it out with Baudry back there in Kentucky five years ago. Jeannie wanted to run away and avoid trouble, and she was so beautiful it was hard to argue with her. Yeah, I know. Be hard on her if anything happened to you. Life's always hard on a woman, I guess. Worse out here on the prairie. Look out for her, Matt, in case I... Well, I mean, if anything... Mr. Dillon? Huh? Oh, what is it, Chester? Bode, we left the saloon a little while ago. Went over to the livery stable to hire a horse. Oh? I think he's riding out to your place, Mr. Wells. He's been doing a lot of talking. Jeannie will be there alone, Matt. I better get back home. It won't be necessary. Here comes Bode now. 
I won't draw unless he does, man. Heads up, Chester. Yes, sir. Just riding out to call on you, Wells. I decided you'd had plenty of time to look me up. No reason to, Baudry. Most men would figure they had reason. Somebody been in a local saloon, telling their wife's history. What? Baudry, you... All right, hold it. Don't draw, Bert. Chester, cover Baudry. Just keep your hands still, Mr. Baudry. You're fast with that gun, Dylan. Fast enough, Mr. Baudry. You make Baudry. a good bodyguard. Too bad you can't ride her 24 hours a day. I told you what to expect if you keep pushing this thing, Mr. Baudry. Now use some sense and get out of town while you're still alive. I've been in lots of towns, Dylan. I left them all alive. Wells, I've been planning to kill you for five years. Plans don't always work out. Listen, Will. You got till sundown. After that, I'm going to shoot you on sight. All right, Mr. Baudry. If you've finished speaking your piece, move along. Why, surely, Mr. Dillon. See you later. Well, still a couple of hours before sundown. I think I'd like to spend them with Jeannie. I'll see you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Goodbye, Bert. I declare I, I just can't see any way of stopping it, Mr. Dillon. I can't either. I'd sure hate to be in Bert Wells' shoes. I'd hate worse to be in Baudry's. He'll never submit to arrest. Chester, I'm going to have to kill him. Why don't you relax, Matt? You're nervous as a cat. Yeah, and I'll stay nervous, Kitty, until I find out what's happened to those two. Baudry slipped out the back way just at dusk. The piano player saw him. Yeah. Well, Bert pulled the same trick. I had a couple of boys watching the blacksmith shop, but he managed to give them a slip. There's nothing you can do now, Matt. Well. Uh, Another killing. And you in the middle again. Why, Matt? Why do you do it? It's a job, Kitty. Somebody's got to do it. But why you? There are other things in life if you look around for them. Well, maybe I will someday. Will you look my way, Matt? Well, Matt, I... I brought my kit. I'm all prepared. Ah, uh, where are the victims? No victims yet, Doc. You're jumping the gun. Well, I understand it's going to be a real showdown. The boys at the bar are offering two to one on Baudry. That's about the odds, I figure, if the shooting really starts. Oh, it'll start all right. Oh, there's not a thing in the world can stop it. Dill? Chester, what are you doing in here? I told you to watch that street. Yes, sir, I know you did. The fight's as likely to start out there as any place else. No, sir, Mr. Dillon. I guess there's not going to be any fight. What? They just found Baudry lying in an alley down the block. Matt. Somebody sneaked up behind him with a hammer. He's sure dead. We'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, what is the connection between the statue in the square and a pair of thugs who are definitely not on the square with the law? Tonight on Gangbusters, hear the complete details of this exciting case taken from actual police files. Remember, it's Gangbusters later tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. Don't miss it. Now... The second act of Gunsmoke. Mr. 
No light showing around the house, Mr. Dillon. No. Another shop either. He might have skipped out. Well, what about his wife, though? I don't know, Chester. I can't figure any of this. It's not like Bert to pull a sneaking trick like that. Hold it. Don't move. He's there by the tree, Chester. Yes, sir. Bert. Who is it? Who's that? Matt. Chester's with me. You better put away the gun. All right, Matt. I thought it was somebody else. Who, Bert? We... You know who. Baudry, of course. Guess I better take your gun. Official, Matt? Official. Well, I got no quarrel of the law. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Now, why did you do it? What do you mean? If it had been a gunfight, the law couldn't have touched you. Now, the circumstances are all in your favor. But this way, they'll call it murder. And they'll be right, because that's what it was. Matt, what are you talking it's about? It's no use. You left the hammer lying right beside his body. It's got your shop brand carved in the handle of it. Whose body are you talking about? You mean Baudry? Yeah, sure, Baudry. Matt, you're making a mistake. I went looking for Baudry, yes, but I didn't find him. Then I come back here. I was afraid to leave Jeannie there in the house alone. I, I didn't do it, Matt, you're wrong. It's not up to me, Bert. It's the court's job. All I can do is take you in. The evidence is too strong and I got no choice. No choice? I didn't have a choice either. We must have had a choice somewhere back down the line. When? Where was it we could have stopped and turned back? I'm a marshal, not a philosopher. Now, let's go. What about Jeannie? I've got to tell her. Chester will take care of it. It'd be better if you'd do it, Matt. You're a friend. That'd make it easier. I'd rather not if you don't mind. Now, come on, let's go. <laughs> Step inside. Four years we've been friends, Matt. I never thought it would come to this. Neither did I. You said you didn't find any money on him. It could have been robbery. I made to look like robbery. But either way, there's nothing I can do. Now, you better step inside. I'll, uh... I'll bring you some blankets and tobacco. If you want anything else, let me know. Wish I knew how Jeannie was taking it. She'll be all right. She's a fine girl. Matt. Matt, look out for her, will you? Bert, a man's job is one thing, friendship's another. This prairie country is rough and tough and wild at the best. And without the law, nobody could survive in it. And that means putting friendship aside sometimes. But a man still doesn't forget. Yeah, I, I'll look out for her. Thanks, Matt. I'll see you later. Well, you get your prisoner... Tucked in safely, Matt. What about Baudry? He's dead. Absolutely dead. Like I never saw anybody any deader. Blacksmith hammer makes a mighty fine weapon. Yeah. At least for sneaking up behind. I can't figure Bert doing that. It's not like him. Sometimes a man changes under pressure, Doc. Yeah, I can't figure it either. What would you say his chances are? Bad. Straws all point one way. Hmm. Yes, maybe somebody's been messing with the straw stack. Who? That's a good question, man. Well, the court will ask it. Yeah, if he ever gets there. What do you mean? I just come from Texas Trail a while ago, and some of the boys are kind of riled up. They're talking real loose. No law against talking. Yeah, doubt if they aim to leave it at talking, Matt. They figure the evidence is a little on the weak side. 
A court might turn Bert loose. So they're saying it's up to them. Yeah, they're just mad because they've lost their source of free drinks. Well, maybe so, but you better keep your eyes open, Matt. Yeah, I know that pack, Doc. They hunt in the dark and pull down stragglers, and mostly they just talk. So don't worry. Bert's in jail, and that's where he's going to stay. <laughs> I want to see Bert. No visitors after dark. It's a jail rule. Rules don't have to be enforced. Mine do. Bert's a prisoner, same as any other prisoner. He's charged with murder. He didn't do it, Matt. It's not for me to say. But you know he didn't. You know Bert. You know he wouldn't do a thing like that. Sneak up behind a man's back in the dark. I'm not the court, Jeannie. I know. And they'll believe he did it. Yeah, the night train's coming in. I hope it's not bringing in trouble. The morning train did. Matt, I want to see Bert. I told you that you... Why, you little fool. <laughs> Give me the gun, Jamie. No, I warn you, Matt, stay Give back. Give me the gun. No, Matt. So help me, I I'll... said hand it over. <laughs> What did you hope to gain by I that? I don't know. Get Bert out. Maybe I don't know. None of this is his fault. Something's got to be done. Matt, you've got to help me. Easy. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? I, I just come from the Texas Trail. I think there's going to be some trouble. Trouble? The bunch that hangs out around there are doing a lot of drinking and talking up the idea of coming over here to the jail. Oh, no. Well, maybe we ought to go over there and do some talking ourselves. Jenny, I think the best thing for you to do is to go back home and stay there till morning. But... Now, don't worry about this. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, but, Matt, you can't handle that crowd alone. I've been handling things alone for a long time. All right, Chester. <laughs> Both of Jim Nixon's the one who's been agging him on, Mr. Dillon. Over there at the end of the bar. Yeah, he struck up an acquaintance with Baudry when he first got off the train. Guess he figures he's an old partner by now. Well, come on. Yes, sir. Matt, Matt, wait. Later, Kitty, I got some business with the boys at the bar. That's what I mean. Tulsa Jim's been buying them drinks the last two hours. They're in a real nasty mood. So? So be careful, Matt. That's all. Just be careful. Kitty, I'm the carefulest man you know. Sure, sure. We got the law here in Dodge. Supposedly. But what kind of a law is it that lets a man sneak up behind somebody in the dark and murder him in cold blood? I don't know, Tulsa. Suppose you tell me. Dylan. Now, don't let me interrupt you. You were doing fine. Well, this is quite an audience you got. All the panhandlers, bums, and barflies and dodge. It's quite a collection. Well, calling names won't change the facts, Dylan. What facts? A friend of yours, Bert Wells, had sneaking, cowardly murder. That's for the court to decide, Tulsa. The court. They'll turn them loose. They work hand in glove with you. Dylan, we're not going to stand for it. All right, shut up! So you're not going to stand for it, huh? Well, just what are you planning to do? You'll find out in due time, Dylan. Go I tend to set them up again all around. Yeah, you've turned into quite a free spender, Tulsa. I never knew you to... A ah, double eagle gold piece. You mind if I take a look at it? It's good. 
Don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Where'd you get it? That's my business, Dylan. So you're the one who killed Baudry. That's a lie. I thought robbing him was just a cover-up, but it wasn't. There aren't many double eagles around Dodge. Baudry had a lot of them. Now you. Why would you get a pocket full of gold pieces, Tulsa? Wells killed Baudry. The blacksmith hammer was lying right beside him. Yes, where you left it. Uh, what does she mean? Tulsa Jim came into my husband's shop late this afternoon. His horse had thrown a shoe. He had plenty of chance to steal that hammer. She's lying. Where did you get the gold, Tulsa? Lies. A liar. I won it. Well, I won it in the poker game. Last week when... Oh, when the trail herd would... Tulsa, you're under arrest for murder. No. No, you'll never take me! All right, Doc. You better get up an inquest. Confounded match. You you never give me any chance to practice on live people. Yeah. You wouldn't know what to do with them, Doc. Well, I I do get fewer complaints this way. Matt. Matt, does this mean that Bert's free? You shouldn't have come here, Jeannie. Yeah, he's free. Chester will go with you over to the jail and let him out. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for everything. You told me one time in Louisville that... Louisville? That was a long time ago and a long way off. So, uh... Goodbye, Jeannie. Goodbye, Matt. What's it all about, Matt? What? (laughs) What's anything all about, Kitty? Professor... What do you say? Well, let's have a little tune, huh? Why, sure thing, Mr. Dillon. What'd you like to hear? Oh, uh, how about that one of Foster's, uh, Jeannie. Jeannie with the light brown hair. You bet. You knew her before, didn't you, Matt? Yeah, I met her in Louisville one summer. Saw her quite a lot for a couple of months. And then I drifted out west. A man misses out on things by drifting. I told her then if she ever needed help to to call on me. Well, she called, and you helped her. Yeah, I guess. Oh, well, anyway, uh, that's that. Matt. Yeah. Yeah, Kitty. When are you going to help yourself? Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in our cast were Tom Tully, Lynn Allen, Larry Dobkin, Georgia Ellis, and Barney Phillips. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. What are the tunes most people like best? For the answer to that question, listen to Robert Q. Lewis's Waxworks later tonight over most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for Broadway is My Beat, which follows immediately over most of these same radio stations. Roy Rowan speaking. On a Sunday afternoon, the music's delightful on the CBS Radio Network.
Dodge City and in the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. They told us a man we'd been looking for, a murderer, was in a cow camp on the north fork of the Canadian River, about 100 miles south of Dodge. So Chester and I rode down to take a look. We found a fellow there with a right name but the wrong face. So we started back. First night, we camped in a dry, buffalo-rutted depression. The next morning, I woke shortly after daybreak to find Chester already cooking breakfast. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Uh, Meat will be done soon. Uh, this is a coffee made, Chester. That's what I need. It's uh, boiling. I didn't make much, though. I thought I'd better save our water. You know, Chester, I'll bet right now the doc's back there in St. Louis holed up in some fancy hotel and still asleep. <laughs> That's quite a thought, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Him right in the middle of St. Louis and us way out here on the prairie. <laughs> I'll bet he's even got sheets on his bed. I wouldn't be surprised, Mr. Dillon. Doc said this was one vacation he was going to splurge on. <laughs> he's riding the Santa Fe both ways. Huh? Well, meat's done. I cleaned off this rock here to cut it on. Oh, good. Oh, well, you got it warm anyway. Well, now, meat shouldn't be overcooked, Mr. Dillon. That takes a taste clean out of it. Now, then we ought to be able to taste everything about this steer. Eggman's disappointment. How's that, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Never mind, Chester. Now, how come you woke up so early this morning? Oh, I always do. Seems as soon as it gets daylight, my feet start to sweat, and then I just got to get up. <laughs> well, that's as good a reason as any, I guess. Wow. Looks like we got company, Chester. What? Oh. Where? Right out there. Heading straight for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some cowboy, probably. I don't know. He doesn't ride quite like a cowboy. Why, it's just a kid, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> sure needs a haircut. <laughs> what? Say, Mr. Dillon, it's a girl. Now, what could she be doing out here? I'm carrying a rifle, too. Well, uh, get on, miss, and have some coffee. Who are you, mister? Hi, this is Chester Proudfoot, and I'm Matt Dillon. How do you do? You rustlers, or what? <laughs> uh, not exactly. I'm the U.S. Marshal out of Dodge, ma'am. U.S. Marshal? Oh, that's good. It is? Why? I need help, Mr. Marshal. My daddy's awful sick. Sick? Well, well where is your daddy? We got a homestead about a mile over that rise back there. Oh, what's he sick with? It's his leg, Mr. Marshall. A horse threw him and his saddle both in the corral, and then it stepped on his foot. Now his whole leg's all funny. He's got a fever, too. Mr. Dillon, that sounds like... Yeah, I know, Chester. Uh, tell me, miss, when the horse stepped on him, did it cut his foot, uh, break the skin anywhere? Just a scratch. Tore his boot off, though. Oh. Please, Mr. Marshall, please come see him. I'm scared, the way his leg is and everything. Well, sure, sure we'll come. Your mother with him now? I don't have a mother, Mr. Marshall. Oh. Well, then, what are you doing out here if your daddy's sick? We ran out of meat about three days ago, and I don't have anything to feed him. Oh. All right. Uh, Chester, I'll write back with the... Uh, uh, what is your name, anyway? Tara. Tara Hantry. Oh. I'll be 16 next January. Well, that's, that's fine. 
Uh, we'll go back to the hand tree place, Chester. You scout around for some meat. All right, sir. And if you don't find any antelope, shoot the first calf you see. Anybody's calf. I'll do it, Mr. Dillon. in the sleeping room, Mr. Marshall. No. Daddy. <laughs> I, Daddy, I found a man, and he's going to help us. And, Daddy, he's a Marshal, a U.S. Marshal. Matt Dillon, Mr. Hendry. Uh, uh, how are you feeling? Dillon, I've heard of you. You're from Dodge, aren't you? <laughs> That's right. Well, Marshal, I... Ain't feeling so good. My my foot don't hurt no more, but it and my leg is all sort of well. It ain't pretty. I don't know much about these things, but maybe I better take a look at it anyway, huh? Sure, sure, Marshal. There, there she is. Uh, all right, you can cover it up. I was in the war, Marshal. I know what gangrene is guess you do, too, huh? Uh, yeah. Well, the first thing, a friend of mine is out getting you some meat, and then we'll load you in your wagon. Well, and we'll... Ben took the wagon. What? Ben Warling. He took the wagon when Daddy got hurt. Said he'd find a doctor and bring him back. Well, who's Ben Walling? Oh, he, he's been sort of working here, Mr. Marshall. I should have run him off long ago. That's what. Well, where is he? What did he take the wagon for? Where's he going to find a doctor around here anyway? Closest doctors in Dodge, I know of. Yeah, and he's in St. Louis, and he won't be back for a couple of weeks. Uh, I couldn't get to him anyway. Well, tell me, when did this happen? About six days ago, Mr. Marshall. Uh -huh. Ben left the day after. Well, you think he's coming back? Did he steal the wagon or what? He he comes back here and me not able to get around. I, I don't know what I'll do. I ought to take a bull with take now, him. Now, take it easy, Mr. Just a Hans. Bull with... Take a... He won't cause any trouble, so don't you get all worked up. Uh, Tara, we'll uh, let him get some rest, huh? All right, sir. Uh, we'll have some food for you soon, Mr. Hantry. I ain't very hungry. Tara, what's he so riled up about this Ben Walling for? What's between them? Oh, it's nothing, Mr. Marshall. Daddy's sick and... That's all. Look, Tara, you asked me to help you, didn't you? Yes, but... You trust me, don't you? All right, Mr. Marshall. Daddy hates Ben because Ben... Well, Ben likes me. Oh, I see. He even wanted to marry me. Said he would. How do you feel about Ben, Tara? You like him? No. Of course, it's time I had a man and all that, but I'm afraid of Ben, Mr. Marshall. It's like there's something wrong with him. He's always sneaking around when you don't expect him. Makes me uneasy, like. Well, we won't worry about Ben now. Uh, you, you stay here in case your daddy wants anything. I'll go outside and wait for Chester. Mr. Marshall, hmm? I'm awful glad you're here. We'll see it through, Tara. Don't you worry. I won't. Now. I went outside and walked over to the small corral that stood nearby. There I rolled a smoke and looked out across the flat distances of the prairie. And I wondered how anyone could survive in all that emptiness. Hand tree lying on his bed back there in the house. He wouldn't survive. The prairie got to him all right. And its vast loneliness had put him out of reach of any help. And Tara, what could she do out here in this endless land of grass? I was glad to get my mind off it when Chester rode in with an antelope across his saddle. We hung it on the corral, dressed it, took a hind quarter into Tara... And we went back outside and sat down. Yes, sir. She's a plucky girl, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, fine girl, Chester. 
Yeah, but this Ben fella, I just don't understand his going off with the wagon like that. Well, it doesn't matter much now. Entry won't last more than a day or two, anyway. It's that bad, is it? Yeah, blood poisoning, just As soon as it reaches his heart, he's done for. Well, isn't there any way to stop it? Yeah, sure. Cut his leg off. Oh. Too bad Doc isn't here. Yeah. Would that stop it, Mr. Dillon? Uh, cutting his leg off, I mean? I don't know, Chester. I don't know. Maybe too late anyway. I... Well, I sure wish we could do something for him. I don't take to just sitting around and waiting for a man to die. Well, nobody does. It isn't right somehow, that that poor fella and, and Tara. Why, why, Mr. Dillon, that girl will go crazy out here all alone. All right, Chester. What do you want me to do about it? I'm not a doctor. Now shut up. Well, I... Mr. Dillon, you could do it. I know you could. Do what? Be a doctor. Long enough to save Mr. Hantry's life, Are you anyway. out of your head? No, sir. Then what are you talking like that for? The most I ever did was doctor a horse for the colic. That's fine training for this, isn't I it? I know. I couldn't do it. I just plain don't have the spirit. But you do. Oh, why didn't I leave you back in Dodge? It wouldn't have mattered anyway, Mr. Dillon, because you would never just stand by and... Let a man die. Well, let's go talk to him, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Daddy's fever's worse, Mr. Marshall. I- I'm going to get some more water. How do you feel, Mr. Hentry? I don't feel much, Marshal. Outside of burning up. I've been trying to tell Tara I just can't last long with blood poisoning. She's just got to figure on it. Well, that's what I came to talk to you about. I I guess you know the only thing that'll give you a chance. I know. I've been thinking about it. But I couldn't ask any man to do that. You didn't ask me. Well, it's up to you, Mr. Hantry. I'll, I'll try it if you're willing. Only thing is, I... I won't know much about what I'm doing. I seen it done in the Union Army, Marshal. I could tell you some things. All right. The only thing is, Marshal, I don't know I'd be much use around here with one leg. Well... You'll have to decide that for for yourself. I know. You could move to town, Mr. Hantry, you and Tara. That's it, Tara. If it was just me, I wouldn't do it, but I can't leave Tara alone. Now, if I can help it, I I can't. Uh, All right, Marshal. Let's do it. You're a brave man. No. No, Marshal. I just don't have any choice. Come on. Let's get it over with. You got any liquor in the house? There's a jug of corn out in the kitchen. Get it, Chester. You can start drinking it while we're getting everything else ready. Tell Tara to start boiling a lot of water. Yeah. I'll talk to her in a few minutes. I'll be right back. Now, I want you to tell me everything that you know about this, Mr. Hendry. First, I'll tell you what you'll need. Mm -hmm. There's a straight iron out by the corral somewhere. Yeah. You can heat it in the main room fireplace. Right. Now, what else? Tara will find some cloth for bandages. And the rest of the stuff you can get in the kitchen. Uh Uh-huh. The only thing worrying me is what will we use to tie off the arteries with? Plain thread won't hold. Well, uh, maybe some thin strips of raw hide. No, they'd they'd soak through. Got to have something. I I know. At least I think it'll work. What about horse hair? That's it, Marshal. Pull it off the tail. Uh, It'll work fine. Here's the judge, Mr. Hantry, and I brought you a cup, too. Pour me some. I want to get good and drunk. Here you are, Mr. Hantry. Uh, uh. You know... I ain't been drunk in the daytime since we got the news about 
President Lincoln in the spring of 65. Uh, you better have your talk with Tara before that takes hold. Ask her to come in, will you? Come on, Chester. We got work to do. Yes, sir. Uh, good luck, Mr. Hantree. Thanks. Well, uh, Mar- Marshal? Yeah. Marshal? I'll try to make it easy for you. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Shortly after noon, I operated. Whether it was the corn whiskey or his own hard courage, I don't know, but Hantry never whimpered. Chester stood outside the door and brought me whatever I needed. Tara waited in the kitchen, boiling more water and thinking her own thoughts. Maybe it was harder on her than any of us. Toward the end, Hantry mercifully passed out. When I'd finally finished bandaging him, I was kind of faint myself. I'd done everything I could. I just hoped I'd done it right. How is he, Mr. Dillon? You'll have to clean up in there, Chester. I've got to get outside for some air. Yes, sir, I'll do it. And put that fire out. It's hot enough around him. I don't know how you did it, Mr. Dillon. Tara? Uh, Tara, will you come on outside for a while? Daddy, all right? Is he all right, Mr. Marshall? It's all over, Tara. We'll just have to wait and see now. <laughs> all right. There now, Tara. He's all right. I'm sorry. But it took so long. I I thought you'd never finish. He, he didn't feel much, Tara. The corn liquor worked fine. Fine. Will he get well now? Well, I, I hope so, Tara. I, I hope so. Mr. Marshall, are, are you going to wait and see? Oh, now, Tara, you don't have to worry about that, Chester, and I'll be here as long as you need us. I I just wanted to be sure. Can I can I go see Daddy now? Well, uh, as soon as Chester comes out, Tara, uh, then you can. All right. I'll wait, Mister Marshall. It beats me, Mr. Dillon, how he can just lay there so quiet and peaceful. It's only been four or five hours, Chester. The liquor hasn't worn off yet. He drank nearly the whole jug. No, he needed it. Mm. Uh, say, Mr. Dillon, look yonder. Huh? Somebody coming with a wagon. Oh, yeah. It's probably that Ben Walling they were talking about. I'll bet that's who it is, all right. Wonder what he'll have to say for himself. Ah, oh, you'll think of something, Chester. His kind always do. You recognize him? No, sir. Do you? No, I never saw him before. Hello. What are you doing here? You Ben Walling? How'd you know? The hand trees. They've been wondering about you. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, He's an old hand tree, anyway. He's all right. He is, huh? You've been gone a long time, Ben. Where were you? I don't know you, mister, but you sure ask a lot of questions. You can answer them one at a time. Now, where were you? Who are you anyway, mister? I'm a U.S. Marshal. Ain't no U.S. Marshals around here. There is now. Generally, I'm in Dodge. Is your name Dillon? It is. What are you doing here, Marshal? Tara ran into us, asked us to help. Seems the only able-bodied man around here took off in a wagon. I went to fetch a doctor. Is anything wrong in that? Not at all. Where is he? Well, first night the horses ran away, and I've been chasing them ever since. I didn't catch them till this morning. 
And then I've been gone so long, I thought I'd better get back to you right away. I was worried about Tara and old Hantry, of course. I see. Well, you better get your horses on hitch, Ben. You can see Tara later. She's in with her father now. Going to be all right, huh? I was kind of worried about that foot. Looked to me like it might have poison in it. It did. What do you mean, it did? I took his leg off about noon today. You what? Mr. Dillon did it all by himself, just like a regular doctor. Oh, but how'd you know what to do? You might have killed him. Somebody had to do it, Ben. It's a sure thing Tara couldn't. You're blaming me, ain't you? Well, I did everything I could. Didn't my fault those blasted horses run off. Antre's pretty sick, Ben. I wouldn't bother him for a day or two if I were you. Oh, I won't bother him. Oh, now look, Marshal. You can leave now. I'll handle everything here. We'll leave. As soon as Hantree's able to take care of himself again. All right. Stay as long as you like. I don't care. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I think that Ben is a no-good liar. You're right on both counts, Chester. And I'll tell you something else. You see that saddle over there? Well, that belongs to Mr. Hantree. Yeah, I know. I looked at it this noon. Somebody cut the cinch strap on it. Cut the cinch strap? Mm-hmm. No wonder that bronc bucked him and the saddle off both. Well, do you think Tara did it? Oh, my goodness gracious, no, Mr. Dillon. Tara would never do a thing like that to her own... It was Ben, wasn't it? That'd be my guess. He figured the old man would get hurt, maybe killed. Why, sir? So he'd have a free hand with Tara. Why is that low down... Mr. Dillon, let me arrest him. Not yet, Chester. There's plenty of time. All right, sir. I'll wait. There wasn't as much time as I figured. Antree had a bad night, and by morning he was so weak he couldn't lift his head. I tried to take his pulse, but I could hardly find it. Maybe, maybe I'd operated too late. Maybe the poison had already moved up into his body. I didn't know. I had no way of knowing. So there was nothing to do now but wait. Want some more coffee, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, thank you, Chester. We'll fill it up, huh? Tara won't eat anything at all, sir. She just sat there by his bed, hasn't slept a wink, I know of. Well, it's her father, Chester. He's all she's got. I never thought much about it before, Mr. Dillon, but seeing Tara, I kind of wish I had a daughter. You'd have to change your profession if you were going to take care of a daughter, Chester. Why, I, I don't have any profession, Mr. Dillon. Oh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yeah, what is it, Tara? Please, please, son. Daddy wants you. I, I think he... he... You better come too, Chester. Yes, sir. It's Matt Dillon, Mr. Hantry. Can you hear me? Marshal, I can't hold out no more. Now, don't say that. Keep fighting, man. You'll pull through. No, Marshal. I'm going to die. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Tara. It's about Tara, Marshal. Don't leave her here. Ben Walling. He's no good. He'll try to keep her. Now, don't you worry about Ben Walling, Mr. Hantry. I promise you he won't get anywhere near Tara. Now or ever. Thanks, Marshal. He's a bad one. Tara can't stay here alone. She can't work this place. It's a bad way to die. Not no. Now, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me now. Yeah. I promise you something else, too. I'll take care of Tara. I'll see she's all right. I'll see she's cared for. Now, I promise that. I thank you, Marshal. I sure. Where's Tara? Daddy. I'm right here. Daddy. Tara. Come on, Chester. Daddy. Daddy. I don't know, Mr. 
Mr. Dillon. I don't think they'd have made out on this place anyway. Why not, Chester? Well, there just isn't enough water. That one little old spring is all I've got. Well, if they had a lake, it'd still be too much for Tara. What are we going to do with her, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. We'll have to think of something, though. My, I wish she'd come out of that house. I don't like it, her in there, breaking her heart. Give her a little time, Chester. She, she'll be all right. Don't you move her finger, either one of you. Well... Well, you're mighty careless with that rifle, Ben. Now get smart with me, Marshal. I know what I'm doing. And what would that be? I heard you in there. Heard you promise you'd take Tara away. I was right by the window. I heard it all. You got a curious way of courting the girl, Ben, trying to kill her father. Yeah, and I saw you yesterday looking at that saddle, but I didn't kill him, Marshal. You did. That's a lie, Ben Walling, and you you know it. I won't shut up. If we'd have just got here sooner, Mr. Dillon would have saved him, that's all. Yeah. Well, it's too bad you got here at all. Because you're going to die for it. Both of you. Put the gun down, Ben. You're under arrest for attempted murder. You stay right where you are, Marshal. You know, I have an idea you've smelled powder before, Ben, and that you're afraid of it. Marshal? I have an idea that's why you tried to get Hantry like you did instead of facing it. Stop, sir. And right now you wish you didn't have that rifle at all, don't you, Ben? Because I might have to shoot you. No, all right, huh? no, don't. Marshal, give me that. <laughs> You all right, Mr. Dillon? He didn't even try, Chester. Rifle went off when I knocked it aside. That's all he was scared to death. Well, I, I didn't feel exactly comfortable. Well, tie him up and keep an eye on him. I'll go see Tara. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Late that evening, we buried Hantry out on the prairie, out in back of the little homestead. They would die now, too, and fall apart without him. The next morning, we loaded everything we could get into the wagon. With Tara beside me, we started out for Dodge. Ben Wallen never said a word. Chester led his horse, and they rode along ahead of us. I had plenty of time to tell Tara all about Dodge and how there were some good people there and how we'd find her a home and family. She sat there, tight-lipped. She didn't say much. But she never once looked back. Smoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Sammy Hill, and Larry Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. In case you didn't know, Jack Benny and his gang begin their new season tomorrow night. Jack, Mary, Don, Dennis, and Rochester welcome a new member to the team, the head man of CBS Radio's Club 15 show, Bob Crosby. Roy Rowan speaking. Remember the top dramatic show of them all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Brought to you tonight by Plymouth, with an invitation for you to visit a Plymouth dealer's tomorrow. 
meet the new Plymouth and enter the big $25,000 contest. Throughout Kansas and in the territories on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. It's here, a new kind of low-priced car. The exciting 53 Plymouth, completely new, completely beautiful. Yes, it's the new Plymouth for 1953. The first truly balanced car in the low-priced field. More glamorous lines, more powerful engine, more luxurious comfort. What a beauty. The new 53 Plymouth is lower to the road with a lot lower look. New color schemes and two-tone color harmonies available in all models. How does she travel? Man, Plymouth puts out the best ride in the business. Smooth as sailing, even in the back seat. And the Plymouth engine's been stepped up to 100 horsepower for pickup with plenty of flash. Visibility? I say, there's a one-piece curved windshield, a new type with no troublesome distortion, and you sit chair height in a Plymouth, so you get the full benefit of Plymouth's new down-sweeping hood. You really see right down in front of your car. Bigger side windows, too, and a huge wraparound rear window, so everyone gets a view as big as all outdoors. The new 53 Plymouth's an exciting car any way you look at it. A great advance in car value at no advance in price. In fact, four new Plymouth models actually cost less than last year. So don't put off seeing it. Meet the new 53 Plymouth at your nearby Plymouth dealers. If you go in tomorrow, you may win one free in the big Meet the New Plymouth contest. And now, Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon. United States Marshal. The cook sure must have had a bad night, Mr. Dillon. Well, how do you figure that, Chester? Well, sir, I never saw so much chili pepper on a couple of poor eggs. <laughs> he must figure everybody's got a hangover this morning. Almost everybody usually has of a Sunday around here. <laughs> well, now, I clean up forgot all about it being Sunday. No. Uh, so that's why Jim Cobbett's all dressed up over there, huh? First time I've ever seen him with his hair combed. Uh, well, I haven't you heard about Jim, Chester? He's going to get married. He's got his wife-to-be coming in on the train from back east today. Jim Cobbett? Yeah. Well, now, what sort of a woman would that be, Mr. Dillon, who'd come clear to Dodge City to marry a fellow like Jim? No, Jim's a good man, Chester. It's just that, well, living out on that homestead of his year after year has made him grow a little off-center, so... Loneliness will do that to a man sometimes. Morning, Marshal. Chester. Morning, Hank. Well, what do you think of that old goat Jim Cobbett getting himself hitched? It's a fine thing, I'd say. Well, Jim's no older than you are, Hank Lewis. No older, maybe. A lot less respectable. Now you're talking your usual nonsense, Hank. Am I, Marshal? What about Jim's first wife who disappeared off of that place he had up north on Hackberry Creek? Just plain disappeared, she did. Jim never explained that, and nobody ever saw her again, either. Oh, you're worse than an old woman with your gossip, Hank. Jim's never done anything to you, Hank. Nothing except stake his homestead on the only spring south of the Smoky that didn't dry up. Cheated me out of it, that's what. He filed his claim two weeks before you did, Hank, and everybody knows it. Sneaked into town, that's what he did. Sneaked into town, behind my back. Still telling your lies, ain't you, Hank Lewis? No. Now, you keep away from me, Jim. Keep, keep away. I've never bothered you, Hank. But I hear you talking around Lila. When she gets here, I'll hurt you. I'll hurt you bad. What is it you want to hide from her, Jim? Maybe that business about your first wife? All right, don't touch that gun, Hank. Not a move. You arrest her, Marshal. You saw it. Get up. Put, put him in jail now. I, I didn't touch him. Shut up. Now, you're just lucky you weren't killed. Now, you get out of here and stay away from Jim. 
It's his wedding day, and if I find you bothering him again, I'll throw you in jail. Now, go on, move. Fine. Fine, Law. We got around here, Maggie. Sorry to make trouble, Marshal, but I won't hold for his making that talk around Lila. Oh, forget it, Jim. Just keep clear of him for a while. Uh, what time's the wedding? Well, about three o'clock. At least that's when the preacher said he'd come down. It'll be at the church, won't it, Jim? Well, no. The preacher thought maybe it'd be better to do it somewhere else. It's uh, because of... Yeah, yeah, sure, Jim. Uh, you know, Dodge City House would be a fine place, wouldn't it? That's just what I'd plan, Marshal. Uh, I brought a jug of corn in with me in case anyone came around, maybe. <laughs> Jim, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I'm going to be there for sure. Yeah, me too, Jim. I certainly do enjoy a wedding. I never got married myself, but I sure do like to watch. <laughs> See you later, Jim. Sure, Marshal. Yeah, we'll be there, Jim. Bye. <laughs> Jim's bride, Lila, turned out to be a handsome, high-strung woman with nervous black eyes and a manner that bespoke a gentle breeding and background. I watched her, and I wondered how she'd ever make out in this crude, raw country she'd chosen to come to. It was never mentioned how she and Jim had got together, but the few friends who gathered for the wedding didn't care. We were all pleased that Jim finally had a wife to break the loneliness that he'd set upon himself for so long. And after the brief ceremony at the Dodge City House, we told him so. <laughs> well, it's about time, Jim. If you don't mind my saying so, ma'am, you should have filed on him long ago. Why, uh, yes, uh, I, I mean, of, of course. Open the jug on the table there, Si. It's good corn. Well, thank you, Jim. The throat is a mite dusty. Help yourselves to the liquor, boys. Thank you. Yeah. Well, congratulations, Jim. And Miss Cobbett, my best wishes to you, ma'am. Thank you, Marshal Dillon. Now, you make Jim bring you to town and see us once in a while. <laughs> he never came in much when he was alone out there. Oh, I'm sure he will, Marshal. I, I sure hope so, ma'am. Help yourself to the jug there, Chester. Well, thank you, Jim. If I can get it away from Cy long enough, I will. <laughs> uh, you stay in here tonight, Jim? Well, no, Marshal. I brought the wagon on account of Lila here, and it's a slow way of travel. It'll take a day and a half at best. Huh? But where will we sleep tonight, Jim? Oh, I've got some blankets, Lila. We'll be fine. You mean out on the prairie? Well, sure. We'll bed down in the wagon if you're afraid of snakes. Oh, snakes can't get to you if you're in the wagon, ma'am. But, but what about everything else? Indians? No Indians have been seen around here for months. I oh, know. no, you're wrong, Jim. A man from Walnut Creek told me he ran into some Pawnees a couple of weeks ago. Only about a dozen, though. Pawnees? Well, they didn't bother him, did they, Si? No, no, they didn't, Marshal. Yeah, you see, Lila? Well, they didn't bother him because he saw him first. He hid himself under a bank in the creek. Uh, are there many Indians around? Oh, no, very few. Well, the Army's been after him pretty steady ever since them crows raided the Gillette place. The engine's been making themselves scarce the last few months. What happened at the Gillette place? They had a little trouble, that's all, Lila. A little trouble to kill Bob and rode off of Mrs. Gillette and the child, that's all. Oh, no. Uh, Si, why don't you go get yourself another drink, huh? Mm, yeah, well, I was just thinking about doing that. Well, no, I suppose it'll be easier than Mrs. Gillette once she learns to talk crow. But still, it's a hard life on a white woman suddenly being made a squall. Oh, the uh, jug's life. almost empty, Si. Yeah. You better hurry, huh? By golly, dear. hey, fellas, I got another swatter coming up. Liquor's oh. working on Si, now. They don't pay no money. Jim, is it true what he said about that poor woman? Now, Lila, don't you fret about that. Is it true? I want to know, Jim. Yes. Uh, Jim, if you stayed in Dodge City tonight, well, you could start out before dawn tomorrow. And oh, maybe it'd... no, Marshal. Jim thinks it's best we leave tonight. There's nothing to fear, Lila, but if you'd rather stay, we can... No, we'll go, Jim. If you'll excuse me, I'll go change into something more suitable. Goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye, ma'am. We'll see you in Dodge City real soon, I hope. Of course. 
I'll be down shortly, Jim. <laughs> Maybe it was best that way for Lila to face out her first night on the prairie not far from Dodge. Nothing would bother him that close to town and it would make it easier for her on the next night. And they left. And that's all we heard about him for oh, a month or so. Dodge City was fairly quiet except for one week when a Texas herd arrived. Two boys were killed the next night and another a few days after. But then things cooled off and became peaceable again. Hank Blues is in town, Mr. Dillon. Oh, no, Chester. Well, there ought to be a law against it, that's all. He said he was coming here to see you in a few minutes. <clears throat> Look, you talk to him, Chester. I think I'll go upstairs and pick on the dock for a while. Oh, oh he doesn't want to see me, Mr. Dillon. I, I'll send him up when he comes. Uh, Chester, no. Yes, sir, but he'll ask me where you are, sir, and then what am I going to tell Marshall, him? Marshal, if... I want to talk to you. Well, all right, Hank. Go ahead, talk. You think I was lying about Jim Cobbett, don't you? Well, listen to this, Marshal. Lila's disappeared, too. What? I saw it with my own eyes. I mean, I saw she isn't there. What are you talking about, Hank? I'm telling you, Marshal, Lila's gone, just like Jim's first wife up on Hackberry Creek. She's plain disappeared. Well, go on. Well, I got a runny bay mare that's always running off, and I rode by Jim's place to see if he'd seen her. Jim was just sitting there, and he'd hardly pay me any mind at all. He was all alone, and when I asked him about Lila, he, he just walked off, wouldn't say a word. Well, maybe she was just out on the prairie somewhere. Then she stayed a long time. I was back next day and still didn't see her. Stock's gone, too. When was this, Hank? About a week ago. Now, Marshal, I think you ought to get I out... I do my own thinking, Hank. Well, all right. You better get out there, Marshal. I've told you now. Yeah, you've and... told me, and you can forget it. Just stay away from the Cobbett place, you understand? All right, Marshal. I've done my duty. You better do yours. Goodbye, Hank. Well, I... Goodbye. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? Only thing we can do, Chester. Go saddle our horses, will you? I got some things to clean up around here. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Big doings at all Plymouth dealers. Tomorrow, go in and meet the new Plymouth, the new kind of low-priced car. And enter the big $25,000 Meet the New Plymouth Contest. All you do is look her over, compare, ask questions. There'll be people on hand to explain the new body design, new type suspension, new springing, how they combine to give you a ride that's unbelievably smooth. The first truly balanced ride in the low-priced field. Believe me, you'll be enthusiastic. So just transfer that enthusiasm in 50 words or less to a contest entry blank. Tell what you like most about the new truly balanced Plymouth for 53. That's all there is to it, and you may win a 53 Plymouth or one of hundreds of cash prizes. But entries must be mailed by Monday midnight, so hurry. Get an official entry blank containing all the easy rules tomorrow when you go in to meet the new 53 Plymouth. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> Sure looks quiet around here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, come on. They're probably inside. You think Lyle is here, don't you, sir? I will soon find out, Chester. Hello, Jim. Hello, Marshal. Chester? Hello, Jim. Come in. How have you been, Jim? Hank Lou's told you, didn't he, Marshal? 
Where is she, Jim? Hank Lou said I killed her, didn't he, Marshal? Oh, now, Jim, you know I don't pay any attention to what Hank Lou says. Then why'd you come here, Marshal? To help you. If you're in trouble. Lila isn't here. And I'm in trouble, all right. Well, what happened, Jim? Where is she? I don't know. What? Well, Injuns, party of crows, they took her. They, they took her. Indians? My goodness. You mean you were raided here? Maybe ten days ago, a war party, about twelve crows. Well, what happened? Well, Lila was out there with the spring. It was just getting dark, and I was sitting on the floor right there. Men in the saddle I'd torn the stirrup off of when I heard her come running up the path out back. All in sweat and yelling. Lila, <laughs> what is it? Oh, I saw something out there. Oh, Jim. Jim, I think it was an Indian. Come inside. Oh. Yeah. Get, on, get on the floor in the corner there. How many? How many did you see? Oh, just him. I saw his skin behind that little rise. Oh, Jim, don't let him Come get easy me. Easy now, Lila. Oh. I don't see a thing out of this one, oh, 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 Look over oh, here. Oh, oh, Nothing. I must have heard you yell. Oh, Jim, what'll we do? Stand them off, that's all. Oh. Wait a minute, there's one. Oh, no. It's getting hard to see. Jim, the other side. They'll sneak up on the other side. Might be one behind that log out there. Oh, no. Just wait. Oh, you get bolder oh. in the dark. I can pick them off easy. Oh, Jim. Jim, they'll carry me off like they did that other woman. I can't stand it, Jim. Here. <laughs> take that six year old. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. He won't take you while I'm alive. Oh. I promise you that, Lila. <laughs> wait a minute. They're down at the corral. Oh, no. They're oh. after our horses. Oh. Oh. That'll show them. <laughs> Here he goes. There was one behind that log. Oh, Jim, I can't stand it. Yeah, they're sneaking up on us. Yeah, we'll just wait. Let them get in the open. Oh. Wait till a, a little more. Then when they jump and run on us, I... Oh. Go on, Jim. What happened then? Yeah. What'd they do when they rushed you? Well, one of them must have got in the window behind me. When Lila screamed, I was knocked out. And when I come to, the engine was gone. Lila was gone, too. Were you shot, Jim, or what? No. The engine must have got behind me somehow and clubbed me, that's all. Did you try to follow them? How could I, Marshal? They run off. The horses stole them. Yeah, I see. Anyway, I was out a long time. I wasn't a sign of anybody when I come to. Well, they could be in the Rocky Mountains by now. We'd never find them. Uh, I'll report this to Colonel Jenkins of Fort Dodge, and he can spread the word through the Army Post. Thanks, Marshal. I, uh, I'm sorry, Jim. But I guess that's all I can do for you. Sure, Marshal. Uh, come on, Chester. Let's uh, take a look around outside and then get back to Dodge City. Yes, sir. So long, Jim. I sure I am sorry it happened. So long. Jim's pretty broke up, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. That's terrible. And her a squaw now. Yeah. yeah. My, aren't those pretty, Mr. Dillon? What? Hey, that bunch of columbine there, growing right in a row. <laughs> I think I'll just put one in my hat. No, uh, wait a minute, Chester. Huh? I, uh, I, I wouldn't pick them, Chester. They're, they're too pretty to pick, huh? Well, all right, sir. Jim's stock is gone, all right. Mm-hmm. You know, Mr. Dillon, Jim Cobbett ain't the luckiest man in the world, is he? No, he sure isn't, Chester. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> It was the day after we got back to Dodge City that the trouble started, as I expected it would. 
Chester spread the story about the Indians kidnapping Lila Cobbett, and it wasn't long before some of the men began to question it. And a group of them, headed, of course, by Hank Lewis, came to see me. Marshal, we want to know when you're going to arrest him. Hank, it'd be better if you'd let somebody else do the talking. Your record against Jim Cobbett's pretty strong. Marshal's right, Hank. You always did talk too much anyway. I want justice done, that's all, and I mean to get it. Oh, oh shut up, God. Hank. Marshal Hank sort of talked us into thinking you don't need to do anything about Jim Cobbett. Is that true? Well, what's your idea, Merrick? Well, go out there and arrest him and find Lila's body if you can. You think Jim murdered her, is that it? Looks that way. You sure don't believe his story, do you, Marshal? No. Not all of it. Jim did her in just like his first wife. That's what. It's a sure thing, Marshal. No engines would have stolen the woman and left Jim lying there without scalping him. Engines just being made that way. Merritt, I don't know what happened out there, but I'm going to find out. Then what are you waiting for, Marshal? The doc. The doc? What's he got to do with this? Well, Miss Prillifue had a baby this morning. The doc was up all night and he's sleeping today. We're going to ride out to Jim's tomorrow. Well, I don't know what you need the doc for, but we'll wait and ride out with you. You won't ride anywhere, Hank. When I need a posse, I'll ask for it. I don't want a single man of you anywhere near the Cobbett place. Is that clear? All right, now get out of here. I got work to do. It's a mighty lonely looking place, Matt. Uh, yeah, indeed. I wonder what Lila Cobbett thought when she first saw it. She must have been mighty fond of Jim to come here at all, seems to me. Yeah. Well, I hope Jim's still there. Isn't that him there? Uh, down by the corral there, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's got a new horse. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Hello, Jim. What are you doing here, Doc? I had to bring the Doc, Jim. To perform a... Sort of autopsy. Autopsy? On Miss Cobbett. It's necessary, Jim, or I wouldn't do it. Marshal? Now, don't do it, Jim. You wouldn't have a chance. No. Take his gun, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Jim, let's you and me go on into the house, huh? I don't imagine you want to watch this. Well... Uh, where is it, man? You want to tell him, Jim? Over there. Under that row of columbines. Well, I'll... So, that's why you wouldn't let me pick any, Mr. Dillon. I watered the ground a lot to make it hard. It was a good job, Jim. Come on, let's go in the house. Shovel's out back of the corral. I'll get it. Well, all that water and... The... Didn't do any good. In the house, Jim sat with his back to the wall, his hands clasped tightly across his knees. He was so gaunt and leathery that I wondered if he'd bothered to eat anything at all since this had happened. He just sat there as if waiting to be sentenced and not caring very much one way or the other. Finally, Doc and Chester were finished, and they came into the house. We put her back, Jim, right where you had her. Yeah, and it wasn't easy, Matt. Yeah, I know, but what did you find? Well, she was killed by a forty-five, fired at close range. Bullet entered her head just under... Never the... mind, Doc. Jim's... Gun here is a forty-five, Mr. Dillon. You want to tell us about it, Jim? You think I killed her, Marshal? Well, it looks that way, Jim. But I still can't believe it. Thank you, Marshal. If you did it, Jim, you're going to hang for it. The crows didn't attack the house, Marshal. They never aimed to. They just dodged around out there, some of them, to cover for the ones that ran the stock off. They didn't want to fight, just to stock. Well, it's happened before. 
Lila screamed and screamed. I guess she went kind of crazy. Then I heard a shot. First I thought she was shooting at the engines. Then I saw her on the floor there. I didn't care after that. They could have come right in there. They could have done anything they wanted. I didn't care. You, uh... You had given her your six-gun, is that it? Yes. The crows didn't bother you after that? They just took the horses and left? I didn't care about them. I buried Lila out there right away. And I sat there on the ground all night. Everything had been all right, Marshal, but when Hank Luce came by, I got scared. I didn't want to talk to him, but I knew what he'd say. So, I put water on the grave and tried to hide it, except for the flowers I'd planted. I just couldn't not have planted flowers there. He's telling the truth, Matt. Yeah, Jim isn't lying. No, no, sir, he certainly isn't. Father, there's no reason I know of why Jim should stand trial. What about Hank Lewis, Mr. Dillon? He'll make trouble. Now, the three of us here have heard the story and seen the evidence. Hank's talk doesn't mean a thing. I have no cause to arrest Jim. Then I can go, Marshal. Go? Go where? I don't want to live here anymore. It's like the other place up north after my first wife rode off. She just said goodbye and rode off one day. I was ashamed of that, so I never told nobody what happened. And I left the place. I can leave in this one. Well, you got to settle down sometime, Jim. No, no, I don't. I got bad luck both places. I won't settle down no more. We won't stop you, Jim. I think I'll go now, Marshal. I don't want to spend another night here. I'll get my things together. Yeah. Uh, We'll wait outside. Come on, Chester. Doc. Half hour later, Jim was packed and ready to go. Silently, he shook hands with each one of us and then mounted and rode off. Yeah, the prairie had dealt hard with Jim Cobbett, but the man was too tough and dry not to survive somehow. He wouldn't try again to be happy, but he'd live. He'd make his way. We watched him disappear while the sun went and the land cooled and became still and quiet. The Big Plymouth Contest closes Monday midnight. Your last chance to win a new 53 Plymouth free or a big cash prize. Go to your nearby Plymouth dealers tomorrow. Meet the new Plymouth. Look it over stem to stern. Ask questions. Find out all about this new kind of low-priced car. Then, on an official entry blank in 50 words or less, tell what you like most about this great new beauty. But remember, entries must be mailed by Monday midnight, so be sure to visit your Plymouth dealers tomorrow to pick up your contest entry blank and meet the new 53 Plymouth. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John McIntyre and Jeanette Nolan, with Paul Dubov, Jack Crucian, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke was brought to you by Plymouth, along with a reminder that you visit your Plymouth dealer tomorrow and enter the Meet the New Plymouth contest. Remember, entries must be mailed before Monday midnight. Clancy Cassell speaking. City and at the 
the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Cleanliness is next to godliness, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know, I know, Chester, but all you're doing is getting it off the floor into the air. Man can hardly breathe in here. All right, Mr. Dillon. I'll do my sweeping later. Yeah, good. My mother taught me that, Mr. Dillon. Taught you what, Chester? That cleanliness is next to godliness. She was a fine woman, too. Oh, look, Chester, it's a good saying, and it's probably true, and I got nothing against your mother except that she also should have taught you how to sweep. Well, maybe she just didn't have the time, Mr. Dillon. You see, there was an awful lot of us, and oh, what with chores Dad. and... Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, come on, uh, I'll buy you a drink. Uh, what? Doc said he'd buy you a drink, Mr. Dillon. He really said that? You coming? <laughs> Doc, you got to quit throwing your money around the way you do. Uh, maybe you don't need it. Uh, no, wait a minute, Doc. I, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you all about it when I get back, Chester. I'd be mighty interested, Mr. Dillon. Oh, sure be glad when it gets winter again. Why, Doc? You'll just complain about the cold, then. Uh, I suppose... You go sit with Kitty, Matt. I'll bring a bottle. Okay, Doc. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. What are you and Doc up to? Yeah, he wants someone to talk to, so he picked me. And you. Fine. I'm a good listener. Lots of practice. <laughs> What are we celebrating? Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. We'll drink to a fellow that you don't know. Uh-huh. Kane Vestal. Well, here's to him. Yeah? Here's to him. <coughs> yes, he'll be dead in a couple of months. What? That's what I told him. What do you mean, Doc? Well, I'm not the only one who's told him that. I'm just the last. Well... Who is this Cain Vestal, Doc? Oh, it's just a fella. Came in on the train last night, leaving for Arizona to my die in Arizona. He's a musician. He plays the guitar, he tells me. Well, how's he gonna die? Consumption. He's got it bad. I'm the last doctor he's gonna ask about it, he says. Oh, poor fella. Yes, climb it out there, keep him going for a little while longer. And, uh, oh, I don't know, he's... He's such a sad man for some reason. Well, who wouldn't be, Doc? No, 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 Kitty. I think Kane's been sad for a long, long time. He's a very nice fellow, too. Nothing can help him, huh? No, nothing. You know, it's a funny thing, Doc, huh? I'm just sitting here thinking. Sometimes you have to tell men they're going to die. Sometimes I have to. Yeah, that's all right, man. Oh, let's see. Uh, there is. See that fellow with the car there? He just came in. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he knows anyone around here. You mind if I ask him over? Well, sure. Your party, Doc. Oh, good. Uh, 
Cain? Uh, Cain? Uh, uh, over here? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sit down. Sit down. Kane, this is Kitty. Uh, hello, Kane. Kitty. <laughs> this is Marshal Dillon. Hello, Marshal. Pleasure to meet you. He's <laughs> doing it here. Sit down. There we are. Have a drink. Well, thank you, Doc. Uh, this your first trip west, Kane? Yes, Marshal, it is. Oh, well, where are you from? No place in particular, Miss Kitty. I seem to spend most of my life on the Mississippi River. I, I thought you were a musician. I am. I was hired to ride the river boats and play my guitar for the passengers. Oh. <laughs> well, at least you've had a constant change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After 20 years of going up and down that river, it got pretty familiar, Marshal. <laughs> well, Kane, I knew a young fellow back in St. Louis for the war, and he was learning to be a river pilot. <laughs> Say, I wonder if you ever ran into him. Name of Clemens, Sam Clemens? No, Doc, I don't believe I did. Oh, he was a very amusing fella. He was just chock full of stories. Um, you leaving Dodge tomorrow, Kane? I'm headed for Arizona, Miss Kitty. No reflection on Dodge, though. <laughs> Uh, if you hit a place out there called Tombstone, I uh, wish you'd look up Virgil Earp for me. Uh, tell him I sent you, huh? Thanks, Marshal. I'll do that. Say, Kane, I wonder, uh, could I ask you a favor? Well, certainly, Miss Kitty, anything at all. Well, would you play something for us? I had an idea that's what it would be. <laughs> anything in particular? Oh, play something you like, Kane. Another girl I knew used to like this one. Kitty. I wish you were going to stay here a while. Maybe you could teach me to play like that. Huh? It'd be a pleasure, Miss Kitty. But I'm afraid I won't be around for long. Morning, Mr. Dillon. It's uh, noon, Chester. Yes, sir, I know, but you went off with Doc yesterday, so I figured I had a little time coming today. Well, that depends on how you spent it. Now, if you've been gambling, oh, I am... now, Mr. Dillon, you know I never gamble. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I, I, I was out helping a fellow learn to shoot a six-gun, that's all. Now? You mean there's a man in Dodge who doesn't know how? This fellow don't. Never had one in his hand before. He's a musician. What? It plays the guitar, he told me. You mean Kane? Uh, Kane Vestal? Yeah, so that's his name. Nice a fellow as you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. But he was supposed to leave on the stage this morning. And what's he done with his six-gun anyway? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He just come by here early this morning and asked me if I'd teach him. Yeah. Now, where'd he get the gun? Said he'd just bought it. Anything wrong, Mr. Dillon? No, no. It just doesn't add up somehow, that's all. Oh, well, he won't cause any trouble. He's 
Not the sort. You never know, Chester. Mm, no, sir. My kitty looks pretty this morning. She's got a yellow parasol, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? All right, I think I'll go see her for a minute. Uh, I'll be right back, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? Uh, hello, Matt. <laughs> Kitty, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Oh, sure. What is it? Uh... I'm curious about something, Kitty. Maybe you can help me. Maybe. How long was Kane Vessel with you yesterday? Kane? Oh, well, he didn't leave till evening. Why? Well, he didn't go out on the stage this morning, and he's bought himself a six-gun. You, you any idea why? A gun? Huh? Doesn't sound like Kane. Anything happened yesterday, Kitty, or did he tell you anything? Oh, well, yeah, might... there was one thing, Matt. Joel Adams and a couple of his men came in. Yeah. Kane got pretty upset when he saw him had a bad coughing spell. Oh? Uh-huh. Later, he asked a lot of questions about Adams. Well, what'd you tell him? Just that Adams is a big landowner around here that nobody who isn't working for him likes him very much. That's all I know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, they didn't talk, Adams and Kane. No. I don't think they even know each other. Well, anyway, he sure isn't the sort to be packing a gun. Well, you'll just get into trouble, Matt. Yeah. Uh, where's he staying, did he say? Dodge house, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kitty. I'll see you later. Come in. Hello, Kane. Well, Marshal Dillon. Come in, come in. Ah, oh, thank you. <clears throat> what can I do for you, Marshal? I, uh, I thought you were leaving Dodge on the stage this morning. Well, I was, Marshal, but I changed my mind. You know how it is. Sure, Kane, sure. Now, we're glad to have you around. I, uh, I'm just curious, though. You're, uh... Stay and have anything to do with that gun you bought this morning? Oh, Chester told you. I thought he would. He's a good teacher, Marshal. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't answer my question. Do I have to answer it? I'm just trying to help you, that's all. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Marshal, but I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Look, Kane, you're new in this country. A man like you just can't pick up a six-gun and call himself a fighting man. Not and expect to live through it. I certainly lay no claim to be a fighting man. Well, then why did you buy that gun? There's no law out here against a man having a gun, is there, Marshal? No. But any man who carries one is expected to use it when the time comes. You'd be a lot safer without one. Being safe doesn't mean a whole lot to me, Marshal. Not now. Yeah, I, I know. Doc told me. What's it all about? It's a long story. And an old one, I suppose. I'd really rather not talk about it. Well, I can't force you to. But, but tell me this. Does it have anything to do with Joel Adams? Yes, it does, Marshal. I'm going to kill him. When? I don't know. Any time. Well, why? That's a long story, I imagine. All right, Kane. But if you try to face him, he'll kill you before you got that gun halfway out of your belt. And if you shoot him any other way, you'll hang for it. You've forgotten something, Marshal. What? No matter what I do, I'm going to die soon anyway. A month or two isn't going to make any difference. 
you hate Adams that much. I wouldn't kill a man I didn't hate, would I? I didn't think you were the sort of man who'd kill anyone. Only Joel Adams, Marshal. Then I gotta warn him about you. Well, I understand, Marshal. It's all right. He doesn't know me anyway. Never even saw me before. But you want to kill him? Yes, sir. Well, I'll take your gun away from you, but you'll just find another one. And I can't arrest you unless I catch you trying to bushwhack him. I'm sorry for the trouble I'm causing you, Marshal. You know, I've never had to deal with a man like you before, King. Maybe I ought to just tie you up and throw you on that stage. You could. But I'd just come right back. <sighs> I guess you would. I'm sorry this has to happen here in Dodge, Marshal. Then why don't you leave? I guess I hate Joel Adams too much. All right, Kane, I'm through trying to convince you. So long. Goodbye, Marshal. Festival, Marshal, and I never saw him before last night. You must have known him somewhere, Adams. You're trying to make me out a liar, Marshal. I'm trying to save Kane's life and yours, maybe. No, he ain't gonna shoot me. I'll kill him first time he looks sideways. Maybe you won't see him. Oh? Shoot me in the back, eh? Well, in that case, it... In that case, what? Why, nothing, Dylan, nothing. Forget it. If Kane's shot in the back, you'll be the first man I'd take in, Adam. I don't even know him. Why should I shoot him? I'm only warning you. Well, just leave me be, Marshal. I can take care of myself. See that you do, Adams, and only yourself. Why, sure, Marshal. Only I don't much like the idea of some stranger gunning for me. Makes me sort of uneasy. There must be some reason for it. Don't start it again, Marshal. Ain't no reason. I know. You've led a blameless life. You never hurt anyone, I you, told you twice. There are men I'll around here who'd shoot you on sight if they thought they could get by with it. I don't think you were ever any good, Adam, so don't tell me that Kane's got no reason. I don't You're believe it. You're pushing me now, Marshal. I'm tired of your talk, that's all. Maybe it's true you don't know him, but he sure knows something about you. Well, then he'll wish you didn't. That's all I got to say. Well, just keep out of his way. Give it a little time, and maybe there won't be any killing at all. Why, sure, sure. All the time in the world. All right, Adams. I've done all I can. Just don't worry about me. I'm not. Then goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye. Return for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, the poignant story of Jane Froman, adapted from the movie with a song in my heart, was selected by you listeners through a national magazine as the one you would like most to hear on Lux Radio Theater. So this Monday night, listen for Susan Hayward, Rory Calhoun, David Wayne, Thelma Ritter, and Bob Wagner of the movie cast when CBS Radio presents Lux Radio Theater. Now, the second act of Gun Smoke. Sure is quiet around town tonight, Mr. Dillon. There's a trail herd doing in a couple of days. I suppose business will pick up then. Mm. You'd think those cowboys be too tuckered out after a ride like that to have any juice left in them at all, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> yeah, they're too poor to cut loose any other time. Well, that don't stop them down in Texas, Mr. Dillon. No? No. It's just like an uncle of mine back in Waco. He was poor. Oh, he was mean poor. But he always said the only good money was was to have fun with. Or did he have fun? Well, 
No, sir. He was too poor, like I said. <laughs> All right, Chester. All right. All I ask is that you don't try to explain it to me. <laughs> well, but there's nothing to explain, Mr. Dillon. It, it's just uh, it's just that he was the Chester. one poorest Chester. man you'd ever... Uh, Marshal, say, you want to talk to Kane Bestel? What? Uh, Kane is upstairs in my office. He been shot? No, no, not shot. Beat up. Well, how is he, Doc? Well, he's not too bad. A couple of cowboys found him just outside of town. They heard a shot and said two men rode off before they could stop them. Yeah? And I guess who, whoever it was, they didn't have time to finish the job. They just got started working on it. So Adams made the first move, huh? Um, I'll be back soon, Chester. Hey, yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <clears throat> they hit him on the head with a gun butt and scratched him up some. Outside of that, he's fine. That's uh, still assault, even if they didn't kill him, Doc. Yeah, I suppose it is. Anyway, they took a shot at him when they heard those riders coming along. Went right through his coat. Yeah. They probably think he's dead. So that's where you went, Doc. I might have known. Didn't even give you a chance to use that gun, did he, Kane? I didn't have a gun on me, Marshal, but it wasn't he. It was they. Huh? Do you recognize them? Well, I don't know many people around here. You know Joel Adams, or so you told me. It wasn't Adams. Could you pick him out if you saw him again? No, Mar Marshal, I don't believe I could. Where were you when they grabbed you, Kane? Into Front Street. I was taking a walk after supper. They rode up behind me, one on each side, lifted me up, and mm -hmm. carried me out of town a ways. You must have got a good look at them, at least when they got off their horses. It was too dark, Marshal. Yeah. Doc, how long has he been here? Oh, about half an hour, Marshal. Why? Those cowboys who saw you, Kane, they brought you right in here, didn't they? Yes. So it was maybe an hour ago when those two men hauled you out of town? It was plenty light enough then. Was it, Marshal? You're going to fight it yourself, aren't you? Yes, Marshal. It... <laughs> It's my affair. It was, Kane, but you've been assaulted and shot at, so it's the law's business now. I won't prefer any charges, Marshal. You don't have to. I've seen you, and I know who did it or who hired it done as well as you oh, do. Please, Marshal, i got to handle this my own way. There's a law that says you can't murder a man, Kane, and the same law says he can't murder you. Are you so full of hate you can't get that through your head? I guess that's it, Marshal. All right, Kane. You do what you have to do, so will I. It's late, Dylan. Can't you see me tomorrow? It's not even midnight. That's early for you. <laughs> you see how this marshal's always trying to get me on the prod, boys? Yes, sir. These boys of yours play pretty rough themselves, Adams. Meaning? Didn't they tell you? Tell me what? What they did to Kane Vestal? They did not kill Kane Vestal, and you can't prove it. No, Adams, I can't. Kane isn't even dead. What? You know, I'm curious, Adams. Why'd you think he might be? Why, why, if somebody said he got himself hurt. Joel Adams. You arranged this, Marshal? You know I didn't. Who is he? What does he want? Hello, Joel Adams. Don't strain yourself so you don't know me. Who are you? Kane Vestal. But my name doesn't matter. What are you haunting me for? I never saw you before in my life. That's true. You didn't. But we had a friend in common once. A friend? Who? Julie Travis. What about Julie? You were a riverboat gambler then, Adams, and you had money and fine clothes and a way with women, especially young girls. Julie was only 16 at the time. Never mind all that. 
So she went away with you to be married, you told her. Oh. <laughs> I think I guessed the rest. You wanted to marry her, but I got her instead. Is that it? That's it, Adam. <laughs> That's exactly it. Oh, no, I thought you really had something on your mind, Vestal. Well, all right, why don't you get out of here and quit bothering people while you can still walk? Julie killed herself, Adam. She committed suicide. What? You didn't know that, did you? Well, it's got nothing to do with me. Because you never married her after all. It was just a year after you abandoned her in New Orleans. I think it has a lot to do with you, Joel Adams. What are your plans, mister? I see you've got a gun in your belt. Gonna kill you. Oh, so? When? Now. Right now. All right, Vestal, draw. Leave the gun where it is, Kane. One thing I always promised myself, Adams. Someday I'd spit in your face. Why, you... Give me the gun, Adams. He's dead. Well, he was going to kill me. You heard him. He wanted you dead, Adams, any way he could manage. I know it. That's what I say. You're under arrest for murder. For... What... It was a gunfight. He never even moved for his gun. Well, then I'll hang for this. He couldn't have got me any other way. No, don't suppose he could have. I remember the river gamblers used to say, don't matter how you win so long as you win. That Kane should have been a gambler. Maybe he was. Come on, let's go. Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. And now for a special announcement. There have been many requests for information regarding our theme. It's called Old Trail and was written especially for us by Rex Corey, our musical director. If you will write to Gunsmoke in care of your local CBS radio station, we will try to give you whatever specific information you may desire. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This Monday night and most of these same CBS radio stations hear William Powell in a startling anti-communist drama titled The Man Who Cried Wolf. Remember to hear Suspense, starring William Powell, on most of these same CBS radio stations this Monday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network.
Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just pour every big and little Indian in your camp a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor, toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The wind's gone down anyway. Yeah, it sure was blowing last night. Uh, where were you, Doc? Uh, out at the Caldwell place. Mrs. Caldwell's expecting. Still? Mm. There was a false alarm last night. Oh, you ought to get some sleep while you can, Doc. Yes, I know. That's right where I'm headed. Doc Adams. Oh, hello, Ruth. I've been looking for you, Doc. Uh, Matt, this is Ruth Tucker. Sheely Tucker's son. Oh, hello, Ruth. We ain't met before, Marshal. No. How's Sheely these days? Uh, he's just like ever. But it's Ma I come to get Doc for. Well, what's the matter, Ruth? You know, she swallowed a nail, Doc. And it's hurting her bad. Mm, swallowed a nail, did she? Uh, how'd she do that? I told her not to, but she was fixing the chicken house anyway. And she had some nails in her mouth. Oh, you say it's hurting her? It's her stomach. She's got a terrible pain in her stomach. Oh, that's bad. I, uh, I'll, I'll ride out with you right away, Ruth. As soon as I get my tools, may have to operate. You know Pa, Doc. You know how he is. Oh, yes. I forgot about him. Sheely doesn't like doctors, does he? He hates them. But he ain't there now. He's been out on the prairie the last couple of days. Oh? When will he be back? I don't know for sure. But Ma said to get you anyway. She doesn't want to die. She'd cause trouble if he found me there, wouldn't he? He sure would. He'd beat you half to death. Well, maybe I better ride out with you, Doc, just in case Sheely comes home while you're there. Uh, good idea, Matt. I, I think you better. Yeah, uh, Ruth, uh, go over to the Alifraganza and tell Chester I want him to go with us, will you? Sure, Marshal. <laughs> Chester. Doc's still working on her. Well, there's no sign of Sheely anyway. Well, that's some help. What's the matter with a man like that, Mr. Dillon? Hating doctors the way he does? I don't know, Chester. Probably there weren't any doctors around when he was young. And what was good enough for his father is good enough for him. Some fool notion like that, maybe. Sheely always was a mean old cuss, except for his horses. 
He's always treated horses like they're human. Did you ever notice that? Uh, Sheely isn't really a bad man, Chester. He's just ignorant and prejudiced because of his ignorance. If he'd have been here, he'd let Miss Tucker die rather than have Doc operate on her. Yeah, probably. Well, that's bad. To me, it is. Maybe if Doc saved him someday, he might get over his ideas. Oh, Sheely's never had a sick day in his life, I know of. Oh, Doc, you all through? Huh? Oh, Yes, yes, I'm all through, Matt. How is she, Doc? Yeah. She's dead. Dead? I guess her heart couldn't take it. I, I don't know. I, I had to operate, though. She'd have died sure if I hadn't. Oh, it isn't your fault, Doc. You did all you could. I know, but... I always feel maybe if I'd have done it better, things like this wouldn't happen. You're not to blame, Doc. You, uh, want me to tell Roof? Yeah, I've already told him. He's in there with her. Oh, how'd he take it? He didn't say a word, Matt. Well, we better be getting back to Dodge, I guess. Yeah, you must be plumb wore out, Doc. Yeah, I am. Doc. Hey. Hey. Yes, Ruth. And you too, Marshal. You're going to have to help me. Oh, we'll help you, Ruth. What is it? It's about Pa. I don't know what to tell him when he comes back. Hey, that's right. I... I... Kind of keep forgetting about him. Just tell him the truth, Ruth. Doc tried to save your mother, but he wasn't able to. Nobody could have. You don't know Paul very well, I guess. He just won't stand for it. Well, there's nothing he can do about it now. It's all over. Not for him, it won't be. Mm, uh, what do you mean, Ruth? Well, when Paul says a thing, he means it. And he said none of us was ever to go near a doctor. Ruth, do you agree with your Pa's thinking? No. And neither did Ma. But we didn't dare cross him when he was around anyway. I'm afraid of him, Marshal. You'll have to stay here and tell him. Yeah, well, I, I can't stay. I, I have to get over to the Caldwell place. That baby's due any time now. But you can't go. Uh, on. All right, Ruth. All right. I'll stay here till he comes back. Uh, Chester, you better ride into town in case anybody's looking for me, huh? All right, you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it's a funny thing. How a doctor can lose one life and maybe bring another into the world all on the very same day. Well, come on, Chester. We can ride partway together. do it, Ruth. I want her buried good, Marshal. How about a, a cross? You want to put up a cross? I'll let Pa decide that. Uh, oh, my gosh, Marshal. Here he comes now. Yeah, looks like he's been riding pretty hard. Pa always rides hard, but he takes mighty good care of his horses all the same. He's never hurt one yet. I know. Oh, there, Marshal. How are you, Sheely? What are you doing out here? What's this? Sheely, uh, your wife died. Ruth and I just finished burying her. She died? Uh, just a few hours ago. We didn't know when you were going to get back, so we went ahead and buried her. What'd she die of? Uh, she was holding some nails in her mouth, and she swallowed one of them. Oh. Roof, take this horse into the barn and dry him off. Sure, Paul. Rub him good now. I will, Paul. Don't let him near no water yet. I won't. 
What are you doing out here, Marshal? I came out with Doc. With who? Doc Adams. He did everything he could to save her life, Sheila. He cut on her, didn't he? He tried to get the nail out, if that's what you mean. She'd have died from it if he hadn't. Cutting on her, that's what killed her. Look, Sheila, your wife was dying and Doc tried to save her. That's how it happened, no matter what you think. I've got no use for doctors. They're all croakers. That's what my old man called them, croakers. I kind of figure that's where all this came from. Julie, have you ever thought that your old man might have been wrong? Not about them, he wasn't. Hey, how'd Doc get here anyway? Who told him to come? Your wife wanted him. After all the times I've told her to stay away from doctors... I guess she didn't want to die, Sheila. She wanted a chance to live. Yeah, sure. And he'd come out here and killed her. Poor defenseless woman... Doc Adams will pay for this, Marshal. I'm telling you right now. You lay a hand on Doc and I'll run you out of the country, Sheely. Maybe it won't be a hand I'll use, Marshal. Try anything like that and you'll hang for it. I'll find you no matter where you go. He killed my wife with his bungling butchery. He's a murderer. There isn't a man in Kansas who'd believe that. Doc's a pretty valuable citizen around here, Sheely. Not to me, he ain't. It's an eye for an eye, Marshal, like it says in the good book. You even try it and I'll throw you in jail. I don't try nothing. Then you'll hang. Will I, Marshal? What goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go on your breakfast table is Post Toasties. Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe, and then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties heat good cornflakes, the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heat good cornflakes, Post Toasties heat good cornflakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrap. Post cereals, guaranteed fresh, or triple your money back. Now back to Gunsmoke. I left Sheely Tucker standing by his wife's grave. And I rode back to Dodge. There was no use trying to convince the man that doctors aren't bunglers and murderers. I figured he'd have to experience the truth himself somehow. And there wasn't much chance of that, the way things stood. But what really worried me was his threat to get Doc. Ordinarily, Sheely was peaceable enough, but there was no telling what he might do now. Doc stayed at the Caldwell place that night and the next day, too. I thought he'd be safe there, and I didn't worry about him until the next evening. Kitty and I were having supper at the Dodge house. Matt, for a town that lives on the cattle trade, you'd think we'd be able to eat decent steaks. (laughs) You should have had the prairie chicken, Kitty. You didn't have to walk all the way from Texas. That steak I had got carried. It was too old to walk. (laughs) I've never eaten prairie chicken, Matt. What's it taste like? Oh, a little chicken. A lot of prairie. (laughs) If I didn't know you better, I'd say you've been drinking. If I know you, you'll order a steak next time anyway. I don't give up easy, Matt. Yeah, I know. Remember it, then. Sure. You don't know much about women, do you, Matt? Well, I'm learning. Yeah. But at the pace you've set, I'll be in my grave before you're out of first grade. Well, it took me ten years to learn how to handle a six-gun. Well, 
That's the nicest compliment I've had all day. <laughs> Drink your coffee. i got to get out of here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Oh, here's Doc. Oh, hello, Matt, Kitty. How's Mrs. Caldwell, Doc? Yeah, we gave birth to a 12-pound boy this afternoon. Ah, that's fine. Yes, yeah, so, uh, that's not what I came to talk about, Matt. Somebody tried to shoot me on the way back from the Caldwell place. What? what? Who was it, Doc? Yeah, I didn't see him, and since I didn't have a gun, I rode straight ahead. Uh, fast. Where did this happen? Yeah, about a mile the other side of the grove. I should have come out and ridden back with you, Doc. You should have, huh? Well, then, uh, you know something about this? Yeah. Sheely Tucker, huh? He came back after you and Chester had left, Doc. He made some threats. Yes, I might have known it, but... I'm not going to be a target for Sheely every time I go on a call in the country. I'm going out and see him, Matt. We'll have this out face to face. I don't think you can change his mind, Doc. But I'll go with you. And if he admits shooting at you this afternoon, I'll bring him back to jail. Maybe I'll bring him back anyway. Well, I should hope so. People around here would be in an awful fix without Doc. Well, then there's me too, Kitty. Oh, sure, Doc. I was thinking of you. We'll ride out in the morning, Doc. Yeah, good. <laughs> Somebody in the corral there, man. Yeah, it looks like Sheely. It is. Him and Ruth both. Come on. Oh, oh. Well, let's leave them here. They'll stand. Hmm. They got a horse tied down in there, Mr. Dillon. Now, he's down, Chester, but he isn't tied. Oh, no, by golly, he ain't. Oh, say, look at that. Yeah, I broke his leg. Now, that's too bad. Oh, here we are. Oh, uh, Doc, I I'll go first in case Sheila gets excited. Oh, all right, man. Yeah. Go ahead, I'll close it. Hello, Sheila. Roof. Hello. You bring that crooker out here to kill my horse for me, Marshal? Uh, now, Sheila... Wait a minute, Doc. I'm sorry about your horse, Sheila. What happened? That bay's the finest animal I ever owned. I was just topping him off when he fell and busted his leg. No blame it. Uh, gee, that's too bad. It sure is. Roof, go on up to the house and fetch me my rifle. Okay, Pa. A terrible thing to lose a horse like this. Sheila, if you like... I'll do the shooting. Oh, thanks. I'll kill him myself. It's my job. You know, it's a funny thing. We always shoot a horse if it breaks a leg, but we wouldn't think of shooting a man when he does. You croakers got other ways of getting rid of people. Yeah, I'll overlook that, Sheely, but I'll tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you. Well, you like that horse, don't you? Of course I do. Well, then, don't shoot him. What? Well, look, Shelly, that horse is done for anyway, so it won't hurt to let me try to fix his leg the same way I would a man. It just might work. You mean put a cast on him? I do. I never heard of putting a cast on a horse, Doc. <laughs> Neither have I. It's crazy. I don't like it. Hmm? It's up to you, Shelly. I wouldn't have let you near my wife if I'd been here. Why should I let you fool with my horse? All right. All right, Sheila. Shoot your horse, and I'm taking you back to Dodge. What for? You're going to jail for trying to kill Doc yesterday. At least that's what Doc told me. Yeah, now, Matt, I didn't exactly Shut say... up, Doc. I ain't going to jail. I can't... Yes, you are. Unless maybe Doc changes his mind about charging you with attempted murder. Then I couldn't put you in jail. Oh? Yeah, no... No, uh, he couldn't then. Uh, you know, Sheely, I might get so busy working on this horse, I, I'd plain forget about everything else. I might even save the animal to boot. Well, make up your mind, Sheely. I gotta get back to Dodge. Well, all right. But you better make it work, Doc. I said I'd try. 
That's the best I can do. Ever. No matter who the patient is. Okay, Doc, you try. But try real hard, will you? I always do, Sheely. Real hard. <laughs> Chester and Roof made a fast trip into Dodge for plaster of Paris and some muslin to go under it. And when they got back, Doc went to work. An hour later, he had a heavy cast on the horse's leg. And after giving Sheely some final instructions, he was finished. He promised to come back in a couple of weeks and put a lighter cast on, and then we left. Sheely didn't say much, but I knew if anything went wrong with that horse, he'd be after Doc again. However, six weeks went by before anything happened. Doc and I were hiding out in his office with a game of chess we'd started a few days earlier. Yeah, doggone rook of you sitting there, Matt. If, if I move my bishop, you'll be right in on that queen. That's the only move you got, Doc. All right. There you are, Matt. See what you can do with it. <laughs> a couple more of those and I'll get that queen. Doc. Well... Hello, Sheely. Doc, I've been looking everywhere for you, blast you. Why'd you put a sign on your door saying you were out? How come you're wearing a gun, Sheely? Man, it'd be a fool not to wear a gun in this town, Marshal. He'd be a worse fool to try to use it. Don't rile me. I'm in a bad enough temper already. What's wrong, Sheely? Uh, how's your horse? My horse is tied up right outside, Doc. What? Yeah, I took that second cast off myself. Then I rode him in here. Of course, I took it easy with him, Doc, real easy. And he ain't even limping. Well, what do you know? <laughs> By heaven, it works. Oh, that's fine, but uh, what are you so heated up about, Sheely? Well, you'd be heated up too, Marshal. You've been carrying a rotten tooth in your jaw as long as I have. You mean you're looking for a doctor, Sheely? Uh, I'm man enough to admit it, Marshal. Uh, well, now, Sheely, uh, you just sit down right over there and I'll see what I can do. Okay, Doc. Hey, this is the one right here. Uh, try to get it out, will you? Uh, I'll try, Sheely. That's the best I can ever do. Ever. That's good enough for me, Doc. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there's sugar crinkles at every place. Sure, new sugar crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar crinkles... Every golden crisp nugget of them is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new sugar crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, sugar crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack, for your breakfast or a snack, sugar crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try sugar crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. So better get several packages. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Tom Tully. Polly Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and tonight Paul Freeze played Doc. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke.
Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. trip from Hayes City to Dodge was long enough horseback, but by stagecoach, it seemed endless. There were only two passengers besides me, and after the first hour on the road, we stopped talking. Just sat there in silence, waiting for the ride to be over. I'd been up late the last few nights, so I braced myself into one corner of the coach and fell asleep. I vaguely remember the stage pulling to a stop and somebody shouting. But I came fully awake when the door was jerked open and a man behind a bandana stuck a shotgun in my face. Get out of the coach. Hands in front of you. Uh, It'll be a pleasure to blast you open. (laughs) All right. Take his gun, Charlie. Yeah. Now, stand over there with the driver. You two next. Now get on out and don't try nothing. Of course. How come you didn't start shooting when they stopped me, Marshal? Well, I was sound asleep, Hank. Well, I'm sure glad of that. If we put up a fight, that fellow with a shotgun would have blowed me clean off the seat. Yeah. Yeah. How many of them are there? Just these two? That's all I've seen. Well, it could be somebody with a rifle hiding in that clump of elder over there. Could be. <laughs> ah, that'll learn him, Charlie. Yeah. Hey, look. He killed him, Marshal. Yeah, the man was a fool to try that. Go get the box down, Charlie. Right. Take this one to help you. Oh, come on, you. I'll keep an eye on these two here. So, you're a marshal, huh? I am. Well, that greenhorn got himself killed. He shouldn't have tried to shoot Charlie. No, he shouldn't. Not with a little derringer. Charlie got hit. Right in the arm. Yeah, I saw it. I just don't want nobody chasing us for murder. Under the circumstances, it was murder. It was, huh? Well... Then the only thing to do is shoot the whole bunch of you and have done with it. No, you can't do that. Mister, I got a wife and two kids in Dodge. What I hear, Dodge ain't a very good place to raise a family anyway. Look, you're in enough trouble already. Besides, you didn't kill that man. Your partner did. Yeah, that's right. It's Charlie they'll be after. How much money is there in that box, driver? Yeah, I don't know. They never tell me. Well, we'll find out. He's got it open now. Load it in them saddlebags, Charlie. Yeah. I got an idea. You're new at this game. Look, if a man was holding a shotgun on me and I was unarmed, I wouldn't have no ideas about nothing, Marshal. You always carry a shotgun, mister? Why? We might meet sometime when you don't have one. You're going to make me shoot you yet. Hey, look, your partner's ready to go. 
Okay. Uh, don't you make a move till we're out of sight. We'll ride back and kill every one of you. You understand? I guess there's nothing we can do but stand here. That's all, Hank. For right now, anyway. What'd you do, Kitty? Burn your mouth again? Oh, darn it, yes. What do you mean again? Well, it seems like you always do if the coffee's hot enough. Thanks for the sympathy. <laughs> it's as much as you gave me about the stage holdup the other day. All I said was I'm glad you were asleep. You're a lot safer that way. Well, being safe isn't exactly my main goal, Kitty. Yeah, I know. How much money was there, Matt? $2,000. You'd think they'd have paid a man to ride shotgun. Have you any idea who did it? No, they were both masked. I hear Wells Fargo put up a reward for him. Yeah, there's a thousand dollars for the one who killed the passenger, dead or alive. They must want him real bad. That's not good for business. People getting murdered. What about the other one? Uh, Three hundred for his capture. And uh, if you recover the stolen money, Kitty, well, they'll give you half of it. If I found that money, they'd give me all of it. <laughs> You'll end up in jail yet. Well, the Texas Trail isn't far from being a jail. For me, anyway. I gotta get back there pretty soon, Matt. Sure. Hey, you. Waiter. Come here and take this money or I'll throw it at you. Another gentleman in town. Uh, Kitty, I, huh? I don't want to turn around. What does he look like? Well, I, I think it's the one with the black beard. You over there. hurt me, waiter. Get over here before I bust your neck. Yeah, that's the one, all right. Is there anybody with him? No, he's alone. And he's leaving now. Oh, good. No, no, don't huh? stare at him. I don't want him to see me. Well, he's not even looking this way. He's going out the door, Matt. Uh, all right, huh? come on. I want to follow him. Okay. Is that him ahead of us there? It's a big man, yeah. Who is he, Matt? I'm not sure. But he sounds an awful lot like somebody I want. You gonna arrest him? No, not till I'm sure. Maybe not even then. Look, he's going up to docks. Yeah, so he is. Uh, Kitty, I'll leave you here. Okay. Thanks for the supper, Matt. Sure, anytime. Tomorrow? Well, I might be real busy tomorrow. I figured that. So long, Matt. Goodbye, Kitty. His arm is infected to me. Uh, how'd he do it? Well, he, he just tore it on some wire. Well, why didn't you bring him into town? It might be gangrene. Is that bad? And bad. Well, he could lose the arm or even die. Where is he anyway? Uh, on the prairie, the camp. Ain't there uh, some medicine or something I could take back with me, Doc? Oh, oh. Oh, hello, Matt. Good evening, Doc. Yeah. Uh, oh, go, go right ahead. I, I just came up for a smoke. Oh, sure. Sit down. Sit down a minute. Yeah. Ah, thanks. Now, look, mister. There isn't a medicine in the world. Never mind. But I'm telling Forget you... Forget it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Everything's okay. Yes. You better not wait too long. I'm warning you. I won't. We'll take care of everything tomorrow. So long. Ah, that man's crazy. That's what... No, he's not crazy, Doc. No, you should have heard him. I did what do you mean you did? I was outside the door, Doc. Well, he's going under the Oliferganza. I guess he isn't too worried. What's this all about, Matt? Uh, Doc, I'll explain it to you later. Right now, i got to find Chester. Oh, Chester? Yes, he's down in the office. I just left him. Oh, good. I sure hope he's had a lot of sleep lately. What's that? He's going to be pretty busy tonight. I'll see you later, Doc. Oh, 
Well, did you follow him all night, Chester? Oh, Mr. Dillon, I'm about ready to drop. Everything's getting hazy. Where is he? In the restaurant there? Yes, sir, that's where he went. He gambled the entire night. I swear I don't know how he stays awake. I can't hardly keep my eyes open. Oh, rub a rouser or tobacco juice on him, Chester. That'll help. Oh, my goodness. He just come out the door. Yeah, he's seen us. Stand steady. Yes, sir. Marshal, I, uh, I got a complaint. Now, is that so? It sure is. I had an idea this man's tracking me all night had something to do with you. Oh, how'd you know I was following you? Mister, you might as well have been wearing snowshoes with cowbells tied on them. Now, that's not true. That's a dog on Never mind, now. Chester, I... never mind. What is your complaint, mister? Well, you... Can't a decent citizen ride into the Dodge and do a little gambling without being haunted by your man here? Well, that depends on how decent the citizen really is. What name do you go by, anyway? My own. Jermo. Jermo? <laughs> is that all there is to it? That's all. Yeah. Well, Jermo, I just didn't want you to leave town without my knowing about it. Why not? I ain't done nothing. Well, Doc told me about your partner. The one who tore his arm on some wire. What about him? Well, I'm curious to see if you're going to take care of him, that's all. Well, of course I am. He'll die if you don't hurry. Well, I... I'm going after him. When? Well, it's no business of yours when. And anybody following me is likely to run into trouble. From a shotgun, Chairman? I don't use a shotgun, Marshal. Your partner's dying, Jermo. You're wasting time. And he's dying. He's my partner, not yours. I'll take care of sure. him. Sure. Sure, Jermo. But you better hurry. Return for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, since 1910, the work output of each of us has more than doubled, and the average annual income has gone from $2,400 a year to about $4,000. Yet, about 18 hours has been cut off the average work week. These facts add up to the better we produce, the better we live. Now, the second act of Gun Smoke. <laughs> Chester had been up all night, so I sent him to bed, and I hired a Kiowa Indian I knew to keep an eye on Jermo. But even though his partner was dying of gangrene from the bullet wound he'd received at the stage holdup, Jermo didn't leave Dodge that day, or the next. He knew I'd track him to their hideout and to the stolen money if he did, and he wasn't the kind of a man who'd risk his own neck just to save his partner's life. And since I had no real evidence yet, there was no use arresting him. So, all I could do was wait. That Indian is a wonder to behold, Mr. Dillon. He hasn't slept a wink in two whole days, and he don't even look tired. No, but Jermo looked tired the last time I saw him. Oh, he's been sleeping regular. Yeah, I know. But all this is wearing him out just the same. Yeah, he's getting pretty spooky. Well, I should think you would, with what he's got on his conscience. I better ask Satank if he knows another Kiowa who could spell him for a while. I think he's got a cousin around here somewhere. Oh, it makes my bones ache just to think about him not sleeping at all. Marshal, uh, I, I I got something to tell you. Huh? Well, who are you? Well, my name is Verd, but I, I'm nobody, Marshal. Just a cowboy. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a cowboy, Vern. Sometimes there is. Like yesterday. Oh, uh, what's the trouble? Uh, I found a dead man, Marshal, out on the prairie. How'd he die? Well, it looked to me like he got shot. That's why I come to you. Did you bury him? No. 
No, I, I wrapped a blanket around him, though. Yeah. Where is he, Bert? Not far from here. Maybe 15 miles? Yeah. Chester. Yes, sir? Get our horses. We'll ride out and have a look. Yeah, he's still there, Marshal. Nothing's been eaten on him. He sure got himself hid out here. My, it's a wonder anybody ever found him. Uh, Bird, you, uh, you want to take the blanket off of him? Sure. There. Um, uh, how did you know he'd been shot? Well, his arm, it's all swole up, Marshal. And then, you see here, I noticed that bullet hole in his sleeve there. Yeah. Well, looks like you've made yourself a thousand dollars, Bird. What? Wells Fargo offered it for this man, dead or alive. He robbed a stage a few days back. He did? Well, ain't I in luck. And there's another thousand for whoever finds the money he stole. It's probably buried around here somewhere, don't you think, Mr. Dillon? Hey, that reminds me. I noticed uh, something funny over there in them anthills. Like the ground being dug up. Show us, Bert. Yeah. Sure, Marshal. Right over here, wait. There. See it? Right there? Right by that big one? Yeah. Well, I declare. Huh. By golly, I think he's right, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, there's something been buried here, all right. Yeah. I think I can... Yeah, there there it is. There, I got it. Hey, looky there, Marshal. It's a, it's a money bag. And I found it, didn't I? Yes, sir. That's right, Bird. Here, look at that. That's real money, all right. Marshal... I found it, so I, I, I get the reward, won't I? Because I, I knew where it was. Yeah, you sure did, Burton. We dug up the rest of the money and then made the hole into a grave. And we buried the dead man right there. On the way back to Dodge, I told Verd he could talk all he wanted about finding the bandit's body and the reward he'd collect for it, but that he wasn't to say a word about the money we'd recovered. He couldn't understand why, and I didn't explain it to him, but I warned him he'd never get a penny of either reward if he didn't do as I said. Back in town, I didn't let him out of my sight for the next two days. I figured it'd make Germo pretty worried. And it sure did. <laughs> you know, it, it's mighty good to get off of that prairie just for change. Yeah, should think it would be. <laughs> you don't come to town much, do you? i never seen you around here before. Well, I, I've been too broke, Chester. Well, sir, it sure takes money to see the elephant in Dodge nowadays. <laughs> I'll be able to afford it soon enough. Ain't, ain't that right, Marshal? Yeah, it looks that way, Bird. Yeah, you've been mighty lucky. <laughs> So far. What do you mean, so far? Nothing. Nothing. Evening, Marshal. Ah, hello, Jermo. Uh, this the uh, fellow who found your bandit for you? Yeah, I was just telling him how lucky he is. Yeah. Yeah, all that reward money. Thousand dollars, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Is that all you're getting, mister? What do you what do you mean is that all? Well, there was more reward than that offered. Oh, you mean the stolen money? Oh, it's too bad about that, wasn't it, Bert? We, we didn't we didn't find no stolen money. You didn't? Oh, but looked everywhere. There'd been some digging nearby, but uh, <laughs> there was nothing in the hole. Well, well, now what do you make of that? Just plain disappeared, eh? Huh? Yeah, yeah, looks that way. 
Well, that's sure too bad, ain't it? But you can't have all the money in the world, mister. I ain't got all the money in the world. I'll see you later. Marshal, I, I, I did like you told me. I, I, I didn't say nothing. You did fine, Ferd. Just fine. <laughs> When we left the saloon a little later, I noticed Germo standing in the darkness of the alley, waiting. I was pretty sure he'd follow us as we crossed the plaza and walk up Front Street. When we reached Kelly's stable, Verd wanted to go in and see if his horse had been fed, so we said goodnight and left him there. Chester and I walked on a little ways, and we turned off the street. We went back entered the stable from the rear. Inside, we could hear voices. And we sneaked up from stall to stall until we were close enough to make them out. Tell me where the money is, Bert. What did you do with it? I told you, Jim. Well, the marshal's got it. We dug it up. You're lying. Now, who turned in $2,000 to collect $1,000? You stole it and hid it somewhere else. No, I didn't. I tell you. The marshal himself said there'd been some digging nearby. Now, what'd you do with it, Bert? Now, tell me before I kill you. No, no. Listen a minute, Jermo. Look, when you didn't come back, I, I figured you got caught. And then Charlie died and... I got scared. Uh, you always was a coward. That's why we left you in the bushes with a rifle when we stopped the stage. No, that don't matter. But look, Jeremy, don't you see this way? We're both safe because I'll, I'll split both the rewards with you. You know I will. You're lying. And I'm going to kill you for it. No, now don't. You're... Hold it. Come out. Come out. You're next, Marshal. <laughs> You should have had your shotgun, Jermo. I should have killed you with the hold on. That was my big mistake. No. If you'd have trusted Verd, you both could have got by with us. He was telling me the truth? He was. And you'd have never been convicted on what evidence I had. Well... I guess every man's entitled to, to make a few mistakes, Marshal. Jermo. Well, you won't make any more. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, John Daner, and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in... Gun smoke. This Monday night, Frank Lovejoy stars on CBS Radio's Suspense. Remember, Monday night, Frank Lovejoy in On a Country Road. Presented by Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills, Suspense over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. For mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. Go!
Gunsmoke. Transcribed earlier today from CBS. And in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. United States Marshal. Somebody's gone and left his wagon right out on the prairie. Now oh, there's a man down in front of it, Chester. And it sure looks like his team went off and left him. Now, uh, what would he be doing out here with a busted wagon and no team? And I expect he'll be glad to tell us. Come on. Get up. Oh, oh. oh. What? It's Mike Blocker. Yeah. Hello, Mike. Hello there. Well, this is a poor fix for a man to be in the day before his wedding. Huh? <laughs> yeah, sure is. Well, it'll keep me sober, Marshal, and Matilda will appreciate that even if I don't make Dodge tonight. <laughs> what happened, Mike? Where's your team? Oh, Chester, we hit a hole back there and the whiffle tree busted and that team, they just run off like they was glad to get shot of the whole dang thing. That must have been quite a hold you hit to do this. No, not much. <laughs> Look at here, Marshal. Huh. The bar's been sawed, happened too. Sure. It's them boys again. What boys? Them two crazy cowboys I hired on last fall. Uh, Plumber and Webb, you mean? Yeah. yeah. They've been funning me a lot lately. You mean this is just a joke? <laughs> it's what they figured, I guess. Well, it ain't much of a joke to leave a man stranded on the prairie this way. Especially when he's trying to get to town to be married. <laughs> now, this ain't so bad. Just yesterday, they cut the stinks on my saddle. <laughs> but being a bronc got loose and bucked it off before I could get mounted. I wish I were as even-tempered as you are, Mike. Well, Marshal, it, uh, it don't pay to get mad. No, but it seems to me Plummer and Webb are going a little far with their jokes. <laughs> don't they want you to get married? I don't know. I never asked him. Uh, where are they now? Oh, they rode into Dodge this morning. Uh-huh. They see me at the wedding. I had to bring the wagon so they could carry Matilda back to the ranch. Well, we'll find your team for you. Maybe we can rig up a whiffle tree or some sort. You can buy a new one in Dodge. Oh, I'd be beholden to you, Mark. Ah, uh, you'll get to town in time for a drink yet. We'll ride along with you to see what you do, Mike. <laughs> Matilda told me. Oh, 
That's right. I forgot about you and Matilda. She's the only lady in this town who is my friend. Did you bear? Oh, thanks, man. Ah. You going to the wedding, Kitty? He insists that I do. Uh, you're pretty close friends, aren't you? Pretty close, man. I guess his partner thought she can talk to me about things she wouldn't even dare mention to her nice friends. Now, they're no better than you are, Kitty. Maybe not. But there are more of them in the long run. That makes a difference. What do you want to know about Matilda and me? Well, I've been wondering if there's any reason why either of those cowboys who work for Mike Blocker wouldn't want that wedding to come off tomorrow. Plumber and Webb? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You must have some reason for wondering about it, man. Well, man's friends always treat him a little rough before he gets married, but these boys have carried it pretty far. It's jealousy, Matt. No. Which one? Plummer. He and Matilda used to see each other once in a while. Till she met Mike and fell in love with him. No. As a... Uh, Plumber threatened her, or Mike. He's afraid of Mike in spite of his gentle temper. Yeah, he should be. But he told Matilda he'd make as much trouble as he could. What kind of trouble? Anything that'll embarrass her, I guess. Like a chivalry, but real unfriendly. Now, they started their chivalry a little early. They even tried to get Mike crippled up a couple of days ago. Oh, I didn't know about that. Well, nothing came of it, but... I sure don't like to see anybody's wedding day spoiled. I think I'll look those two up and have a talk with them. I swear I've been in every saloon in Dodge, Mr. Dillon. Maybe they ain't in town after all. Well, we'll try the hotel, sir. Why don't you just throw them in jail till the wedding's over? I'd like to. Now, wait a minute. There they are. Yes. It's them, all right. I saw Mike over at the Longhorn taking on a few. Oh, well, even marrying a good woman makes a man nervous. Oh, it sure does. Well, just the thought of it, and I want to go live with the Comanche. <laughs> well, you can't let other men do all the marrying. Why not? I don't know, Judge Evans, of what they say. Hello, Plummer. Uh, Hi. Hello, Marshal. What's on your mind, Marshal? I've seen you come all the way across the plaza. Well, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the wedding tomorrow. Oh? You ought to be talking to Mike Blocker. He's the one that's getting married. <laughs> We ain't, are we, Webb? No, we ain't. <laughs> Did you think we were? Coming? All right, that's enough. You're not dealing with Mike Blocker now. You're dealing with me, and my temper's a whole lot quicker than his. No offense, Marshal. Webb didn't mean nothing. No, I didn't mean nothing. We're just in kind of good spirits. <laughs> On account of the wedding and all. For sure, you know how it is, Marshal. You call it good spirits to try to get a man hurt two days before his wedding? How? Cutting the cinch on his saddle. Oh. Mike told you. He did. He didn't seem to mind as much as you do, Mike. Don't be fooled by that. If Mike ever does get mad, there's going to be trouble. But I'm telling you to leave him alone. Oh, we ain't going to do nothing. Maybe a little chivalry after the wedding, that's all. I don't want either one of you anywhere near that wedding. Oh, now, Marshal, we were invited. The invitation's off. You understand me? Oh, but Marshal... Shut up, Webb. He's the law... We won't go near the wedding if he says so. Now, sir, we won't go nowhere as near it. That satisfy you, Marshal? Yeah, we'll be here. 
I couldn't get Chester away from that free liquor anyway. <laughs> this liquor may be free, but it ain't too stout. <laughs> I'm on my third glass, and I don't feel a thing. <laughs> you don't have enough blood in you to move it around, Chester. <laughs> That's your trouble. Well, I'd have plenty of blood if it wasn't for old quacks like you bleeding me every time I get cold. I never bled a man in my life, and you know it. Well, maybe you didn't, but I sure have been bled by other doctors. Don't oh, bleed. Blame me if you're fool enough to let them do it. Hmm. See, you know, man, I've always said if people would just stand up for their doctors once in a while and improve the whole medical profession. Well, you may be right, Doc. Of course I might. I'm going to go see if that jug is empty. Yeah, I think Mike's drunk half of them himself. Uh, take a look around outside while you're at it, huh, Justin? For Plummer and Webb? Oh, well, they haven't showed up yet, but they might be waiting. Uh, All right, sir, I'll do it. <laughs> Such a nice wedding, wasn't it, Matt? Yeah, fine, fine. I brought some ammonia along in case Mike got too weak to go through it. <laughs> his entrance was a little shaky, but he got his color back about the halfway mark. Matt. Huh? Well, what's the matter, Kitty? Matt, it's terrible, that poor girl. Well, what's happened? It's her clothes, all her new clothes. Matt, we went to a room to get a pass, and everything's been torn to sweat. What? It's a mess. And Matilda's up there crying her heart out. A plumber, I suppose. Of course she'd get it. Who else would? Poor girl. Uh, you better go back to her, Kitty. And uh, don't tell anybody about it yet. All right, man. Hey, well, what are you going to do, man? Find Plummer and Webb and lock them up. Mike's pretty drunk, and I got an idea he won't take this joke as easy as he did the other. Yeah. Do you see who killed him? 
He pulled a knife on Mike. He was going to use it, too. Somebody killed him, huh? Was it Mike? I got hit about that, Marshal. I didn't see no more. All right, Joe. You do something about Webb there, huh? Look what they did to my place. It's ruined. Who's going to pay for all this? I don't know, Joe. But I'll try to find out. I didn't find out. Not that night, anyway. We looked around the oasis inside and out, and then I sent Chester down to wait for Mike in case he showed up at Matilda's place. So I scouted the town again. But shortly after daybreak, we both gave up and met back at the office. Miss Kitty was down there, Mr. Dillon. She stayed with Matilda all night. Oh, good. How's Matilda taking it? Well, I don't think she cares about her clothes anymore. She's so worried about Mike. Uh, you uh, didn't tell her about Webb being killed, did you? Oh, my goodness, no, sir. I wouldn't do that. She'll find out soon enough, poor thing. What's Mike? Yeah, Mike. I'm going to cut you, Mike. 
And you won't look very good when Matilda sees you. Matilda? <laughs> we was friends once, Mike. Real good friends. You know the kind? You and Matilda? I, I'll tell you what it was like while I'm cutting your throat. Get out of that cell now. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Doggone if Dodge ain't grow to heap since I was here. It is very big, uh. Front Street must have seven, eight saloons. A lot of towns I've seen don't even have that many houses. We are going to stay here? Now, Nina, I told you not to fret yourself. Nobody's going to bother you. Well, look there. The Longhorn Saloon. You know, a man might find whiskey fit to drink in a place like that. Just drop your reins over the rack, Nina. Your old pony ain't about to go nowhere. I will wait right here, Scott. Here in the dust and heat? Come on, get down off that old horse. You've been riding so long, you need to walk around some. All right. Anyway, it's cooler inside. If they got a ladies parlor, you can sit in there. Well, sit on the porch. Come on. Oh, 
Sure, they got it, partner. There's the side door over there, Nina. You go on in and wait. Glass of rye, bartender. Hold that drink, bartender. Maybe you picked the wrong place to drink, mister. That so? Places down along the river let Mex women come in and sit. I've heard tell. Maybe that's where you better go. Bartender, I ain't got my drink yet. Mister, you don't understand what I said. That bartender ain't going to give you no drink. Maybe he is. No, he ain't. This place don't serve nobody that walks in with no dirty Mexican. All right, hold it. Very well, Stinchin. Hold it. All right, you men, take Lawson out to a horse trough and soak his head for him. The rest of you get about your business. Come on. You busted up what could have been a man-sized fight. Well, fights like that lead to killings. <laughs> Down if they don't. Now, you're a cool one, mister. You get that way in my profession. Oh, what's that? Army scout. I'm on my way to Fort Wallace. What's yours? United States Marshal. My name's Dillon. I noticed they paid you a heap of attention. I'm Cuff Peters and proud to know you. Marshal... I want you to meet somebody. This here is Nina. She's my wife. How do you do? Ma'am? Scott, I... Nina and me have been traveling quite a spell. Oh? Where'd you ride from? Come up from Texas. Figured we'd stay over here in Dodge if I can find a place. Nina's been feeling poorly. How long do you figure on staying in Dodge, Cuff? Can't rightly say, Marshal. Why? Well, you, uh... Made trouble for yourself when you hit Hank Lawson. That right. It'll bother him, Cuff, and he'll be after you. I know you can't make Fort Wallace, so uh, it might be better if you and your wife rode out to Fort Dodge and stayed there. He's right, Cuff. We should go on right now. We don't want no trouble. You've been riding enough, the way you feel. Besides, I got things to do. Look, uh, Cuff, I don't want any trouble here. I sure don't aim to cause any. Now, how about joining me in a drink, Marshal? I still got a glass of rye coming. Dodge was real quiet for the next week, except when a drunked-up cowboy tried to burn the town down because he lost at a faro table. I kept an eye on Hank Lawson... But the trouble I'd been expecting between him and Cuff Peters seemed to blow over. Chester heard somewhere that Cuff had found a room for Nina and himself at the widow Helgerson's place out at the edge of town. I didn't see Cuff again except once when he drove the widow's buckboard into town, loaded it up with food and supplies, and drove back out. Then one morning while Chester was cleaning up the office, Cuff walked in. Morning, Marshal. Oh, hello, Cuff. I never did get a chance to pay you back for that drink you bought me. The time will come, Marshal. <clears throat> oh, uh, Cuff, this is uh, Chester Proudfoot. Cuff Peters. Well, sir, I'm that proud, Mr. Peters. Howdy. <laughs> Mr. Dillon told me how you knocked old Hank Lawson across the bar at the Longhorn. I sure do wish I'd seen that. Uh, Chester isn't too fond of Hank. Well... If I'm going to hit him again, I'll let you know. Well, thank you. Marshal, what I come for was to get your help. Oh, what is it, Cuff? Well, I don't know much about doctors and all. And they say you're a good friend to the one in town. Oh, I've known Doc for a long time. What do you need? Well, I'm not ailing, but Nina's feeling real puny. Oh? I think maybe someone should have a look at her. We ain't been married but five, six months, and... I don't understand much about women folk and their ailments. Uh, Chester, run up and get Doc, will you? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. You see, Marshal, the thing that bothers me the most is that i got to start out for Fort Wallace right soon. I already stayed here longer than I intended. Well, if your wife's sick, you can't take her with you on a ride like that. 
That's what I want to know from the doc. Is she too sick to ride? Well, you, you could leave her here. She could come on later. Mm-hmm. I just pure hate to leave her behind if I didn't have to. Oh, uh, hello, Matt. Where's the patient? Uh, Doc, this is Cuff Peters, Doc Adams. How do you do, Mr. Peters? Howdy. Uh, Mr. Peters wants you to have a look at his wife. I'm ready. My bag's by the door there. Doc, maybe you ought to know before you come with me. My wife's Mexican. Well? The only reason I mention it. Some folks here seem to take exception. Oh, for heaven's sake, standing here talking isn't going to help Mrs. Peters any if she's sick, you know. You ready to go, young fellow? I'm ready, Doc. Marshal, I want to thank you. Sure, come. Goodbye. So long. See you later, man. He's a nice little fellow, ain't he, Mr. Dan? Yeah, he seems to be, Chester. Hey, what's he do for a living? It's an Army scout, he says. On his way out to Fort Wallace. I always had in mind that scouts was more tricky. Shucks, he's no more sly than me. <clears throat> yeah, don't let Cuff fool you, Chester. He's small, but uh, he can take care of himself. Well, one thing, he don't seem to let nothing upset him, none. Well, he's worried about his wife, Chester. Plenty. <laughs> Chester, you're going to get a bellyache. I can't help it, Mr. Dillon. Ever since I was a little boy, I just get a craving for wheat cakes at supper. Four servings? Well, I... It does make up to quite a pile, don't it? <laughs> uh, but then that molasses kind of keeps them wetted down. Oh, hello, Matt. <laughs> Chester. Uh, sit down, oh, Doc. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you gonna eat? No, Matt, no. I ate out at Widow Helgerson's with Cuff and his wife. Ah. Uh-huh. How is she, Doc? She's resting, isn't she? <laughs> uh, you know, she's a pretty little thing, Matt. Just as nice and sweet. Yeah, she is. Uh, what went wrong with her, Doc? <laughs> Nothing that won't be right in about six more months. Well, that don't make sense, Doc. She's gonna have a baby, Justin. She is. Well, it only took a minute to see that. I guess Cuff meant it when he said he didn't know much about women. Well, I should think a baby would be easy enough to tell about. At Chester. <clears throat> oh, yes. Cuff sent a message to you, Matt. He's going on out to Fort Wallace. Says after he reports into the colonel and gets a place ready out there, he'll come back for Mrs. Peters. Now, that's a ten-day ride there and back, Doc. Well, I know, man. A little while. That's a... And I don't like Mrs. Peters stand alone here in Dodge. Well, there's nothing to be worried about. She's in good hands here. Yeah, but the widow Huggerson's an old lady, Doc. She wouldn't be much help to Nina. Well, what kind of help would she be needing, Mr. Dillon? More than an old lady could give her. If Hank Lawson finds out that she's alone here. <laughs> Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this coming Tuesday night, you have one date with Pam and Jerry North and another date with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If mystery is your dish, then listen in as Mr. and Mrs. North and Johnny Dollar dish it out. Remember, the night is Tuesday, the network is CBS Radio, and the shows are Mr. and Mrs. North and yours truly, Johnny Dollar. They're here on most of these same stations this coming Tuesday. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Uh, that's, uh, that's about everything, Mrs. Peters? <laughs> Hey, thank you. Well, I'll give you a hand out to the buckboard. Oh, it's not that much. I can carry it. Well, I'll get the door for you then, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Good day. A good day, ma'am. Well, if it ain't Miss... 
Mrs. Peters come to town to do a week shopping. I beg your pardon? <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. I ain't being very polite. This here's Kane Twig. I'm Hank Lawson. What do you want? Now, surely you remember me, ma'am. You ought to. I was a fellow your husband hit in the mouth his first day in town. I remember you. Now, let me pass. Well, now, ain't I being a miserable cuss letting you carry all them heavy sacks? See, i help you some. Please. We'll just put them in the wagon for you. What? Oh. <laughs> oh, that was mighty careless of me. They slipped plumb out of my hands. <laughs> I hope there was nothing in there to break. Leave me alone, please. <laughs> well, now, Miss Peters, I don't know why you're upset. You know I wouldn't do nothing to harm a fine lady like you. Besides, your husband might try to give me another lesson in manners, and that scares me real bad. <laughs> I just want to show you how much I learned. Now, you go on and get into that buckboard. <laughs> All we're going to do is just start you for home, Miss Peters. Untie them lines so we can face that team down the street. Sure. Now, like I say, ma'am, I don't want you to fret. <laughs> Stand aside, Twig. All right, ma'am. Hang on. She's all right, Matt. She's fine. Hello, baby. There wasn't anything I could do. I... Those miserable, filthy now, beasts. Take it easy. Kid. Take it easy. What are you talking about, Matt? Those men should be No, horsemen. no, no, kid. Matt did all he could. He even roughed them up a little on the way to jail. Oh. And then yesterday morning, the judge fined them and turned them loose. Find them? Probably all of fifty dollars. Kitty, be sensible. You and your precious law. I'm sick of it. You have to go by it, Kitty, whether it seems right or not. I don't have to do nothing. Now, Kitty, don't talk like that. There's a man, I'd shoot him in the belly. Oh, now, Kitty. <laughs> oh, leave me alone, both of you. <laughs> uh, Kitty. Look, Kitty. <laughs> Why don't you go in and, and talk with her, huh? She needs another woman, huh? Go on. Nina, can I come in? Oh, it's terrible, Matt. I... Yeah. Well... What are you going to do? Well, there's nothing more I can do. Officially. No, I guess that's right. I... Look, Doc, I want you to keep Nina in your office. You can keep an eye on her there. Cuff will be back in a few days. And then... And then you'll tell him? Yeah. Yeah, then I'll tell him. <laughs> Chester. Oh, Mr. Peters. Uh, Cuff. I just got back. Widow Helgeson says there's been an accident. I should come see you. Well, uh, your wife was hurt bad, Cuff, but she's better now, though. Where is she? Uh, she's up in Doc's office. Uh, Chester will show you. I know the way. Just makes me sick, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's likely been in the saddle all day riding to get back to her. Then he gets here and... How was she tonight? Well, she ate the supper Kitty brought over. That's more than she's done in a week. You know, I'd kindly hate to be Hank Lawson. Have you seen him around? Yes, sir. Him and Twig been hanging around the Longhorn. 
Hank asked me, was anybody looking for him? And then he laughed. What'd you say then? Nothing, like you told me. I just walked on out. Yeah, good. What do you figure a cuff will do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know. Cuff's so mild and quiet and all. But I got a feeling he'd be mighty mean if once he got right. I, I want to thank you, Marshal, for all you and Chester and Doc done for Nina. I'm sorry, Cuff. Now, I wonder if you'd hold my gun for me. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to look for Hank Lawson, and I'm going to mock him. Mark him good. That way somebody's going to get hurt. That's a fact, Marshal. Look, Cuff, I won't stand for a killing. Now, Nina's well enough to travel. You, you could start for Fort Wallace. We'd fix a bed and a wagon for I'm you. I'm and... going to start for Wallace, all right. But not until I've seen Hank Lawson. Well, will you hold my gun? Until you come back for it. Thank you. Oh, uh, Cuff. Yeah? Um, Chester and I were just talking about going up to the Longhorn for a drink. We thought maybe we might walk with you. The company would be fine, but it's my deal. Sure. see the marshal come along so as he wouldn't get hurt. I'm just here to see that no shooting starts, Hank. Yeah. What's on your mind, Cuff? I left my gun at the marshal's office. So? After you drop yours on the floor, I'm going to make you bleed. Figure to take me with your fist? That's right. <laughs> All right, boys, move back. Make a little room here. <laughs> All righty, cuff. Load my gun down. Chester, just so Hank's friends don't get too excited and maybe want to help him out, move down to the end of the bar. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? There'll be no gunplay here, Hank. What's between you and Cuff, you'll settle yourself. Right in here. That's good enough for me, Marshal. All right, little fella. Come and get it. Now I'm going to take you apart, Lawson. Bit by bit. That's the way you feel. <coughs> Sit. I say. Get up, Lawson. Never mind, Marshal. He's going to fight with a knife. I'll fix me one, too. Yeah. Now, Lawson, if you're going to fight to cut, I'm ready. Fight 
Or drop it. Now get out of here. Because if I see you again before I leave, I'm going to finish what has started. Oh, oh. Gracious alive, I ain't seen anything like that since I left Waco. Cuff, as soon as you got your breath, I, I'd like to buy you that drink I owe you. Thank you, Marshal. I figure I could use it. Because my wife and me's got a long ride ahead of us. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The special music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin and Lawrence Dobkin, with Lillian Bioff and James Eagles. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Later tonight on most of these same stations, Herb Schreiner will take your sense of humor in hand and give it a once-over wonderfully on Two for the Money. Hoosier Herb and his droll wit are an irresistible combination for merriment. The quiz part of Two for the Money makes the show that much more interesting to hear. Remember, Two for the Money later tonight. George Walsh speaking. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy open fire on your funny bone Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first time I saw Lena wave, I should have resigned my job and gone to Texas on the fastest horse I could find. Handling a man is one thing, but uh, trying to handle a woman is another. Especially when she weighs some 200 pounds and is muscled like a mule and twice as ornery. Lena came to Dodge on a great draft horse with dark circles around its eyes. And she was leading an old jack mule that carried her boyfriend, Emmett Fitzgerald. And Emmett was a tired, pigeon-breasted little fellow with a green look in his face. They weren't a very handsome pair, but we were mightily impressed by him the day they rode up Front Street. I swear, Mr. Dillon, that woman must wear leather underwear. I don't know why she's leading his mule. The man doesn't look stout enough to run away if he wanted to. My, I'd sure hate to have her on my tail. Well, she's wearing a six-gun. And built like a buffalo. Well, she sure isn't the gentlest-looking woman I ever saw. 
Oh, that poor little man, Mr. Dillon. He somehow gives me the feeling he's being carried around in a bird cage. Now, quiet, Chester. They'll hear you. Yes, sir. Oh, I never thought we'd make it, Lena. You mean you never thought you'd make it? Get off that mule. Sure, Lena. Here. I'll help you tie him up, Lena. Ow! Oh! You stuck on my foot! I'm sorry. Lena! That'll learn you to be a gentleman. <laughs> you up there! Stop that! <laughs> Who are you laughing at? Why, nobody, ma'am. That's good. Because if I got the notion you was laughing at me or my man, I'd open you up. Oh, oh no. Oh, my, no. No, it, it, it was just something funny I heard the other day from a fella. What? What? What did you hear that was so funny? Well... I, I I was sitting there, and he come around the end Think of the... hard, mister. You remember, Mr. Dillon, you, you... Tell her, please. Dillon? Why, you must be the marshal here. Oh, that's right, ma'am. Well, now, marshal, I'm proud to know you. My name's Lena Wave. Shake! Well, how do you do? Do. Over here, Emmett. Sure, Lena. Marshal, it's yours, Emmett Fitzgerald. Emmett? Glad to know you, Marshal. Emmett's a gambling man. Oh, is that so? I want you to know he's honest, Marshal. Ain't you, Emmett? Sure, Lena. Say it. I'm honest. I only caught him cheating once, Marshal. Ain't that right, Emmett? I was in bed two weeks. She liked to kill me. Well, I'm glad to know that. Uh, about your being honest, I mean... Emmett will be running a game tonight. Right over there is as good a place as any. The Texas Trail. Uh, sure, sure. Glad to have you sit in, Marshal. And you can come, too, yes. if you watch your manners. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Emmett, I'd better feed you so you can get enough strength back to kneel them cards. Come on. Sure, Lena. <laughs> Chester's been in that game over there for two hours, Matt. He must be losing. Well, he usually does, Kitty. How anybody could concentrate with Lena hulking around, I don't know. <laughs> she does keep an eye on things, doesn't she? You know, Matt, I feel kind of sorry for her. Oh, she can take care of herself. What well, isn't that? She's being so big and not very pretty. After all, she is a woman. Uh, that's not too easy to tell, Kitty. You think she's in love with Emmett? Well, now, Kitty, I tell you, I haven't worked that out yet. Uh, I, I'm sure I've been studying on it, oh, though. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Every woman needs a man of some kind. Well, she's got one. Yeah. I feel sorry for him, too. Oh, Lena will take care of him. I know. But I'll bet he'd like to take care of Lena just once. After all, he's human. I tell you, that is not my hand. I had three aces. You accuse him of the cheating, and I'll shoot you dead. Oh, excuse me, Kitty. I better go fish Chester out of that. That Emmett was dealing, wasn't he? I'll blow a hole in you, mister. Right now. All right, hold it, Lena. She's about to shoot me, Mr. Dillon. You bet I am. Lena, I don't know what it's like where you came from, but you shoot anybody around here, and you're going to go to jail. You'd put a woman in jail? For shooting, I would. For fighting? What? This is what. When I hear he, he, he can put in jail for that, too, now. Now, here. This <laughs> oh, the game's closed, gentlemen, for half an hour. I need some beer, Emmett. Come on. Sure, Lena. Oh, yeah, yeah. I never seen a woman like that. Hey, I don't care what this thing. Yeah, like that, it ain't fair. Uh, here, Chester. 
Well, let me help you out. Oh, come on. There. Well, are you all right? Why didn't you stop her, Mr. Dillon? She might have killed me. Well, I, I, I don't know, Chester. I never fought with a woman. Well, I have, and I don't want no more of it. Well, you can't hit her. What can you do with her? Leave her alone. That's what I'm going to do. You know, Chester, Lena could get to be quite a problem. Well, she ain't going to be my problem. I'm getting out of here. Oh, hello, Doc. Hey, you gonna have some breakfast? Oh, eh, no, I've already eaten. We'll have some coffee, though. Oh, good. They had me up real early this morning. No? Who did? A couple of men Lena Wave got mad at. Huh? She used a bottle on them. Oh, were they hurt bad? Oh, she bloodied them up some. It wasn't real serious, though. All they did was try to protect themselves. After all, what man's going to fight a woman? Yeah, that's true. But one of these days, some drunk's not going to realize she is a woman, and he'll shoot her. Hmm. You wonder if it hasn't happened already? <clears throat> oh, see, I hear Chester caught it all right when he accused Emma of trying to cheat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found out later that it wasn't true, Doc. The other boys were just playing a joke on him. They switched his cards while he, he was under the table looking for some chips that he'd dropped. Oh, wonder all oh, that. Oh, if you ask me, a man that'll leave his hand while he crawls around on the floor deserves anything that happens to him. Well, just about everything did. Mr. Dillon? Oh, here he is. He'll tell you. Uh, uh, Mr. Dillon? Oh, say, you better come too, Doc. Huh? Uh, what's the trouble, Chester? Lena Wave. She just shot a man over at the Dodge house. What? Oh, say, we better get... This man did, Chester? He sure is, Doc. Where's Lena? She's still there. Claims it was self-defense. Did you see it? Yes, sir. I was right there. Lena was getting her room key at the desk, and this buffalo hunter come in and grabbed her. Well, he was pretty drunk. Uh, drunk? At this hour of the morning, he was drunk? Well, I guess he'd been up all night, Doc. Anyhow, he tried to kiss her. He must have been drunk. He got her gun hand behind her back, and then he pushed her up again in the desk. Oh, she was swearing at him something terrible. Well, how did she shoot him, Chester? Yeah. Well, sir, she just ooched around and squirmed herself along the desk till she'd rubbed her six-gun around on the other side. Then she just pulled it out with her free hand and shot him in the belly. She did? Oh, oh my, she's quite a woman, ain't she? She sure is. She's waiting with Emmett right inside here, Mr. Dillon. Everybody else took cover. They're scared to death of her. Yes, she... What are you here for, Doc? Eh? You can't do him no good. Eh, well, I... I... I just come to take a look at him, with you? Oh, yes, he looks dead, all right. He's dead. Why did you kill him, Lena? Well, I had to protect myself, Marshal. Nobody else would, including Emmett here. I... I figured you'd take care of him yourself, Lena. You always do. Sure. But if you was a man, you'd do it for me. Oh, now, Lena, look how big he is. He ain't very big anymore. All it takes is a gun, Emmett. Sure, Lena. There are too many people carrying guns around here already. I'm going to take yours, Lena. What for? I killed him in self-defense. He wasn't even armed. Except for that Bowie knife. You're forgetting something, Marshal. What? I'm a woman. So? So? You mean to tell me a woman ain't got the right to protect her virtue in this town? What do you men come to, anyway? Well, by, oh, by, oh, yes, she's got a point there. Uh, Ain't no judge in the world that wouldn't call it self-defense. No, you're right, Lena. I keep forgetting. You know I'm right. Emmett, we ain't had breakfast yet, and I'm hungry. Come on. Sure, Lena. <laughs> You know, I've been thinking, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what about, Chester? Well, old Lena could have let that fella kiss her this morning, just a little peck anyway, and she wouldn't have had to shoot him. Yeah, she could have, but she didn't. I declare, she's enough to curdle cream. 
Well, I hope everybody leaves her alone from now on. Marshal Dillon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Nate Bannister. Well, I'm glad to know you. You won't be, if what I hear is true. Oh? Jim Henry was my friend, Marshal. Is that so? Nobody's going to shoot a friend of mine and get by with it. Not even a woman. He was drunk, Nate, and he was treating her bad. And it's no call to kill him. In this country, a woman's free to protect herself any way she can. Yeah. That's what everybody I've talked to say. Well? Don't sit with me. You going to arrest her? No. Okay, then. Now, oh, wait a minute. What? Where are you going? I'm Marshal. I'm going to kill me a woman. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night on CBS Radio's Suspense, hear Jeff Chandler in Death at Skrykerud Pond. It's an exciting trial in which a young man faces death because of his decisions made as a member of a World War II underground. It's a fascinating study in suspense, and it's yours to hear this Monday night over most of these same stations at the Star's Address. Monday, Suspense. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Nate Bannister was obviously a buffalo hunter, same as his friend who had been shot that morning. He was a huge man with a heavy black beard and Eyebrows so thick it was hard to tell if he was looking at you or not. I watched him as he stood in the doorway, having just said that he was going to kill Lena Wave. And I realized that a man that primitive was capable of doing anything, even shooting a woman. And I wasn't sure how to stop it, unless I shot him first. The way I was brought up, Marshal, that's what friends is for. If somebody kill you, then they gotta kill them. You do any killing around here, Nate, and you'll be tried for it. Maybe. If you catch me. I'll catch him. Why you gotta protect women, Marshal? Just cause they're so weak and puny? Is that Nate Bannister? Huh? You heard me. Why? Yes, ma'am. I'm Nate Bannister. Well, they didn't tell me you was so big. Who didn't tell you? How'd you know my name? You've been spreading it around that if the marshal don't arrest me, you'll shoot me. That true? Are you leaning away? I am. And if there's going to be any shooting, I want in on it. Now, wait a minute, Lena. I ain't going to get bushwhacked by no dirty buffalo hunter, Marshal. Bushwhack? I wouldn't do that to nobody. Especially the uh, lady. Lady? Yes, ma'am. He called me a lady, Marshal. Well, you are, ain't you? Of course I am. Yeah, what's the matter with calling you one? Nothing. I kind of like it. Just because you ain't pale and skinny like ordinary women. No. Of course I ain't. Why, I... I never seen a woman like you. Nowhere. You're kind of admirable. <laughs> Listen to him, Marshal. Ain't he a one? Oh, I mean it. I sure do. Oh. I sure do. No, you don't. I'm too big. Too big? You want to be like all them little scrawny women? 
They can't do nothing. They're no good. They ain't. Oh, no. A real man needs someone, uh, 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 better than that. He does? Of course he does. Like me? Yeah. Like you. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? You was gonna shoot me a minute ago. Oh, no. I didn't mean nothing by that. Hey, come on. I'll buy you beer. We'll talk about it. Well, okay. Go on, Marshal. Yeah. Don't you worry about nothing, Marshal. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir. That jug of corn whiskey's still out back. Yes, sir, it was last time I looked. Go and get it. Those two make quite a couple, Matt. Look at them. They've been sitting there most all day. Yeah, a pretty shaggy pair of lovebirds, if you ask me. How's Emmett taking all this? Well, he didn't find him till a couple of hours ago. No? What happened? Oh, where is he? Nate ran him off. He probably had done more, but Lena wouldn't let him. You know, Matt, I think underneath she's real fond of that little Emmett. Yeah? <laughs> and she's got a strange way of showing it. Women do sometimes. Well, it doesn't matter as long as she keeps out of trouble. She leads quite a life, doesn't she? Shoots a man in the morning and falls for his best friend in the afternoon. <laughs> She might have shot both of them if Nate hadn't started sweet-talking her. Well, he made her feel like a woman, that's what. Oh, sure. Nothing wrong with that, is there? It probably saved his life. All right, mister. Now you get away from her. I'm mad at Emmett. Yeah. You heard me. I thought you'd gone home. I ain't gone home. Not without Lena, I ain't. <laughs> yes, you are. Lena and me is going to get married. I didn't say that. I ain't had time to tell you. I'm... I'm warning you, mister. <laughs> Excuse me, Kitty. Yeah. I better stop this. <laughs> Look, fella. I'm going to kiss her. Watch. No. Hold it, Emmett. Oh! <laughs> All right, Emmett. Give me that derringer. Sure, Marshal. Chester! Yes, sir, here I am, Mr. Dillon. Get Nate's gun before he comes to. All right, sir, I'll get it. All right, then take him over to Doc's, huh? He doesn't look too bad hurt. No, sir, he ain't. I'll take care of him. Em. You shot him. I know. You shot him over me. Well, he was stealing you, Lena. And you went and shot him. I was kind of ashamed this morning when that other fella tried to kiss you. You're a man after all, Emmett. I couldn't stand losing you, Lena. Oh, I didn't care nothing about him. You didn't? No. I was just tired of not being treated like a woman. He called me a lady and... Kind of lost my head. That's all. The well, limit kind of lost his head, too, Lena. All right, Emmett. Come on. You're going to jail. No, Marshal, please. Come on. Get going, Emmett. All right. My husband goes to jail. So do I. Uh, your husband? Of course. We've been married ten years, Marshal. I always knew it wasn't a mistake. Well, he's still going to jail. Please, Marshal. Don't take him. Of course I'll take him. He just shot a man, didn't he? He was only protecting his lawful wedded wife. You've got to let me go with him. Well, I can't leave him now. I've been waiting ten years for him to treat me like a woman. Oh, please, Marshal. Look, Lena, there's been nothing but trouble since you hit Dodge. Please, Marshal. When Nate gets patched up, he'll be gunning for Emmett here. Emmett'll kill him next time. 
All right. All right, Leo. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Get out of Dodge, both of you. Right now. You mean it? If you hurry. Oh, thank you, Marshal. Hey, let's go, Emmett. Wait a minute. What? Huh? Take my arm. All right. Now, Lena. Come on. Sure, Emmett. Sure. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg with Vic Perrin and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Mr. and Mrs. North of CBS Radio get into an arty crowd, an artful crowd, too, when mixed paints and mixed emotions make murder. Here are collector's item, Ham and Jerry's latest thriller, leading them a merry chase mid works of art before they nab their killer. It's on most of these same stations Tuesday night. On the same evening, you have a date for thrills with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Don't forget. George Walsh speaking. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Hello, Kitty. <laughs> oh, I didn't see you. You'll get shot someday walking around in days like that. You'll get sunstroke sitting out here in the heat and the dust. I don't see people in the daylight very often. I wanted to find out if they're any different. <laughs> Sit down. Uh, well, are they? Any different? Uh, I don't know. But I've spotted a few I think might be sober. <laughs> That's different. Uh, for you, maybe. You know, I was just thinking, Kitty. There's hardly a man comes to Dodge that isn't looking for trouble of some kind. They call it fun. Yeah, sure. But part of their fun's beating somebody up or shooting him. I've heard of places where the men have to check their guns when they come to town. Ah, oh, that never works. They can always hide a gun. Or a knife. You ought to go fishing, Matt. 
Huh? Have some fun yourself. Quit worrying for a while. Oh, I'm not worried, Kitty. You know, if it wasn't for all these men stalking each other, I'd be out of a job. There are other jobs besides keeping the peace, Matt. Yeah, I've tried most of them in my time. Hey, Mr. Dillon. Oh, hello, Miss Kitty. Hello, Chester. Uh, Doc sent me to find you. There's an old man up in his office. Oh, what does he want me for? The old man's been shot. Shot? Yes, sir. Claims somebody tried to kill him. You mean he was ambushed? I guess he was. Anyway, it hit him in the neck. <clears throat> All right, Chester. I'll go back with you. He's got a friend with him, but they're both strangers around here. Now, you see what I mean, Kitty? Young or old, they're all looking for trouble. Maybe it'd help if we burned this place down. I'll sit here and think. See you about it later, Matt. Where's the doc? Somebody come for him. Oh, what do you mean? Somebody come for him. That's what. Said somebody else was sick. You're the man that was shot, huh? We don't need you, Marshal. We'll handle this. What's your name, mister? Peavy. John Peavy. My partner's name's Rives. Milligan Rives, Marshal. You ain't never heard of us. Where are you from? Up north. Well, sod busters don't usually wear six guns. What are you doing in Dodge? We quit the land, Marshal. We're going to enjoy ourselves for change. We ain't never going back. Oh? Hmm. Uh-huh. You're a little old to be making a move like that, aren't you? I ain't hardly 60. Neither is Rive. Mm-hmm. Well, it didn't take you long to get into trouble, did it? We ain't in trouble. Maybe you're not Rives, but Peavy here's just been shot. I told you we'd handle this, Marshal. Ain't nobody gonna sneak up on John Peavy and shoot him. I don't care if she is a woman. A woman? What woman? Oh, you always did talk too much, Peavy. You might as well tell him now. I ain't gonna tell him. I'll fix her myself. You'll tell me or I'll throw you in jail till you do. I'm not going to have any women killed around here. Now, do you understand that? Hey, go on, tell him. You already started. Well, all right. She, she come up the alley, Marshal, next to our sleeping room, and she shot right through the window. Rive seen her running around the corner after her. I, I, I'm going to fix her good. Yeah, she's been threatening him, Marshal. I hear to do it. Who is this woman? What's her name? Yeah, she's one of them um, gals that works at the Texas Trail, Marshal. Name of Kitty. I'm sorry to bother you, Kitty. Well, come in. Come in. Uh, My room's a mess. I wasn't expecting any callers. Well, it's uh, important, Kitty. Of course. What's the trouble, Matt? You know a man called John Peavy? Peavy? Yeah. Yeah, I know him, the old fool. But did you threaten to shoot him? Don't tell me he's come and complained to you about that. Well, no, not exactly. Well... I told him I'd shoot him, and I will, too, if he doesn't leave me alone, the old goat. He's been shot, Kitty. What? He wasn't hurt very bad, but uh, he and his partner claim a woman did it. Now, they say it was you. Do you think I did it, Matt? Well, Kitty, if you got mad enough and you had a gun in your hand, I'd be one of the first to hide, but uh, to sneak up on somebody in cold blood. Uh, no, you didn't do it. When did it happen? Oh, an hour or two ago. I've been right here, alone. I guess I couldn't prove it. Well, you don't have to, Kitty. Thanks, Matt. The reason I came was uh, to tell you about it and see... Well, see if you had any ideas. All I know about Peavy and his friend Rives is that there are a couple of old men who've been acting like schoolboys. Oh. Like they've run away and are having their last fling. And I don't want anything to do with either one of them. Well, I don't blame you, but... uh... 
Rives claims he saw a woman down the alley after the shooting. You, uh, any idea who it might have been? No. He's probably lying, dreaming. Yeah, maybe. Well, if you hear anything, let me know, Kitty. And, uh, if PV gives you any more trouble, send for me. I sure will. been up this early in the morning since I can remember, Mr. Dillon. Oh? How about last Sunday, Chester? Last Sunday? Yeah. Oh, well, that's different. That was still Saturday night, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, there comes Miss Kitty. What in the world is she doing up at this hour? Uh, she's in a hurry, whatever she's doing. Matt! Hello, Chester. Morning, Miss Kitty. What's the trouble, Kitty? Matt, somebody tried to shoot me. What? In my room, just a while ago. I had a pillow down by my feet. I guess they thought my head was there. They put a bullet right through it. What, did you see anybody? No, it came from outside. I didn't dare look out right away. It, it, it's kind of the same as happened to Peavy, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe it was Peavy. He threatened something like this. I'm scared, Matt. Well, you should be. Chester. Yes, sir? You stay with Kitty. Don't let her out of your sight. I'm going after Peavy and Rives. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Tuesday, Pam and Jerry North prove that solving a murder is a family affair. And on the same evening, John Lund, as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings us the thrilling details of his latest insurance fraud investigation. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> By noon, I'd searched the whole town, and there was no sign of P.V. or his friend Rives. They disappeared. And until I found them, I didn't dare leave Kitty where they could get at her. So I had Chester drive her out to a friend's place a few miles from Dodge, and she was happy to go. Now, we didn't have any luck until the next afternoon. Cowboy happened to mention to Chester that he'd come across a couple of drunks camped about a mile up the Arkansas. I decided it was worth riding out and taking a look. And it was. It's him, all right. Yeah, and they've seen us. Keep your head up now. You think they'll fight us? Uh, you never know. What are you doing out here, Marshal? Looking for you. Well, you found us. Get down and have a drink. Well, what you got there? Corn liquor. Only about half a jug left, though. What's that other jug? We killed that yesterday. Here. Have a swallow. Well, say, now, that's right kind of... Chester. Uh, but, of course, I don't drink before sundown. Leastwise, not very often. Why'd you come out here if, uh, if you don't want to drink? How long have you men been here? Day before yesterday. Peavy's neck was bothering him, and I figured a couple of days in camp like this might ease it off some. And I get to... Feeling better. I'm going back and teach that gal Kitty a lesson, though. I swear I am, Marshal. Somebody tried that this morning. Eh? What do you mean? She got shot at, Peavy, the same way you did. That don't make no sense. Why, well, he's just thinking you done it, Peavy. How could I do her? I've been laying here drunk for two days. Anyway, uh, I wouldn't shoot no woman, Marshal. I beat him up a little, that's all. 
know, knock them around. Well, what kind of men you think we are? I don't know. Why did you leave home in the first place? Yeah, home. <laughs> Man don't live forever, Marshal. You got to enjoy yourself while you can. It rives. Rives. You tell him what you told me. About them graves. Well, I I was in the graveyard once, long time ago, and I noticed something I never forgot. No, sir. Never. Yeah. Tell him where I was. Well, Marshal, I, I, I looked around, and I seen that there was as many graves shorter than me as there was graves longer. And uh, that got him to thinking about dying, Marshal. So one day we decided to enjoy ourselves and quit working so hard. Hey, hey, hand me that jug, Rives. Yeah, help yourself. Uh, Hold it a minute, Peavy. Huh? I want to tell you something. What? I'm going to leave you here, but if I see you around Dodge, either one of you, I'll throw you in jail. What's this? We ain't done nothing. You have it in mind to beat up Kitty. And if you did that, I might kill you. So stay out of town. Come on, Chester. We left them there, passing the jug back and forth across their fire on the riverbank. Talking of death, probably and of the hard, empty lives that they'd had. The prairie often left men a little too hungry and a little too dry. Chester and I were talking about it when we spotted a woman up ahead. She was walking after a saddle horse, which we figured must have thrown her and got loose. She was an old woman and dressed for Sunday in a long black skirt and a big hat with a fancy pin stuck through it. I sent Chester to catch the horse while I rode up to her and dismounted. My friend will bring your horse back, ma'am. Are you all right? I'm all right. Well, how'd he get loose? Mean critter, he run off. Oh, I see. Uh, you live around here? No. You've been down by the river, ain't you? I just came from there. Why? See anybody? Well, a couple of men lying around a fire, that's all. Drinking? Yeah. Yeah, they were drinking. Uh, you know them? I might. Are you looking for somebody? I might be. Well, uh, maybe you'd like us to ride back there with you. And, uh... I don't need nobody to ride nowhere with me, mister. Oh. oh what's your name, ma'am? What's my name? I don't take to scallywag cowboys asking me my name. Well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. You didn't? Well, no, ma'am. Of course I didn't. What's yours? Matt Dillon, ma'am. Dillon. I heard that name somewhere. Well, we won't be introduced proper unless you tell me yours. My name's Sabina Peavy. Ms. Peavy? I've been married 35 years, Dylan. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Seems gentle enough. Uh, I'll hold him while you get back on, ma'am. I can manage. Hey, look what she's got tied to her saddle, Mr. Dillon. One of them old cavalry pistols. Yeah, grab it and put it in your belt, Chester. What? You heard me. Yes, sir. You put that back, you thief. What are you, anyways? Suppose you'll steal my horse next. I'm a U.S. Marshal, Miss Peavy. Everything's going to be all right. A marshal, eh? I uh, want you to come back to Dodge with me. Chester will bring your husband in. Is she Peavy's wife? You can't stop me, Marshal. Chester, hmm? go back to that camp and shoot a hole in their jug. And when they're sober enough, bring them to town. And don't say anything about Miss Peavy. Yes, sir, I'll do it. Hey, you're going to be all right with me, ma'am. Well, you stole my gun and you're stronger than me. I guess I'll have to go. Ah, 
Shall I make another pot of coffee for us, ma'am? No. No, thanks, Dylan. Oh. Well, they ought to be here pretty soon. It's nearly evening. It, you'll tell that girl, Kitty, how sorry I am I tried to shoot her, won't you? Well, I'm sure Kitty will understand. Imagine me being blind jealous after 35 years. You, uh, told me you were out to kill your husband. If, if that's true, why would you be jealous? You can be jealous, even if you hate a man, Dylan. You hate Peavy? I didn't know how much I hated him till the day that old fool Rives come by. The two of them rode off together. He come into the house and took the money and left, just like that. After 35 years. How, uh, how'd you know they'd come here? Oh, they was always talking about Dodge. It was always talking about laying on the bank of the Arkansas and drinking corn liquor, too. I knowed where they was. You, you're mighty dressed up for a woman riding not to shoot a man. Well, it seemed fitting somehow. Only good clothes I ever owned, Dylan. Wore them when I left home, St. Louis. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad I ran into you, Miss Peavy, before it was too late. I'll talk to him. I told you I would. But I ain't never going back to him. Well, he's had his fun. Maybe he'll settle down now. Not with me, he won't. Dylan, I bore that man 13 children. 13? 11 of them died. And he beat me every time we lost one. Every time, Dylan. Oh, I see. Well, uh, where are the other two? He ran them off. Don't know where they are. Oh, oh here, here comes your husband. Looks like Chester's got him pretty sober. But I... I don't want to talk to him in here in front of everybody. Well, you, you could go out back there in one of their cells, if you don't mind. Oh, what difference it make? My, my hat on straight, Dylan? Yeah. Yes, ma'am, you look fine, ma'am. I'll wait out back. Here they are, Mr. Dillon. Sober as deacons. What's this all about, Marshal? What do you want us for? We ain't bothered nobody. Peavy, hmm? you go out back through that door. There's somebody wants to see you. Who? Get moving. No, you stay here, Rives. Go on, Peavy. Well, all right. Who's out there, Marshal? His wife. You mean... What will I do with their guns, Mr. Dillon? Uh, throw them in a drawer, Chester. Okay, sir. Hey, what's that? He's beating her. Come on. Look at Peavy. She knocked him out. I think I killed him, Dylan. Killed him? He sure looks dead. You stabbed him. I had been. He beat me for the last time. Said he was going to kill me. I put it right in his heart. Well, you little devil, I'll get you. No, you won't, I'll... Rives. Miss Peavy, you come with me. Chester... Lock up Rives in another cell. What for? You can't lock me oh, up. Oh, you ain't even armed, Rives. Get moving. Well, I tell you, I'm an innocent man. All right, sir. Come into the office, office man. Shut up. Your voice hits my ears. He, he was going to kill me, Dylan. I know he was. Well, I... I shouldn't have let him be alone with you. Well, you didn't know. 
What are you going to do with me now? You, uh, you mentioned St. Louis, Miss Peavy. Uh, you, you have any people there? My sister. She's all that's left. Huh. Well, how'd you like to see her? You ain't holding me? It was self-defense. Then I can go. I'll hold Rives here till you're out of town. Oh, but I... I can't get to St. Louis. Took all her money when he ran off. It's all spent. I know it. Miss Peavy, would you think I'm a scallywag cowboy if uh, I offered to stake you to St. Louis? Thanks, Dylan. Wait till I tell my sister about you. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Ralph Moody, and Helen Cleave. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Silver, star of the Broadway and film versions of Top Banana, visits Mike Wallace on Stage Struck tomorrow over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. Stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. got in the boy, Mr. Dillon. When I come for you, he was offering to shoot his initials into the mirror behind the bar. Is he drunk, Chester? Yes, sir. But mostly it seems like he just plain wants to howl. Well, he can howl all he likes as long as he keeps his gun quiet. Oh, there he goes. Yeah. I hope that's the mirror and not some man he's shooting at. Yeah, so do I. Old Duff would hate to lose that boy. All right, watch it now. Look. He's laying on the floor, Mr. Dillon. He's been killed. Look what he done to my mirror, Marshal. You shoot him, Sam? No, I hit him with a bung starter. He ain't dead. But I'm about to have to shoot his friend here. Go ahead and try it. Maybe I will. Easy, Sam. All right, what's your name, mister? My name's Blades. I work for Tom. You mean you work for his father, don't you? Well, sure, the old man owns the ranch, but... Me and Tom, we work together. Oh, my. Pick up his gun before he comes to, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Blades. Tom's going to sleep it off in jail. You want to be locked up with him, or you're going to go home quietly? I ain't done nothing. 
It was that girl over there got him started. Oh, what girl? That one sitting at the table in the red dress. What? Kitty? Yeah, that's her name. Wait till old Dolph hears you threw his son in jail. I'll tell him myself. Now you get out of here. I'm going. He's at the Dodge house right now, Marshal. I'd like to hear you tell him. Can you get Tom over to the jail, Chester? Yes, sir, I sure can. All right, lock him up. I'll be back later. Oh. Yes, sir. All right, come on now, Tom. Oh, you ain't hurt me. Oh. You gonna let Chester put him to bed, Matt? Yeah. <clears throat> Sam knocked all the fight out of him, Kitty. I know. I saw it. Blade said that uh, you made him mad. That's one way of putting it. Oh, what do you mean? He made me mad. I don't like fresh kids, Matt. Tom Vickers must be 20. Well, he's been acting like a kid. You know, Matt, he's changed lately. He used to be a gentleman like his father. I don't know what's come over him, but if he were mine, I wouldn't allow him off the ranch. Maybe you've just forgotten what it's like to be young, Kitty. I'm young enough to pour this glass of beer over your head. (laughs) You know what I mean. Sure. Well, that fellow Blades is older, though. Maybe he's responsible for Tom's jump in the fence. I don't like him at all. I'm sure he isn't a good influence on Tom. Yeah, Tom's too easily led. Yeah, he isn't the man his father is. He sure isn't. Anyways, he better leave me alone. Yeah, I'll tell him to. Well, I've got to go see Dolph now. He isn't going to like you throwing his son in jail. Yeah, maybe not. But a stranger was shot and killed on his range yesterday. And I don't like that. Oh, I hadn't heard. Well, they haven't been talking much about it. Well, looks like you and Dolph are in for a pleasant little talk. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so long, Kitty. Goodbye, Matt. Marshal, come in. How are you, Dolph? Fine, Marshal. I've been sitting here smoking a cigar before I went to bed. Have one? Uh, no, 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 thanks. Dolph, uh, I got some bad news for you. Tell me. Tom tried to shoot up the Texas Trail a while ago. Sam laid him out, and all right now he's in jail. Anybody hurt? Oh, the boy's got a bump on his head, that's all. I don't like the idea of Vickers being in jail. I'm sorry, Dolph. How do I get him out? Well, I'll turn him loose in the morning. No Vickers was ever in jail before, Marshal. Well, it's not that important to me, Dolph. If you want him out now, you can come and get him. No. No, He's done wrong. He's got to pay for it. I thank you for coming to tell me, Marshal. Sure, Dolph, sure. But uh, there's something else I want to talk to you about. What's that? Well, I heard that a man was shot and killed on your range yesterday. It's true. Who did it? He was rustling cattle, Marshal. Oh. Well, were you there? No, but I've been losing a lot of stock lately. That fellow got caught by my men and put up a fight. So, there's one less thief around. You know who this man was? Never saw him before. But there's nothing wrong with shooting thieves, is there? Well, not if I try to shoot you first. I'm going to hire me some gunmen, Marshal. I'll show with them... No, that no, can't... that'll just cause trouble, Dolph. Gunmen will shoot anybody that happens along and then claim that they put up a fight. You know what they're like. Yeah, then everybody better stay away. Everybody won't know about it, Dolph. You don't want innocent men killed, do you? Of course I don't. But I don't want my cattle stole either. Dolph, uh, you mind if I ride back out to your place with you tomorrow and have a look around? I got business in Dodge tomorrow, but I'm going out the day after. Be glad to have you. Oh, good. Well, I'll meet you here then. Okay, Marshal. <laughs> Some 
men branding cattle up ahead, Dolph. That'll be Tom and Blades. They got a camp near here. I put Tom in charge of this whole section. They left Dodge yesterday morning early, Dolph. I know. I saw them leave. Oh, you did? They didn't see me. I was sitting across the street. Oh. Yeah, that's Tom, all right. Coming to meet us. He shouldn't stop work just because we ride by. We'll wait here. Who now? Who? 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 Hello. Howdy, Tom. Tom. What calves are those, Tom? Oh, it's a bunch of men gathered day before yesterday, sir. Where are the other men? How come just you and Blades are working them? Oh, we got all but about uh, 20 of them branded yesterday. I figured me and Blades could finish them alone. Two men ain't enough with a bunch like that. You'd have saved time if you'd kept more men to help. Well, let's ride over there. I want to look at them. Point. Maybe I better stay and help you. Oh, no, sir. We're doing fine. We'll be all through by evening. And your herd's getting scattered now. We'll handle them. Sure, don't you worry none, Mr. Vickers. I ain't worried none, Blades. Tom, next time you keep at least three more men with you when you got a bunch this size. No, okay, sir, I'll do it. In case you're wondering about the marshal here in Chester... They're going to look things over for a day or so. Marshal thinks maybe he can cut the trail of them cattle thieves. I sure hope so. We ain't had much luck, except for that one. Now, go on back to work. I'll ride out here next week sometime. All right. Uh, get that iron ready for another one, Blaze. It's red hot now. Come on, Marshal. I'm late enough. <laughs> Even Mr. Dillon, ain't it? Don't you think so? What? Oh, I was just wondering what kind of an evening it is in Dodge, Chester. Oh, if there was any real trouble, somebody would have rode out and told you. Yeah, I suppose so. That's been two days now. Oh, we better get back tomorrow. That'll suit me fine. I swear we've rode a thousand miles over this ranch. And all for nothing, as far as I can tell. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you come set in the porch, you two? Oh, we're just walking our supper off a little bit, Dolph. Yeah, I've been in the saddle so much the last two days, I need to stand. Mm. Suit yourselves. Uh, Dolph, from what the men tell me, you've lost only about a hundred head of calves altogether. I had the impression that it was a lot more than that. I won't put up with one calf being stolen from me, Marshal. I'm an honest man, and I work hard. And if a neighbor or stranger needs help, I'll give it to him gladly. But I'll kill the man that steals. Well, I wish you'd do one thing for me, Dolph. What's that? The next time you lose any stock, send word to me before you turn this outfit into an arm camp. Well, Marshal, if it was anybody else, I'd tell him to mind his own business. But, um... I'll do it. Thank you, Dolph. Oh, by the way, uh, we're going to be riding back to Dodge tomorrow. All right. But I won't give you more in a couple of days next time. <laughs> well, that's better than nothing, Dolph. get to Dodge if we stop and tally ever heard of cows we come across. Uh, this is a bunch I wanted to see, Chester. We'll travel as a crow flies from here in. Come on. Why was you so interested in that herd? We must have rode through it ten times. I was sort of interested in proving something to myself, Chester. Yes, sir. Now look up ahead there. Oh, a couple of dogs, men, I reckon. Yeah, probably. 
I say, it's Tom and that fellow Blades. Yeah. Where's my old man, Marshal? We left him at the ranch, Tom. We're going back to Dodge. Empty-handed, huh? Not quite. What do you mean, not quite? Oh, Blades, I'll tell you. I just looked over that bunch of stock back there. Sure. We gathered them yesterday. Now we're going to do a little branding. You better. We'd better? You ain't bossing us, Marshal. Just get them branded, Tom. All of them. Of course we'll get them branded. See that you do. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. I don't understand what you was driving at, Mr. Dillon. That's the same herd those two were working the day we rode by here with Dolph, Chester. Well, see, now, I didn't notice that. And you probably didn't notice about 20 calves in there that are still unbranded. What do you mean? Tom Vickers and his friend Blades are thieves, Chester. And probably murderers to boot. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, today, good engineers are needed in hundreds of varied fields. You can build a fine career as a trained engineer and at the same time help maintain America's scientific and engineering superiority. For information, write Box 40, Midtown Station, New York, 18, New York. That's Box 40, Midtown Station, New York, 18, New York. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Where's Matt? Oh, he'll be back in a minute, Doc. Come down. Oh, no, don't mind if I do. Say, he told me about Dolph Vickers' son last night. You know, the only thing I can't figure, Doc, is why he don't tell Dolph. Oh, he's got his reasons, I expect. But, uh, I didn't come here to gossip. Did either of you had supper yet? Uh, I had early tonight. But Mr. Dillon probably go with you. Good yeah. oh, evening, Doc. Ah, you look hungry. You look worried. Adolph Vickers, boy? Yeah. Now, sooner or later, I'm going to have to arrest him, Doc. I've been trying to figure some way to do it without breaking the old man's heart. Oh, I don't suppose there is any other way, Matt. Huh? Well, if there is, I haven't thought of it. Uh, somebody out back, Mr. Dillon. No, stay where you are, Chester. I'll see who it is. I'll be right with you, Doc. Sure. Sure, Matt. You're going to starve to death waiting for somebody to eat with around here, Doc. Oh, why, fasting's good for Manchester. <laughs> and a little of it wouldn't hurt you. Oh? Seems to me I spent my entire youth fasting, Doc. I won't never make up for it. Uh-oh. What's that? I don't know, but I better go see. Mr. Dillon? Get out, Chester. Somebody shooting at you? Quiet. It's okay, Chester. They've gone. Somebody was shooting at you. Yeah. After they knocked on the door, they ran up behind that far shed there. Plenty poor shooting. Well, ain't we going after them? Now, they had horses hidden there. I heard them ride off. Well, I'll go buy a couple from the rail. I'll no. Run. No, let them go, Chester. Hey, but Mr. Dillon, they tried to ambush you. I know. But I'd prefer not to shoot him. Especially Tom Vickers. Tom? We'll ride out to the ranch tomorrow, Chester. Maybe we can bring him in without a fight. Anyway, it's worth a try. For Dolph's sake. Dr. 
Charles? Anybody home? Here comes somebody. There. Oh. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Dolph. Chester. Hello, Dolph. Come on in. Come on in. Thank you. Where are you going, Tom? Ain't you going to say hello? I got work to do. What kind of manners is that? There's no use running away, Tom. You wouldn't get far. What? Now, come on back and sit down, huh? You do a lot of ordering around, don't you, Marshal? Sometimes I do. What's the matter between you, anyway? Be better if you told him, Tom. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Did you brand those calves the other day? What calves? Wait a minute, Tom. Did you, Tom? Of course we did. You willing to ride out there with us and prove it? I ain't riding nowhere. I've had enough of this. You tell me what you're talking about. Tom? Maybe you better tell me, Marshal. Well, Duff, you remember the herd Tom and Blades were working the day we rode out here with you? Of course I do. Well, I saw that same herd on the way back to Dodge. There were still about 20 unbranded calves in it. Say it out, Marshal. I ran into Tom and Blades just beyond, and I told them to be sure and brand those calves. Go on. So they knew I was on to them. On to what? Dolph, I'm willing to bet everything I got that if we find that herd, those calves are either still unbranded or missing. What makes you so sure? Tom refuses to ride out there with us. What you're saying is mighty serious, Marshal. I hope you won't regret it. Come on, Tom. We'll go see them calves. No. We're going out there, I said. I ain't going. You'll do what I tell you. Not this time. We're going if I have to knock you down and tie you onto your horse. And you know I'll do it. Yeah, you would. Them calves ain't there. Then where are they? Twenty calves ain't hard to track, Tom. Blades got them. Got them where? Up by Little Spring. You don't have to say it. I know Little Spring ain't on this ranch. Go on. There are three other men up there. You don't know them. They're holding over a hundred head by now. Tom. You gonna charge your own son for stealing from you? Are you? Tom, you and Blades killed that stranger to help you cover up all this, didn't you? It's too bad we didn't kill you, Marshal. What's that? They tried to ambush me in Dodge last night, Dolph. My own son. A murderer. And a thief. Tom, come into the other room with me. You'll excuse us, gentlemen. He's going to help him get away, Mr. Dillon. Not if I know Dolph, he isn't. I expect he just wants to talk to him alone before we take him to jail. Mm. Yes, sir. You know, I feel a whole lot sorrier for Dolph than I do for the boy. I guess should. Mr. Dillon. Uh, it's all right, Marshal. Where's Tom? I killed him. Here's my gun, Marshal. I'm sorry you did it, Dolph. I had to. Marshal, I'd like to bury him now. Uh, we'll help you. Nope. I'll bury my own dead. Then I'll ride into jail with you. All right. You'll get my calves back? I'll pick up a posse when we get to Dodge. 
The boy was my responsibility, Marshal. You understand that. What you did was wrong, Duff. You can wait here in the cool of the house. I'll be back. We'll wait. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Paul Dubov, Charles A. Baston, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow, don't miss The High Mountain, a hard-hitting documentary report on the progress and problems of 15 million Negro Americans. Tomorrow in the daytime on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. Saturday nights, Herb Schreiner shells out on Two for the Money over the CBS radio network. city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and a smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. I'm that dry I could fair spit cotton, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you can fill up at the Olifraganza when we get back to Dodge, Chester. Yes, sir. But right now, I'd settle for a drink of water. <laughs> you can't be that thirsty. I'm about to stampede. You think there might be a spring in that clump of elder up ahead? Yeah, there might. I swear next time I'm going to carry a water bag. And keep it wrapped in your pillow, I suppose, huh? You know, Chester, town life has made you mighty soft. That's far enough for... He's got a rifle, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Who are you, men? I were looking for water. Is there a spring in there? I said, who are you? What's your name? Matt Dillon. And I'm Chester Proudfoot. You don't worry me. And I never heard of no Dillon. Well, then you shouldn't mind if we got a little water. Okay. But you'll have to drop them gun belts first, one at a time. Sorry. You heard me. You can't shoot both of us, mister. Who is it, Harp? One of them's called Dillon. Dillon? From Dodge? You from Dodge? Yeah. That's what he says. Well, 
Bring him in here. He'll help us. He's a U.S. Marshal. A Marshal? That's right, Harp. And instead of us standing here about to shoot each other, why don't you tell me why you need help? I'm Joe Harp, Marshal. Okay, Harp. Who's your friend? Harry Spiner. I never heard of him either. What's the matter? Has he been shot or something? I busted his leg. Oh. Well, there's a doctor in Dodge. I can't get him there alone. I will help you, if you'll put that rifle down. Well, okay. I found him lying out there on the prairie this morning. Horse throwed him when I drug him into the shade here. Uh, you mean you're not traveling with him? No, I just stopped to help. Are you really Marshal Dillon? I am, but uh, I don't remember you. I ain't never been to Dodge. I heard your name, though. You live around here, Spina? No, I've been working in a saloon down in Tascosa. Wanted to change, so I bought me a horse and rode north. But I shouldn't have come alone. I don't know nothing about horses. I hate them. Well, we better get you into Dodge. I suppose you aim to drag me to Dodge. Well, I've been drug as far as I'm going to be. Well, I had to get you out of the sun, Spinner. You was mighty rough about it. Well, he saved your life, mister. Why shouldn't he save my life? Well, of all the ungrateful, mean temper. He's people been like ever... that all day, but I figure it's because his leg hurts him. Of course it hurts. I busted mine once. I know what it feels like. Poor fella. You want to help get him into Dodge Harper? or you want to keep going? No. No, Marshal. I'd kind of like to see Dodge anyway. Okay, then let's get busy. <laughs> Luckily, Spiner had broken only one bone in his leg, and after we rigged up a splint for it, we managed to get him mounted. It was night before we reached Dodge, but... By the time he got there, he was too weak to complain. Anyway, I was more interested in Joe Harp. But all I could find out was that he was a cowboy, drifting aimlessly through the country like so many of his kind. He said he had a little money from his last job, and that's why he'd been so wary of strangers. And he seemed honest enough. As six weeks later, he was still in Dodge, gambling some, and making friends with most everybody in town. Doc and I were talking about him one day in the office. Do you know what he did, Matt, about three or four weeks ago? What, Doc? Why, he came and offered to pay Spiner's bill. He said the poor fellow wouldn't be able to work for some time. As long as he'd saved him, he felt he ought to help take care of him. Well, did you take his money? I did not. Spiner can pay me himself. And he'd better get to work soon, too, because he's already walking around without a cane. I, uh, take it you don't like Spiner much, Doc. Oh, right. Do you? Well, uh, nobody does that I know of. I don't believe he's even thanked Joe Hart for saving his life, man. Oh, there, mister. Santa Fe just come in with the mail, Mr. Dillon. Oh. Hello, Doc. Mm. Hello, Chester. Oh, see, that brown envelope looks official. It is. You want to open it now, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I better. It might have my paycheck in it. <laughs> Here you are. Thanks. Uh, no check. Just some new wanted circulars. What? What is it? Here, have a look, Chester. Oh, my goodness. Look at that, Doc. Huh? Let me see this. Let me see. Uh, wanted, dead or alive, reward $500 for bank robbery and murder while escaping. Joseph Harp. Joseph Harp? Age 32, Sandy here. Six feet tall, blue eyes. That's him, all right. Signed by the sheriff, city of Denver, Colorado Territory. You gonna arrest him, Matt? Uh, can't you... Pretend you didn't get it or something, Mr. Dillon? You can stay here if you like, Chester. Oh, no, sir. I didn't mean that. All right, then. You take the Alifraganza, the Longhorn, and the Oasis. I'll look in this boarding house at the edge of town, then I'll come back to the Texas Trail. Meet me there if you see him first. Yes, sir. All right, get moving. <laughs> Thank you. 
Kitty. You look like you've been eating cockleburrs, Matt. Uh, I don't see Joe Harp around anywhere, Kitty. He left. Why? Has Chester got here yet? No. Is it trouble of some kind, Matt? I'm after Harp, Kitty. How long ago did he leave? Um, just a little while ago. He was over there gambling, as usual, and then that Spinner came running in and said something to him, and they both left. Spinner? Somebody ought to take him out and bury him somewhere. Well, I couldn't find him nowhere, Mr. Dillon. Hello, Miss Kitty. Chester, what's this all about, anyway? Harp's wanted for murder. For murder? Joe Harp? That's just what Spinner said when I told him. He just couldn't believe it. You told Spinner, Chester? Why, yes, sir. I ran into him, and I... I... Go get our horses, Chester. I'll pick up the rifles and hurry. They've had time to get out of town already. Mr. Dillon? What? My, I guess I just wasn't thinking when I told Spinner about Joe Harp. I didn't know he was going to run off and warn him. Next time I'll send you out with a potato rammed in your mouth. Yes, sir. Oh, I feel so bad. I wish you would. Oh, forget it, Chester. At least it shows Spinner isn't as bad as we all thought. I guess he was just waiting for a chance to do Harp a real good turn. Well, he sure did it. Hold it up a minute. Hmm? Oh, oh. Look. Hello! Why, it's Spinner, Mr. Dillon. He's got his hands up. Yeah. Come on. Get your rifle out, Chester, and keep your eyes open. Yes, sir. Don't shoot, Marshal. I ain't done nothing. Where's Harp? He's in that drawer behind me. Any tricks and you'll die, Spinner. I ain't no outlaw. And Harp ain't gonna pull no tricks neither. You just follow me, Marshal. I swear I don't understand this at all, Mr. Dillon. Just follow him, Chester. Yes, sir. There's his horse. Yeah. And there he is. Well, he's been hurt. He sure has. Oh. oh. Well, there's your man, Marshal. Did you do this, Spinner? I tried to talk him into giving himself up, but he wouldn't listen. And then he, he tried to draw on me. Spinner, I can tell from here the way he's lying that you shot him in the back. What difference it make? He's an outlaw, ain't he? Yeah. Five hundred dollars worth of outlaw, Spinner. If you live to collect it. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the Red Cross campaign for this year is nearing an end. Have you answered the call? Remember, this year, the Red Cross needs you as well as your contribution. Go to your local Red Cross chapter, and while you're there, join and serve. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. buried Joe Harp on the prairie where he'd been killed and then rode back to Dodge. That night I wrote out a wire to the sheriff in Denver claiming the reward for Harry Spiner. Then I showed it to Spiner and told him to keep it quiet and also to stay out of my sight. And he did. 
And about a week later, I had to send Chester to find him and bring him into the office. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Come over here, Spina. I've been waiting like you said, Marshal. I ain't talked to nobody. I had a wire from Denver this afternoon, Spinner. Everything's all right. The money will be here in another week or so. Oh. I thought it'd come now. There it is. But I, I thought you said it wasn't here yet. I'm paying you out of government funds. Oh. Well, that's fine. Yeah, I didn't think you'd mind very much how you got the money. Now, Marshal, I only done my... Count duty. it, Spinner. Oh, that's all right. I, I'm sure it's all here, Marshal. Count it, I said. Yes, sir. One, two, three, four, five. You're satisfied? Five hundred, that's right. Spinner, nobody knows about this yet. They think I killed Joe Harp. But before they learn who did and how it was done... I advise you to clear out of Dodge and stay out. Why? I didn't do nothing Tell wrong. me something, Spinner. Is Harp the first man you've killed? Of course he is. Well, there are men around here who've killed ten or a dozen and think nothing of it. But I won't guarantee how they're going to take to your having killed one man. They can't do nothing about it. It was plum legal. Yeah. Yeah, it was legal. I earn this money, and before I leave Dodge, I'm going to double it gambling. And there ain't nobody going to stop me. Okay, Spinner. I warned you. I'm going to get rich, Marshal. I'll show them. Real rich. Get out of here. I'm going. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Kitty. Drink? No, no, no thanks. Spina was in. Oh, is that so? He left, though. They closed the game on him when he started bragging about how he got his money. I kind of figured they might. Why'd you keep it such a secret, Matt? What were you protecting him for, that milk-livered little sneak? Now, the law doesn't separate people that way, Kitty. But now that he's been paid and he's been warned about what might happen, he's on his own. Well, I hope somebody does shoot him. Just think, Matt. It was Joe Harp who saved his life. I'd have caught Harp anyway, Kitty. I know. Somehow that's different. Yeah. That's a lot different. You know, Kitty, that's a pretty dress you're wearing. Close your eyes, Matt. What? Close them. Go on. Okay. What's this for? Now, tell me what color this dress is. Uh, well, it is... Uh, uh, it's blue, man. Blue, sure. I was just about to say that it is. I know. Speaking of colors, look what's coming. What? Oh, it's Spinner. Well, nobody shot him yet. Never too late. Marshal Dillon? Yeah. Marshal, I just tried to buy a drink over at the Alapragans. And they wouldn't serve you good. I'm not talking to you. Marshal, two men threatened to kill me right there at the bar. Now, that's funny. What do you mean? Well, most men around here don't waste much time on threats. Marshal, I demand protection. And I won't spend the night hiding in jail either. Okay. Then you'll come with me? No. What? I can't protect you any more than I have already, Spina. But I'll tell you one thing. If you take off your gun, nobody can claim self-defense for shooting you, and I'll have to go after him. If that's any satisfaction for you. Marshal, I'm a citizen, and I demand... Get out of town, Spina. Get out now. <laughs> Yeah. Could you lend me a dollar? I went broke last night. A uh, gambler, huh? Yes, sir. All right. Here you are, Chester. 
Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. You told me you swore off gambling a week ago. You even took an oath. I did. I sure did. Well, then how come you went broke gambling last night? Uh, no, sir. I said I went broke, and you said gambling? And I said, yes, sir, but I didn't say I was gambling. Chester, keep the dollar, just go spend it somewhere. Uh, yes, sir, but you don't understand. You see, I've got it all figured out. I swore off gambling, all right, so what I do now is to hire a fella, and I give him the money, then he goes and sits in a game for me, you see. Oh, uh, hello, Clay. Marshal, my horse come back. Huh? What horse? The one Spiner bought off me when he left town. Well, Spiner's been gone five days, Clay. Well, I know. But my horse come back, Marshal, alone. Saddled? Yes, sir. But it ain't my saddle. It's Spiner's. That means somebody must have caught up with him, Mr. Dillon. All right, we'll start looking for him. I can tell you where to look, Marshal. What? That horse has got red mud all over his legs. And there's only one place I know where he'd get into red mud around here. Well, that water and hole, Grande Springs, huh? That's right, Marshal. Say, do I get to keep the horse now? I don't know, Clay. I'll tell you when I get back. <laughs> You know, I just had a thought, Mr. Dillon. What, Chester? Well, Granby Springs is only 30 miles. Spina must have made it easy the first morning he left. I well, saw. So. so, if he was killed there, how come nobody ain't found him and reported it yet? I don't know, Chester. That there it is, right over there. We'll soon find out. Yes, sir. That's him, Mr. Dillon. He sure looks dead. Yeah. I don't see no bullet hole. No. Hey, he's still breathing, Chester. Uh, go fill up your hat and throw some water on him, huh? Yes, sir. Spinner. Hey, Spinner. Spinner. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, pour a little on his head, Chester. Maybe that'll do it. That enough? Mar Marshal. Marshal. Yeah, yeah. What happened, Spinner? Well, what's the matter? What happened? Horse kicked me. Kicked me in the belly. Busted me up inside. I hate horses. Oh, when did this happen? First day. I got off to get me a drink here. I hung on to the, to the reins till yesterday. But I was too weak. Mr. Dillon. What? These fresh tracks all around here. Not just them made by that horse of his, neither. Sure, the fresh tracks. What? Three or four men been by here. Three or four men? They, they just sat and looked at me, Marshal. They didn't say no nothing. Just sat and looked at me, and, and they rode off. Every one of them. They seen who it was, Mr. Dillon. That's what. Yeah. It's too late now, Marshal. I'm gonna, gonna die. Now, we'll try to get you back, Speeder. Uh, uh, no. It's too... dead, Chester. Yes, sir. He wasn't as lucky as when he busted his leg, was he? But you'd think one of them riders might have helped him. 
You know, except for us, I... I guess there isn't a man in the country who'd have helped him this time, Chester. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, James Nusser, and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Later tonight, hear Herb Schreiner on Two for the Money. Remember, one for the fun, two for the quiz. Hear Two for the Money on most of these same stations later tonight. George Walsh speaking. Stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. For mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. you call this keeping the peace? Sitting around in the sun like a farmer on Sunday? <laughs> Hello, Doc. Oh, I wish I was a U.S. Marshal. Get paid whether you're working or not. What's the matter, Doc? Lose a couple of patients last night? Uh, I'm thinking of moving to San Francisco, Matt. What for? You got a monopoly here in Dodge. San Francisco's full of doctors. Yes, and they're probably all rich, too. No, no, I'm serious, Matt. Oh, forget it, Doc. You're some 20 years too late for the gold rush. And anyway, we need you here. Dodge can find another doctor. I'm tired of working day and night and getting paid with promises. Well, you need some money, I'll call a town meeting and shake it out of these people, Doc. But if you try to go to San Francisco, I'll throw you in jail and you can practice from there. Oh, well, good. Then you'll have to feed me, too. <laughs> <laughs> gladly, Doc, gladly. If you can stand Chester's cooking. Yeah, oh, 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 I take it all back, man. The last time I ate one of Chester's meals, I was groggy for three days. <laughs> oh, oh, Chester. Uh, hello, Doc. Mr. Dillon. Doc wants to know where you learned to cook, Chester. Why, well, my Uncle Arthur taught me, Doc. I batched with him for a time when I was a boy. Poor old fella. He died soon after that. I bet he did. Mm. That stage is kind of late today, ain't it? Well, the way Hank's driving it, it shouldn't be, but I haven't got time to loaf around greeting stagecoaches. I'll see you men later. Oh, say so long, Doc. He's emotional at us, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, there's something wrong, Chester. Wait there, Marshal. I'll get right down. 
We run into a fight, Marshal. Anybody hurt, Hank? I killed a man I had riding shotgun. Huh? He fell off and I had to leave him there. Well, I'll send somebody out for him. Where did it happen? Right where the trail crosses the South Fork of the Pawnee. There were three of them bandits, Marshal. But by heaven, we put slugs into two of them. You mean you killed two of them? No, they rode off, but I could see two of them was all hunkered up over their saddles like they was hurting pretty bad. Did you recognize any of them? Well, I'd hate to be wrong and get a man into trouble, Marshal, but I'd swear one of them was that young Howard Brandt. You know the fellow that moved out here with his wife a while back? Yeah, I met him. They got a place up near Turkey Creek, Mr. Dillon, but I ain't never seen it. Now, let's ride up and see how they're making out, Chester. All right, sir. I'll go get our horses. I met Howard Brandt when he first come out here, Mr. Dillon. He sure didn't seem like no bandit to me, real gentle, easy-going fella. That's like a horse that won't buck when you first get on him, Chester. He's waiting to come loose when you least expect it. Yes, sir. Hey, there's Miss Brandt now. She must have seen us coming. Yeah. Hello, Miss Brandt. Howard ain't here. It's uh, important, ma'am. We'll just wait on the porch here. We won't bother you. It's no use, Marshal. Howard won't be back till tomorrow. Look down there, Chester, on the steps. What? Hey, that's blood, Mr. Dillon. Miss Brandt. That's chicken blood. I just killed one. I'm sorry, Miss Brandt, but I'm going to have to talk to Howard. Is he bad hurt? He's dying, Marshal. Leave him alone. You want to show me where he is? Marshal, leave him die in peace. He ain't got long. You'll kill him asking him questions. I don't figure he'll live through the night as it is. Howard and his friends held up the stage, Miss Brant, and they killed a man. Wait, Marshal. Huh? I'll tell you. All right. Jed Butler planned it all. I never heard of no Jed Butler, Mr. Dillon. Does this Butler live around here, Miss Brant? Howard knew him in Oklahoma Territory, Marshal. He and a man named Blake come by here one night a few weeks back. They didn't come into the house, so I can't tell you what they look like. But they talked Howard into holding up the stage, is that it? I didn't know nothing about it, Marshal, till today. I was inside redding up the house, and I heard a shout. And I come out, and I found Howard laying in the dirt. They just dumped him there and rode off. You think they forced Howard to go along? No. He probably wanted to go. He disappointed me, Marshal. I thought Howard was an honest man. Maybe it's as well he's dying. I'm going into him now, Marshal. You, uh, want me to send Doc out? No. It wouldn't do no good. Well, if there's anything I can do for you, Miss Brent, you let me know. Thanks, Marshal. But I reckon it's too late now. Chester, hmm? take this down to Mr. Hightower and have him print up some wanted notices from it, huh? Yes, sir. I guess that's about all I can do about Jed Butler and his friend right now. Oh, somebody will spot him and come tell you sooner or later. And I hope so. It's already been two days. Matt. Hello, Chester. Oh, hello, Miss Kitty. Oh, what's the trouble, Kitty? I just went up to Doc's office to get some stuff for my throat. He isn't there. Well, should he be? Was he expecting you? He wasn't there this morning either. When did you see him last, Matt? I come to think of it, not since the day of the stage holdup. Why? I was with him that night, Matt. He came into the Texas Trail real late. Yeah? We were sitting there talking, and some kid brought him a message. Doc didn't say it was from, but he left. And as far as I can find out, nobody's seen him since. Hey, by golly, Mr. Dillon, she's right. I ain't seen Doc neither. That was two days ago, Matt. Well, sometimes Doc's out on a call longer than that. Are you trying to fool yourself, Matt? 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess I am. I heard about two of those bandits being shot. Well, it sure couldn't have been Miss Brandt who come for Doc. No. You mean one of those men was Howard Brandt? Well, they left him at his house key. I didn't see him, but I believe Miss Brandt. And, well, he probably died last night. I feel sorrier for her than him. I guess I do too, Kitty. But what about Doc, Matt? What are you going to do? Well, Kitty, if I knew where those men are, I'd have gone after them before now. They're holding him. They might even kill him. Look, Kitty, I can't go out and ride around on the prairie hoping to bump into him somewhere. If anything happens to Doc, I'll go after those men myself, Matt. Well, maybe they'll just turn him loose when he's through doctoring the men. I wish I could believe that. Yeah. Yeah, so do I. waited the rest of that day and through the night, but nothing happened. The next morning, however, I was walking down to the office when I saw Ms. Brandt drive by in a wagon. I waved, but she went on past me without a sign. And as she did, I noticed a figure lying in the back of the wagon wrapped in a blanket. As I watched her drive down the street and on out of town, I realized she must be headed for Boot Hill. I got Chester, and we followed her out to the burying ground. She had stopped and was taking a shovel out of the wagon when we walked up to her. I don't need no help, Marshal. The ground's hard, Miss Brandt. We'll dig a hole for you. Leave me be. He's my man, and I'll bury him myself. Right where he deserves. Among the rest of these murderers and outlaws. What are you looking at, Marshal? Your face? What happened to you? Shows, does it? Yeah. Jed Butler did that, Marshal. He came by yesterday. Knocked me around some. He did? What for? Where is he? I was going to come tell you. Once I got Howard buried. Well, tell me now. He's got Doc with him. At least I think he has. Doc was there all tied up sitting on a horse. He didn't say nothing. Butler said he'd shoot him if he did. Why'd he beat you? What'd he want? He wanted to know if you'd been around. If we'd told you anything. Howard was still alive, Marshal. I don't know how he lived so long. But he died after Butler got to shaking him and slapping him. What did you tell him? Nothing. That's why he beat me. Well, at least we know for sure he's got Doc with him, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, but we're no closer to finding him. You sure you won't let us help bury Howard, ma'am? I kind of wish you would now, Marshal. I'm just about wore out. I just can't stand this waiting around doing nothing much longer. Couldn't you organize a posse or something? Butler would get scared if he got wind of a posse, Chester. You mean he'd shoot Doc and try to get away? Yeah, he might. It's a safer bet just to wait it up. Well, Tobiel, but come on in. How are you, Tobiel? Tobiel, always good, Chester. Uh, where you been the last month, anyway? Out scalping white men? Tobiel no scalp white men long time. Maybe too long. Well, for a tame Indian, you sure got a wild look in your eye. What you doing here? Tobiel hunt antelope on prairie. Huh? Way off, see two white men. One ride very funny. Tobiel go very close. They no see, but Tobiel see. What did you see, Tobiel? White medicine man. A doc? Uh, good man. Take bullet out of Tobiel long time ago. No like him all tied in rope. Come quick, tell Marshal. Do you know where they are? Can you track them? White man easy to track, like buffalo herd. Always big fool. When was this, Tobiel? Yesterday. Long ride from here. All right. Chester, go get our horses and find a fresh one for Tobiel. Maybe. Maybe we won't be too late. We will 
we'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, a man just out of prison emerges to freedom packed with panic. Monday night on CBS Radio, Suspense stars Broderick Crawford in Parole to Panic, a spine-tingling production well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's entirely possible under certain circumstances that prison might be preferable to freedom. Hear Suspense Monday night on most of these stations, and you'll agree fully with that premise. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. It was 60 miles to where Tobiel had seen Doc and Jed Butler, but we rode hard and covered it in a very few hours. From there on, however, with Tobiel tracking, we had to slow down. And it was growing dusk when the trail finally led to the edge of a small bluff and then turned and dropped down around the side of it. We dismounted and followed it the rest of the way on foot to where we could see a small cabin hidden in a clump of box elder at the base of the cliff. And there we waited for the dark. When it came, we sneaked up to the cabin and stood close to the wall, listening. How's he now, Doc? I've told you before, Butler, the man's dying. Listen, you, he's the only man I ever called friend. He'd better not die. I'm a doctor, Butler. I'd do anything in my power to save a life, even that of a murderer. You go on talking like that, I'll blow you open with this shotgun, Doc. Shotgun, shotgun. Why don't you carry a pistol, like ordinary men? Or are you too much of a coward? Doc, you're either a fool or you're a plum crazy. Oh, why? Because I'm not afraid to die? Well, you're going to die, just as soon as he does. I ain't going to leave you around to spread no tales. I'm going to kill you and get out of here. And it won't be very long, Butler. Blake will go most any minute. Maybe I ought to shoot you now. Just leave him here. Well, I thought you said that uh, he was your friend. He is. But I'm getting a spooky feeling. Chester, Toby, let's get talk back. out of you, Doc, and I won't wait. You didn't the kill him, Mr. Dillon. Do something. You better bust in there before it's too late. No, no. He killed Doc, sure we do that. Yeah, Tobiel's right, Chester. But we got to do something. Doc said himself that wounded man's going to die any minute. Well, I'm thinking, Chester. If plenty time, we'd wait and shoot when come out in morning. Yeah, but we got no time. There might be a chink somewhere in that cabin that I could poke a gun through. Man say him very spooky now. One little noise, shoot Doc fast. Yeah, I know. But I wouldn't dare take the chance. Tobiel know many trick, all kind. But here... Nothing. If Butler used a pistol, Doc might have a bare chance with that cussed shotgun. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, Mr. Dillon? That shotgun. It's not a six-shooter, and it's not a repeating rifle. What do you mean? He can shoot it once, and then he's got to reload. Well, once is all it takes. To kill one man, it is, Chester. <laughs> what are you doing, Mr. Dillon? Here. Take my gun belt, Chester. What? Here, take it. <laughs> yes, sir, but what for? I'm going in there. Unarmed. What? Now, when I get inside, you and Tobiel will sneak up close. And you'll be ready to come through that door when you hear his shotgun go off. Mr. Dillon, you can't do that. Yes, I can. He'll kill you, sure. Maybe. But if you two don't get in there fast, if he does shoot, he'll club Doc to death. But Mr. Dillon... All right, now, quiet. Who's that? Get over by the door, Doc. Oh, don't. Don't open it yet. Doc Adams is standing by that door. I got a shotgun aimed at his back. Now, who is it? I'm unarmed. Open the door. I'll come in with my hands in front of me. All right. Open it, Doc. Any tricks? I'll shoot Doc. Go ahead, Doc. Hello, Doc. Uh, Matt? Uh, he's unarmed, Butler. 
And get in here and close that door. Who are you? Matt Dillon. Dillon? Marshal? That's right. You got some men outside, huh? Well, it won't do no good, Marshal. I'll shoot you before they can get anywhere near me. I got two men out there, Butler. And the second they hear a shot, they'll be in here. That'll be too late, or Marshal. Well, it depends on how you look at it, Butler. Won't be too late to take you. That shotgun only shoots once. <laughs> take me? You'll be dead. Yeah. Uh, Matt. Matt, you shouldn't have done this. Why not, Doc? Well, it's bad enough. Me getting killed. He can only kill one of us, Doc. If he shoots me, Tobiel and Chester will get him. And if he shoots you, I'll kill him with my bare hands. You got it all figured. Ain't you, Marshal? Yeah? Well, I'd rather kill a U.S. Marshal than a doctor any day. You know that? Matt. Matt, he's right. You you should have stayed outside. And stand there waiting for him to shoot you? No, I... I wouldn't like that much, Doc. Well, maybe... Maybe you'll shoot me anyway. Maybe. But at least there's some kind of a chance now. Shut up. A minute, you two. Shut up. I don't quite figure this. No? No. You mean uh, you come in here knowing I'll probably kill you rather than Doc? Is that right? Yes, Butler, that's right. Yes, that, that's what he did. Why? For no reason, Butler. No no reason at all, except we're, we're friends, I guess. Just something like that. What's being friends got to do with it? You wouldn't understand, Butler. You, you no good, filthy, rotten scum. He, he's willing to die for you, ain't he? I never heard of nothing like that. And him, Marshal, and everything. Willing to die? That's your friend, Butler. I'd better take a look at him. He's dead now. Well, make up your mind, Butler. I just don't understand a man like that. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. What's that? You ain't saying that. That come from something. Scripture, huh? Is that what it is? Blake's the only friend I ever had. Oh, and a while ago you were willing to leave him here to die. Alone. You don't know anything about friendship, Butler. No, I guess I don't. Anyways, if I was in a spot like you, there ain't nobody, nobody in the world would have walked in here to do for me what the marshal's willing to do for you. Oh, and I feel sorry for you, Butler. Real sorry. If it'll still give you pleasure to shoot, well, go ahead. No. I just get killed anyway. All right, give me the gun, Butler. Sure. I n never knowed people like you in the dock before, Marshal. You sure you ain't crazy or something? Maybe. 
Maybe we are, little butler. Who knows? Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Joyce McCluskey, John Daner, Frank Gerstel, and Ralph Moody. Harley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. Tomorrow afternoon, for its 11th feature report to America, the CBS Radio Department of Public Affairs tells the story of the wetbacks, the thousands of illegal immigrants who cross our southern border through America's big back door to look for work and wages. Here, wetbacks, Sunday afternoon on most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. John Lund, as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings you Colorful Mystery Tuesday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon, would you mind stopping at the Alifaganza here for a minute? Pretty early in the day, isn't it, Chester? Oh, I don't want a drink. Oh? No, the bar keeps holding some money for me. I won a little last night, and I didn't want to put it back in the game. Ah, but you want to get it now so you can put it back tonight, is that it? Yes, sir, I'm afraid it is. <laughs> okay. Mike? You come for your money, Chester? Yep. Hello there, Marshal Dillon. How are you, Mike? Well, here you are, Chester. Three, four, five, six. Thanks, Mike. Uh, here. Buy yourself a drink. Yeah, I sure will. See you tonight, Chester. Sure. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. I heard the bartender call you Marshal Dillon. Well, that's right. I got something to tell you, Marshal. Go ahead. It's important. Well, okay. You're going to die, Marshal. Who are you, mister? Wilbur Hawkins. I'm a whiskey drummer. First time I've been to Dodge, though. I worked around St. Louis till they sent me out here... Liked it better in St. Louis. There are lots of important people there. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? You're going to die, Marshal. I heard them saying so. You heard who saying so? Well, I don't know their name. It was dark, and they weren't there long. I didn't dare say anything, or they'd have known I was listening. And then, of course, I'd never heard of you till just now, that is. Uh, I... You're not making much sense, mister. Oh, it makes sense, all right. You see, I rode the Santa Fe out here from St. Louis... 
And one night, I was all wrapped up trying to sleep. And these two men came by and stood there in the aisle. One gave the other three hundred dollars. He said it was to kill Marshal Dillon. But he didn't say where. So, of course, I didn't know till just now. Is that all you know about it, Mr. Hawkins? Yeah, that's all, Marshal. Hmm. I've done my duty now. I'll be going. Goodbye. Well, what do you make of that, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. He acts a crazy like I don't know whether to believe him or not. No. But I suppose we'll find out soon enough. sound asleep already, and it's only just got dark out, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's got nothing else to do till Tom Smith gets here. Is that who you're holding him for? Well, I thought I told you, Chester. Yeah, but Tom Smith's sheriff at Tascosa, ain't he? Sure. Why? I thought this fellow was wanted in Abilene. No, they never heard of him in Abilene. That's why I wired Tom. Well, I'm going out back for a minute, Chester. I think I left my new bridle on the hitching rail out there. Yes, sir. Well, I better get this place swept up a little, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> That's a good idea. There, Chester. Stay there. Hey, Mr. Dillon, you, you've been shot. Well, I was trying to play possum, Chester. I wanted to get him to come up where I could see him. Oh. But he's gone now. You scared him away. He ran down the alley there. Oh, he'll be lost in the crowd, but now... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it doesn't matter, Chester. What? He probably thinks I'm dead. So I'll just go on playing possum. How do you mean? Come on, let's go up to Doc's office. I'll tell you there. What would you say that whiskey drummer's name is, man? Wilbur Hawkins, Doc, but you never heard of him. This is his first time in Dodge. Well, you think he'd have sense enough to have followed those two men to find out who they were? Yeah, he was probably scared to death, Doc. Yeah, and anyway, he kind of acts like he got hit by lightning somewhere. Even when he's standing still, he gives you the feeling that he's sort of walking sideways like a crab, if you know what I mean. No, I don't, but uh, I'd sure think twice before asking you to explain, Chester. Well, what is it you have in mind to do now, Matt? Nothing, Doc. Nothing? No, Chester's going to do the work for a while. I'm just going to sit up here in your office and wait. Wait? Wait for what? Well, when Chester spreads the word around that I'm dead, whoever wants me that way is going to make his play. He'll come right out into the open and do whatever he's got planned. And then I'm going to give him a little surprise. Oh, Mr. Dillon, that's a wonderful idea. Now, now why didn't I think of that? You better get going, Chester. I'm kind of anxious to meet this man. Him and his gunman. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but only one thing. Ain't the boys likely to run a little wild when they hear you're not around to keep the lid on things? Yeah, they might. But we'll have to take the chance. Okay, sir. I'll get started. Well, I kind of think Chester's right, Matt. There's a lot of men in Dodge who are just waiting for an excuse like this. If it gets too bad, I'll just have to come to life again. <laughs> Tell me something, Doc. What are you going to do to... Uh... Entertain me while I'm waiting up here, huh? Say, I never thought about that. I... Oh, I suppose I gotta feed you, too. <laughs> You'd be a mighty poor host if you didn't. Well, how long do you figure on staying here, anyway? I don't know, Doc, but I don't think it'll be very long. Well, do you uh, want to play a little cribbage, or uh, would you rather fix supper first? <laughs> You're the first dead man I ever saw with an appetite. Well, I'll go get the cribbage board, but I'm making no promises about supper. Doc, what time's it getting to be? Um, let me see. It's nearly midnight, man. Yeah. 
How long are you going to wait here? Well, until something happens, I guess. Now, Chester will let me know. Town seems quiet enough so far. Maybe nothing's going to happen. They didn't try to kill me just for the fun of it, Doc. No, no, I guess not, man. All right, answer it, Doc. After I get to the back room. It's, uh, maybe it's a patient. I'll be holding a gun on him anyway. I'm, co I'm coming, I'm coming. Kitty, what are you doing here this time of night? I might tell you if you ask me in, Doc. Well, of course, come in, come in. Where's the corpse, Doc? What's that? The body. I expected to find him all laid out. Oh, you mean Matt. You, uh, don't seem too upset about the corpse, Kitty. Oh, all that talk didn't fool me. <laughs> Just didn't make sense, Chester, running around telling everybody you've been killed. No, why not? I know Chester too well. If you were dead, he wouldn't be acting like that. <laughs> no, I guess he wouldn't. Where is he, anyway? I haven't seen him for a couple of hours, but most everybody else believes it, Matt. Now they do, huh? Mm-hmm. Good. I don't know what you're up to, but I figure someone's been trying to kill you. Is that right? Yeah. Ambush, Kitty. That's not the way he's telling it, Matt. Not the way who's telling it. I never saw him before, but there's a man standing at the bar of the Texas Trail bragging about outdrawing you. You mean he's admitting he killed me? I kind of thought you'd like to know. That's him, Matt. This is what you've been waiting for. Is there anybody with him, Kitty? No. He's alone, as far as I know. Anyway, you better come to life again, Matt. There's going to be trouble if you don't. There hasn't been any trouble yet, has there? No. But they're working themselves up to it. Yeah. Well, maybe I'd better not wait any longer. But I'd like to take that gunman's employer along with me, though. You can find out who it is, Matt. Beat it out of him. You better come with me, Kitty, so you can point this man out. Yeah. And you take cover in case he wants to fight. Any man who's coward enough to shoot you in the dark isn't going to face you now, Matt. Yeah, maybe not, Doc, but uh, you never know. There he is, Matt. Tall fellow in the black hat. He's kind of drunk. Okay, Kitty. I was just waiting. You wait outside while I see how he's going to behave. Okay, Matt. Good luck. Thanks. I'm Marshal Dillon, Mister. Oh. Who are you? I'm Tom Rogers. I thought you was dead, Marshal. I changed my mind. What do you want? You've been bragging about shooting me. Just talk, Marshal. I didn't mean nothing by it. I was just talking. Mm-hmm. Kind of dangerous talk, don't you think? Everybody said you was dead. Well, I was waiting for you to come out of your hole, Rogers. You know, I don't like getting ambushed. Marshal, I never even seen you before. I didn't ambush you. All right, turn and face the bar while I take your gun. Go on. I ain't going to try nothing. You got the wrong man, Marshal. Okay, you can turn around. You can't arrest a man just for talking. The jail's right across the street, Rogers. You lead the way. Well, it was just talk, I tell you. You can't prove nothing. Get going. I swear I didn't try to kill you, Marshal. Straight ahead, Rogers. When we get there, you're going to do some more talking. I want to know who hired you. Nobody hired me. I ain't even got a job. Hey, Mr. Dillon, I want to... Mr. Dillon, what are you doing out here? Who's this fella? His name's Rogers, Chester. He's been bragging about shooting me. I was just having a little fun. I ain't no gunman. It doesn't take much of a gunman to try to ambush a man. But I didn't do it, Marshal. I heard him talking about it, and I don't know why I started saying I'd uh, done Mr. it. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what, Chester? Mr. Dillon, I was on my way up to docks. I, I was coming to tell you something. Well? I, I've been over to Alaforganza. I declare I, I just don't understand it. 
Well, say it, Chester. Yes, sir. Well, there's a fellow over there, and he's been bragging about shooting you, too. What? Yes, sir, that's right. He's saying he outdrawed you and killed you. Of course, he's a little drunk. Yeah. Yeah, of course he is. Though it was Rogers here till I scared him sober. Sure. Sure, I've been drinking, Marshal. I wouldn't have talked like that if I'd been plumb sober. Here. Here's your gun, Rogers. You turning me loose? It's like you say, Rogers. You're just a big talker. What about the fellow over at the Alifaganza? I don't even want to see him, Chester. He'll shut up fast enough when he hears I'm still around. And you go on back to the bar, Rogers. Unless the men laugh you out of town. Yes, sir. I'm sure sorry I done it, Marshal. All right, get going. Sure, I'm going. I don't know what's the matter with me, Chester, not figuring this. I might have known there'd be at least a couple of drunks wanting the reputation for having killed me. Yes, sir. Doggone it. Now we're right back where we started from. Yeah. Hey, maybe that whiskey drummer was lying, too. No, you're forgetting I got shot at, Chester. And there's a man somewhere in Dodge still waiting to kill me. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... This Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations, hear Ida Lupino and Edmund O'Brien in the stirring screenplay adaptation of The Star on the Lux Radio Theater. It's a hard-hitting drama about a has-been who attempts a comeback in a juvenile role. This will be Lux Radio Theater, drama at its best, Monday night at The Star's address. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Where's a man down, living from day to day, waiting for a bullet in the back, and not knowing who to expect it from, or when? Makes you feel kind of helpless. And before long, in spite of everything you try to do to stop it, you get kind of spooky. And you start shying at the most ordinary noise, especially if it comes from behind you. No way to stay alive. Because this is the one time you need to be as calm and clear as you've ever been in your life. Well, I had a week of it. And nothing happened. Until Chester came into the office one day with a telegram from Sheriff Tom Smith of Tascosa. I thought I'd better get right over here at this, Mr. Dillon. Might be important. You told me it was from Tom Smith, Chester. Yes, sir. It is. Well, if you know that, how come you don't know what the message is? Oh, well, I didn't read it too close, Mr. Dillon. Here. <clears throat> Thanks. He's coming for his prisoner. He'll be here on the stage. Day after tomorrow, the way I figure it. Now, uh, anything else? What? Well, is that all it says here? Yes, sir, that's all. Now, there's just one thing you missed, Chester. What's that? The date it was sent. It got delayed somewhere along the line. Tom's due in today. He is. Yeah, what time is it? About noon, I guess. Well, that stage ought to be here right now. Come on, let's go see. All right, sir. Well, there it is, Mr. Dillon. Must have pulled in just a minute ago. I don't see no passengers, though. Well, that may be because they haven't got out yet, Chester. Oh, here they come. Ain't that Tom Smith? Yeah, that's him. Who's that other fella? He looks kind of familiar. Now, that's Wilbur Hawkins, Chester, that little whiskey drummer. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, now, I've been wondering where he's been. Matt. Matt Dillon. Hello, Tom. Hey, how are you, Matt? Hello, Chester. Hello, Mr. Smith. Well, I'm sure glad that trip's over. Next time, I'll come horseback. Now, the stage is easier when you're taking a prisoner back, though. I guess you're right at that, Matt. And I hope you still got him. I'd hate to make this trip for nothing. <laughs> oh, he's there. Anytime you want him. Hey, where's Wilbur Hawkins going? Ain't he even going to say hello? 
You know that little fellow? Oh, yeah, we know him. He told me he's staying at the Dodge house. Crazy talking us man I ever run into. I told him, Hawkins, if you tried thinking a little first, you might make a whole lot more sense a whole lot faster. Well, he means well, Tom. Well, maybe. But he tells some mighty strange stories. Oh, what do you mean? Well, of course it could be true, but he told me he heard a couple of men in a bar talking about me. He didn't know who they meant till I introduced myself on the stage and he recognized my name. Well, what are you looking like that for, man? Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead, Tom. What did Hawkins hear? Well, he said this one fellow was going to give the other fellow $300 to shoot me. <laughs> Ain't that the darndest thing? Yeah, that sure is. I don't know, Matt. There's a lot of men that like to kill me, but I don't believe they'd be standing around talking about it that way. I kind of think he made it all up. No, he didn't make it up, Tom. Not quite. Huh? You know something about this? You mean someone is out to shoot me? Yeah. Who? I'll tell you about it on the way over to the Dodge house. You wait here, Chester, just in case he gets past us. All right, you. He ain't gonna get past us. What I can't figure, Matt... Why, Hawkins would want to kill you and me. Now, that doesn't make much sense, Tom. Mm. Now, here it is. Who is it? It's Tom Smith and Matt Dillon, Hawkins. What are you doing here? We want to talk to you. Open up, Hawkins. Tom, get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, How did you know he was going to shoot, Matt? And I just sensed it, I guess. Look, I can kick that door open with one foot, and then you cover me. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I kill you! Kill him, Matt. Well, I tried not to. Hawkins. You hit me. No. I'm going to die. I had to shoot, Hawkins. But why did you want to kill us? Smith and me. A lot of people want to. Hear them say. Nobody said nothing. You made all that up, Hawkins. You took a shot at me last week, didn't you, Hawkins? Didn't you? No, Dad. I can't kill anybody now. Why? Why did you want to, Hawkins? Tell me. I killed other men. Important men. I told them about it first. And then, then I killed them. Why, Hawkins? I don't know. I had to. I had to do it. Die. Uh, he's dead, Tom. Matt, what the devil was he talking about? I don't know. But it doesn't matter much. I don't understand it. I never saw him before yesterday. Now, Hawkins was a murderer, Tom. The kind that doesn't need any particular reason. Nobody will ever know why he did what he did. Yeah, he was crazy, if you like. Sure was crazy. You think he's done a lot of killing, Matt? Yeah, probably. That's the most dangerous kind of man there is, Tom. A murderer with... No reason at all. <laughs> Innocent looking little whiskey drummer.
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Edgar Barrier, John Daner, and Vic Perrin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. You've heard fictional crime cases many times, but there's nothing like the real thing. We're talking about Night Watch. This Monday night, following the Bob Trout news, you'll be on the scene when a burglar is caught in the act. You'll hear him break a glass window in trying to get away. You'll hear the officers handcuff him and take him off to jail. You'll hear this authentic case unfold from beginning to end on Night Watch Monday night. George Walsh speaking. John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings you Colorful Mystery Tuesdays on the CBS Radio Network. to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wagons filled with kids. Yeah. Well, how'd you know Lank could bring the kids along? <laughs> well, he always does. Oh. But, uh, John. Hey, look, there's the filter, boy. Pardon. And way down there is Emma Gold. <laughs> is Ain't seen her in town for a spell either. Not in the area. Respectfully, Matt Dillon. You, as Marshal. Does it? Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Will you shut the door? You're letting in all the flies in Kansas. But, Mr. Dillon, I can't... Shut the door, out. Chester. You can go out or stay in, but shut the door. Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Dillon, this town's just busting with people. All here for the races tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. You going out to the flats tomorrow? I don't know, Chester. Mm. You don't sound like you hanker after going too much. Well, I don't. I wish Colonel Benson's officers would forget about horse racing. <laughs> well, I guess they figure their army graze about the best horses in the country. Well, everybody knows the cavalry has good horses. They don't have to prove it every four or five months. Well, Mr. Dillon, I just plain don't understand. Ain't nobody likes a horse race better than you. <sighs> I know, Chester. I like them fine, but that's not... Marshal Dillon? Yeah, that's right. Lieutenant Flagg, sir, Fort Dodge. Oh, well, sit down, Lieutenant. Colonel Benson's compliments, sir. And he requests your presence at the fort tomorrow. For the races. That's right, sir. The colonel feels that a peace officer out there would be, um, well, a steadying influence. I see. And uh, I take it you don't. No, Marshal, I don't. We can police our own activities. I see. After all, we're certainly competent to handle a bunch of sodbusters. Well, the last time there were races out at the fort, three men were shot. Is that how you would handle things, Lieutenant? I wasn't stationed at Fort Dodge then, Marshal. 
But I know this. If people around here want to bet their stock against Army Mouse, they shouldn't complain if they lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long have you been out here, Lieutenant? I was stationed in Virginia until two months ago. Yeah, I thought so. What do you mean? Look, Lieutenant, out here, when men have something to complain about, they sometimes do it with a six-gun. They don't all have the respect for the army that you have. They would if I had the say of it. Oh, maybe, but uh, you don't. It's like with the Indians. A lot of the junior officers feel as I do. We'd go after them, force them into the open. And bring on another Indian war? And we'd beat them. But it would cost more than you'd believe, Lieutenant. <laughs> Not if the three I saw leaving Dodge a while back were any example. An old man on a shaggy gray pony and two young boys. That was a Kiowa, Lieutenant. He's a chief, and those two braves are his sons. His name's Howling Dog. You seem to know a good deal about Indians, Marshal. <coughs> Lieutenant Flagg, you're a young officer. You're ambitious and you're eager, but uh, you talk too much, and you don't even know part of what you're talking about. Now, look here. Tell Colonel Benson I'll be out there tomorrow. Very good, Marshal. And, Lieutenant. Yes? I've known Holland Dog ever since I came to Kansas. He's old, but he isn't stupid. So, uh, don't guess wrong about him. His pa sure must have hated the world, Mr. Dillon. Ah, oh, he's young, Chester. He'll learn. Yes, sir. But you know, sometimes fellas grow up and don't improve a bit. Oh, there you are. Well, hello, Matt. And Chester. How are you, Doc? I, uh, passed a young lieutenant on the way out. Is, uh, Chester enlisting in the Army, man? Oh, Chester oh, in the Army. Oh, my gracious, Doc. <laughs> What's on your mind, Doc? Oh, well, just thought you'd know. I won't be around town tomorrow. I'm taking the day off. Oh, is that so? Yep, I'm going out to the fort for the races. Might even work up some business. Thought you was taking the day off. <laughs> oh, Chester. Uh, <clears throat> say, Matt, that fella Hunter out there, regimental surgeon, you know? Yeah. Well, he thinks he's the only good doctor around these parts. Well, ain't he? He... Uh... Oh, well. Uh... Now, Matt, if you were going to be out there, you might push a little practice my way. The last time, a hunter got six cases out of seven. The only man he let me have was dead. Well, look, Doc, I'll tell you, if Lieutenant Flagg was running things, maybe we could arrange a whole massacre for you. Well, who's Lieutenant Flagg? The lieutenant you seen leaving. Yeah, Colonel Benson sent him in, Doc. <laughs> Seems I've got an official invitation just to make sure the civilian element don't get to shooting each other. Oh, now, Matt, you don't think they'd do that again, do you? No, Doc. If there's any trouble out there this time, it won't be the townspeople that started. It'll be Lieutenant Flagg and his crowd. Oh, that's over. Well, how's that, Matt? Well, he's got no use for anything but army. And he'd just as soon shoot an Indian as see one. Well? Howland Dog's in this part of the country again, Doc. Oh? And I wouldn't be too surprised but what he shows up at the races tomorrow. You'd think this was the first horse race ever run, Matt. Yeah. Seems like the betting's running high. Just talking to the Pilcher boys. They're betting everything they own on a Missouri mare they brought out here. Well, I've seen her, Chester. She's a good mare. Oh, I've never heard so much horse talk in my life as I have tonight. Pasterns, stifles, gaskins, four quarters, hind quarters, short couples, long barrels. <laughs> well, I tell you, Matt, it kind of makes a girl wonder. Well, don't you worry, Kitty. There'll be other nights. Well, there better be. Hey, Matt, look there. Coming in the door. What? Oh, it's that Lieutenant Flagg and some other officers. Yeah... They're down here to fan the fire, I guess. What do you mean? Now, the more they get this crowd worked up, the higher the betting will be. Oh, jinkies, I wish I had some money to bet. I'll just be glad you haven't, Chester. Good evening, Marshal. Lieutenant Flagg? Uh, Miss Russell. How do you do? Miss Russell? Lieutenants Dryden, Lawson, Mal. How, How do you do? do, you do? Uh, well, gentlemen, is anyone drinking? I think we all are. Bartender, set out some glasses. You'll join us, won't you, Miss Russell? Oh, why, thank you, Lieutenant. 
You too, Marshal? Well, I... I think uh... I'll just walk down to the other end of the bar, Mr. Dillon. It's crowded here. Hey, you, uh, fellas from Fort Dodge, ain't you? That's right. You own some of them army grays that are going to run tomorrow? We do. Hey, well, my name's Pilcher, Cy Pilcher. I got some money to bet on my mayor. I'll match her any way you say. Well, I'll take your bet, Mr. Pilcher. Name it. Uh, gentlemen? $500 silver. Run three, four, five hundred yards. That's a lot of money. You mean you ain't got it? I'll go with you, Flag. All right, it's a bet, then. Good. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Out to the fort. Well, gentlemen, <laughs> Easy as taking a... a pig. That fellow wouldn't know a horse from a Missouri mule. Maybe that's what he's got. <laughs> from his looks, he could be running himself. <laughs> you dirty pig. All right, hold it, Pilcher. There ain't no man can name me like that. Hold it, I said. You... Wearing a uniform, calling yourself a soldier. I was fought outside of Atlanta while you were still nursing. Listen, you... All right. Now, that's enough. Now, Pilcher, you get down to the other end of the bar. And as for you, gentlemen, you better start back for the fort. Now, look, Marshal, we don't have to Move. take it. All of you. Come on, Flag. Let's go. Well, at least they paid for the bottle before you ran them off. <laughs> you want a drink? No, Kitty, not for me. Thank you. You, you go ahead. Uh, look, Matt, you can't stop trouble every time before it starts. No, I can't, Kitty. But I wish tomorrow was done with. <laughs> Turn for the second act of gun smoke in just a moment. But first, three burglars lucky at theft prove unlucky at gambling. To make matters worse, authorities catch up with them on their theft rap as well in the case of the cold dice on Gangbusters later tonight. Hear how Lady Luck refused to smile at a gang of free and easy crooks and how justice and the cops closed in on their escapades. Hear Gangbusters presented by CBS Radio later tonight on most of these stations. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Well, afternoon's most gone, Mr. Dillon. There hasn't been any trouble yet. Well, the whiskey isn't gone, though, and there's still a race to come. Flag's been holding it off. Yes, sir. Well, at least here on the finish line, we can see which way the money's going. Matt! Oh, Matt! Oh, hello, Doc. Well, we haven't seen you all afternoon, Doctor. Where you been? Oh, well, just playing pinochle with some of the boys. Things have been dull, but uh, they won't be in a minute. No, why? Flag and Pilcher are down there at the start now. You see them? The big race is due any minute. Yeah. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? You keep your eyes open, and as soon as they cross the finish line, you get to Pilcher, and I'll pick up Flag. All right, sir. Yeah, let's see. Any minute now, any minute they'll be out. Uh, here uh, they come! Get moving, Chester. I'll find Flag. Yes, sir. All right. Pardon me, will you? Will you? Excuse me, please. Yeah. Will you pardon me, please? Walk that horse good, Sergeant. Hello, Lieutenant. You got a fast horse there. Fastest on the post. Yeah. But the Pilcher boys lost about everything they had just now. You preaching at me, Marshal? No, Lieutenant, I've seen horse races before. Yeah, he won easy, Marshal. I guess he did, Lieutenant Mall. And he could have won from any other horse just as easy. Maybe. Well, Flag, you beat my mare. Thought maybe I might have won, but you got a good horse. Real good horse. 
You getting ready to talk me out of my money? You're not much of a man, but you got a good mount, and I'm paying you. Here. $500 silver. Come on, Tom. Let's go home. Well, Marshal, the races are over. The Army won, and no trouble. You sorry? I got no complaints, Lieutenant Flagg. Looks like the colonel was worried about nothing. Thinking there might be some hotheads out here. Matter of fact, I was kind of hoping for some fun along with the running. Maybe you are a steadying influence, Marshal. Now, you look here, young fella. Soldier uh, boy. Chester, no soldier. take it easy. Hey, Flagg. Look over there. Well, if it isn't that old Kyle, a howling dog. <laughs> well, you want some fun? Hey, why not? Flagg. He's going to challenge him to a race, Marshal. He's an old man, Lieutenant. Come on, Mal. We'll go talk to him. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? Uh, we'll go over, too. Flag's feeling mighty big right now and looking for trouble. All right. It looked to me like folks was all leaving a minute ago. Now they seem to be drifting back. Yeah. What do you think old Howland Dog is going to do? I don't know, Chester. This is Lieutenant Mao. I know Army officers. You speak good English for an Indian. I am chief of tribe. Chief? I hear you Kiowa ride good horses. Yeah. Horses help us hunt. And I hear they're fast. Now, you've been sitting here all afternoon. You saw the races. Yeah, I saw. You saw my horse run. You think any of your horses could beat him? Yes. Which one, howling dog? Your son's horses or the one you're riding? Anyone. <laughs> Any one of these three? <laughs> There's one of them could run 400 yards and lift. <laughs> All right. All right, now stop deviling him, Flag. I'm not doing anything, Marshal. He tells me his horses can beat mine. I don't think they can. If you want a race, set one up, but don't fun him. Will you race my horse, Howling Dog? I will race. Which horse? The one I ride. <laughs> hey, Flag, you ever see a sorrier sheep? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you want to bet on the race, Howling Dog? Kiowa got no money. Well, you must have something. If I lose, I give you a horse. I <laughs> wouldn't want it. But I'll take that little beaded sack you're wearing around your neck. Yeah, that Indian medicine. You say you could beat me, so there's nothing to worry about. If I lose, I give army man medicine sack. Good. Well, I'll get Sergeant Crockett to bring my horse over here, will you? I'll be right back. Now, Howling Dog, what distance do we race? You say. All right. We'll race from here down to that wagon with the broken wheel and back again. That's about 500 yards. Marshal, you can mark the start and finish. All right. Now, uh, Howland Dog, do you understand? From here to the wagon and then back again. The first man to pass me coming back wins. Yeah. Here you are, Flag. Had a chance to blow. In good shape. Good. Uh, Lieutenant Mao, would you step over here a minute? I'd like to talk to you. Sure, Marshal. You ready, Chief? I am ready. <laughs> you can ride dressed like that? Yes. Okay, Marshal. Fine with me. <laughs> hey, Flag, that Indian gonna ride in his blanket? He can ride in a tent for all I care. <laughs> uh, army man. Yes? What you give me when I win? When you... <laughs> what do you want? Money? No. What then? Uniform. Yeah. You mean what I'm wearing? Yes. Well... Oh, why not, Flag? What difference does it make? <laughs> he won't win anyway. All right. It's a bet, Chief. Uh, just a minute, Lieutenant. What is it, Felcher? Well, my horse couldn't do it. Maybe the Chief's can. I ain't got any money left, but I'll bet my saddles and wagon and four mules against 500. It's a bet. All right, Chester. 
Yes, sir. Now you hold the money, huh? Yes, sir. And I might just take about $5 on the Indian, too, Lieutenant. It's a bet. Anybody else? I've done all right today. I'll take 100 well, You're a fool, but... Now, it's a bet. As soon as I'm mounted, I'll be ready, Marshal. All right. You ready, Howlin' Dog? Ready. All right, now, to that wagon and back across this line, then. Uh, you there, w- would you ride down and clear those people out of the way, please? All right, move up on the line. Now I'll fire one shot. All right, steady now. I don't know, Chester. Looks like Clyde's ahead. Now he's swinging wide for the wagon. Look in there, that ugly little pony can sure run. Yeah. Well, they're into the turn, Chester. Hey, Mr. Dillon, what happened? Well, the collar dog dropped his blanket. Well, he's naked as a jaybird. <laughs> Come on, you Indian, ride! Come on, Holland dog! Come on! He's doing it, Chester! He's doing it! He's doing it! He's doing it. He's doing it. A sight, a sight. I tell you, oh, there's nothing quite as ineffectual as a man in long johns. You know, I imagine Lieutenant Flagg will have some explaining to do when Colonel Benson sees him. Oh, I wish I'd been there. Oh, my, oh, my. Oh, no place for a lady, Kitty. <laughs> you know, Holland Dog just sat there while Flagg cursed and begged, but then when the lieutenant paid off, he just turned and rode away. <laughs> With most of the lieutenant's uniform draped around his shoulders. <laughs> you know, Mr. Dillon, he sure seemed pretty calm about it all. Well, he was sure enough of his horse, just. <laughs> sure he'd win, you mean? Well, sure, that's right. Well, why, Matt? Army horses are pretty good stock. Well, sure they are, Kenny, but there's always one around somewhere that's better, and Holland Dog has it. <laughs> well, if that horse is so good, Matt, why doesn't Holland Dog uh, clip him up some so he, he don't look like a goat? Doc, let me tell you something. Howland Dog's been winning races with that horse for a long time now. He's been to half the army posts on the frontier. What? He has? Well, <laughs> That's right. Well, why don't people learn not to bet against him then? Well, Chester, because lots of them are like Lieutenant Flagg. they got to make fun of somebody that looks weaker or different than they do. Yeah. Well, now, Matt, you said you knew about this before. Yeah. Did you know old Howling Dog was going to win today out there? <laughs> Well, Doc, I was just sure enough to win a $50 bet from Lieutenant (laughs) Mull. Sam, (laughs) see what the gentleman will have. Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Mr. MacDonald, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Ralph Moody, Paul Savage, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, motion picture star Van Heflin plays Damon Runyon on the Radio Hall of Fame. Novelist Gene Fowler and Lionel Barrymore, both friends of the late Damon Runyon, take part in the dramatized tribute. Remember, over CBS Radio tomorrow night, listen to a tribute to the beloved writer of short stories. It's on the Radio Hall of Fame on most of these stations of the Star's Address. George Walsh speaking. 
coming, going, staying at home, enjoy music and song on a Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Whoever's living in that cabin up ahead, if there's any water around here, Chester. Most likely there ain't. These settlers put up a cabin just anywhere and then start praying for rain. Oh, we could have camped back on Smoky Hill River. No, sir. I'd rather go dry. Just as long as we make Dodge by tomorrow night. <laughs> we'll make it. I never seen such a place as that Fort Wallace, Mr. Dillon. Man could go plumb out of his mind living there. Well, they don't build army posts for pleasure-loving people like you, Chester. I've been in the army. Oh? Uh, like it? Well, sir, we didn't always see eye to eye, me and the army, but at least I didn't get killed. <laughs> well, that helps. Hey, I'll bet you look pretty bold in a uniform, Chester. Oh, my, yes. I surely did. <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody home here. Hello. Place looks deserted, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Uh, here, hold my horse, Chester. I'll take a look. There's a man in here, Chester, lying on the floor. What? He's dead. Somebody killed him. We'll put the fire out now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, we better get started. Looks like rain this morning. Yeah, it's too early to tell for sure. Too bad we don't know that fellow's name, Mr. Dillon. Sure do hate to bury a man and not even put a marker on his grave. Well, I'd rather know the name of the man that killed him. Yeah. It's awful easy to get by with killing a man way out here. Yeah, too easy. Say, look over there, Mr. Dillon. Yonder comes a couple of riders. Yeah, I see them. What do you suppose they're carrying rifles for? Stand over there, Chester, about ten feet from me, huh? Yes, sir. And keep the hair out of your eyes. Yes, sir, I will. What are you men doing here? Do you own this place? I wouldn't live in a shack like that. We got a real house over on Turkey Bend. But that don't answer my question, mister. What are you doing here? Well, we found a dead man in the cabin there last night. So we stopped to bury him. A dead man? That must have been Riley. What happened to him? He got shot. Who the 
have shot a nice fellow like Bob Riley. Maybe they done it, Deaver. They probably did. You think we ought to hang him? It'd be easier to shoot him and leave him here as a kind of a warning. Yeah. Good idea, Giles. You move that rifle one inch, mister, and you'll die for it. Now go ahead, mister. You're calling it. It ain't worth a chance. All right, mister, whoever you are, you and your friend get mounted and right out of here. You're Giles, huh? And Deaver? That's right. We don't want people around here. Might get an idea to settle down. Now you two start riding, and right now. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? That coffee you made this morning was weak as well water. Get that fire going again and build some more, huh? Okay, sir. Sure got a lot of nerve, mister. You don't even blink, Deaver. Look at him. We'll be by here later, mister. We won't ride up so close next time. You better be nowheres around. Come on, Charlie. Almost stop breathe, Mr. Dillon. It was two against two, Chester. We'd have made out all right. Yes, I know, but it's the waiting that chills me. Say, you know something? I'll bet anything it was them that killed the fellow that lived here. Maybe. But I'd sure like to know more about those two. But right now, we better get started for Dodge. Yes, sir. I'll go get the horses. Chester and I got mounted and rode maybe a mile and a half when... We came across a sort of a camp. There was a man there, a tall man with long yellow hair and bright blue eyes that seemed always to be looking into the distance. He had a mule and an old wagon and some hogs that he kept in a well-built, partly covered pen. But he hadn't put up a shelter of any kind for himself, and it didn't look as though he was about to. We got down and walked over to where he was standing by a small fire. Sit down, man. I got no coffee, but you're welcome to that pot of chicory. There's a spoonful of molasses in it. Well, thank you, but we just stopped to say hello. No need to hurry off, mister. My name's Obi Ridges. Glad to know you, Ridges. I'm Matt Dillon, and this is Chester Proudfoot. How do you do? I don't meet many people out here. Are you raising hogs? All my life. Not here, though. Where do you live, Ridges? You, you got a house somewhere? Ain't lived in a house since I was nine years old. I like it outside. I need a breeze. Well, you're outside here, all right. And I ain't going to move, no matter what they say. Uh, no matter what who says? Them two fellas up on Turkey Bend. Uh, Giles and Deaver? Them's the ones. Uh, tell me, Ridges, there's a cabin about a mile and a half north of here. You know the man that lives there, Riley? He comes by here now and then. Well, we buried him last night. Somebody shot him. Hmm. That's bad. That's real bad. You better tell the law about it if you're going anywhere, mister. I don't hold with murdering a man. Well, I'm a U.S. Marshal, Richards. That a fact. Well, now. Don't you ever get into Dodge? Well, never have, but I'm going today. What, in that wagon? It'll take you a week. No, sir. I'm going horseback. Well, I swear I don't see no horse. Well, right out there, fella. Here he comes now. Now, there's Jim Branch leading him. Jim talked me into going to Dodge with him, but I know I won't like it. I'm just doing it for Jim's sake, kind of coddling him along, making him feel good. Where does this Jim Branch live? He's got a little place over west of here somewhere. Jim's nothing but a cowboy, Marshal. He'll be drifting on one of these days, kind of like me that way. Hello? Got company, Jim. Two, two, one. You ready to go, O.B.? I'm all dressed up like a sore thumb, can't you see? <laughs> What'd you do, change your socks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this here's a U.S. Marshal, Jim. I forget his name. Uh, my name's Matt Dillon. I'm glad to know you. I'm just proud for you. Well, how would you do? You heading for Dodge, Marshal? Yeah, we'll ride in with you if you like. Good. It's a big day. I've been talking Obi into going to town for three months. He claims he don't like towns. <laughs> Wait till he sees Dodge. I'm happy right here with my hogs. I don't need no town. Your hogs won't miss you. Well, let's get started. I gotta be back in three days, Jim, like you promised. Them hogs will starve if I ain't. You'll be back. Oh, say. 
The marshal here tells me Riley got shot. No. There's Giles and Deaver done it. Now, wait a minute, Richards. It looks like they did it, but if I could prove it, I'd be taking them in for trial right now. Well, it's too bad you can't, Marshal. They're no good, them fellas. Well, I can wait. They'll make a mistake sooner or later. But we better get going. It's 60 miles to Dodge. Good evening, Kitty. Sit down, Master. Want a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I, I just had dinner. That reminds me. Fella brought me a dozen quail today. Oh? I can cook them for dinner tomorrow if you're going to be around. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll be here. They ought to be ripe enough by then. You know, I never saw as many quail as there are this year. Right then yesterday, we put up clouds up. <laughs> that Jim Branch seems like a nice fellow, man. Oh, be ridges, too. Yeah, they are, Kitty. They <laughs> sure make a funny pair. Maybe. But still, they're kind of like brothers. Look at them over there at the bar. <laughs> Opie's getting spookier every minute he's here. <laughs> Opie likes it outdoors, right out on the ground. I doubt he'll ever come into town again. Jim told me he still hasn't been able to get him to take a meal in a restaurant. He has to bring it outside for him. <laughs> Says he can drink inside, but that's all. <laughs> well, maybe we'd all be better off if we lived that way, Kitty. Not me. I don't want to live like an animal. Uh, don't you? Uh, hello, Miss Kitty. Uh, hello, Jim. Marshal, something bad's happened. Uh, what, Jim? Well, this fellow here just rode into town from up north. Well, he come by Obie's camp... Marshal, somebody shot Obie's mule and burnt up his wagon and killed all his hogs. That's right, Marshal. Oh, yeah. no. Giles and Deaver again, huh? Well, it's Obie I'm worried about. I never should have made him come to town, Marshal. He'll, he'll, he'll kill them fellas. Now I know he will. I'll ride out with you, Jim. Right now. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... This coming Tuesday night on most of these stations, CBS Radio turns John Lund loose on his latest case of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In the Woodward Manila matter, Dollar launches a search for a missing man and a missing fortune. And when the chips are all totaled up, the missing man and the missing money, each somewhat depleted, are accounted for. Don't forget, this Tuesday night at the star's address, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. I wanted to ride out to Obie Ridger's camp that night, but Obie insisted on staying in Dodge. He even tried to have a good time for Jim's sake. Next day, however, on the ride up, well, he just sat his horse and stared straight ahead and never said a word. We reached his camp after dark, and we could see his mule and his hogs lying there in the moonlight, and the remains of his wagon, charred and ghost-like. Now, there was nothing we could do then, so he lay down on the ground and went to sleep. But that was our worst mistake as I discovered when Chester woke me next morning. Obi had disappeared, and he'd taken his rifle with him. We saddled up and rode for Turkey Bend. How much farther is it, Jim? Just beyond them trees, Chester. I told you Obi was going to kill these fellas, Marshal. Well, maybe they're not here. Well, if they're not, he'll find them. Well, let's pull up. I don't see no cabbage. It's right in there. There. There it is. See? It's... Oh. Sure. Wait a minute. Look over there. Behind that log. It's Obi. Hey, Obi! We better walk over. Okay. <laughs> hey, what are you doing, Obi? Yeah, I'm going to get shot. <laughs> 
Come on, let's run for it. Beaver in there. I got him trapped. Look, Obi, I'll handle this. You can't kill these men. I done killed Giles already. That's him laying right by the door over there. Oh, Obi, you did. Blew the top of his head off. Obi, I got to put you under arrest. Now, give me your rifle. Wait till I kill Beaver. I can't hang twice. Give me that rifle, Obi. Now. You mean it, don't you? I do. All right, I won't fight you. Here. Here. But I'd sure like to kill Deaver. Chester, hmm? take this rifle and keep an eye on him. I'm going after Deaver. Yes, sir. He'll kill you, Marshal. No. He'll be too curious at first. I'll walk over there with my hands up. But you wait here till I yell. Deaver! Don't shoot. I want to talk to you. Come outside. Obi's under guard. He won't shoot. I'm a U.S. Marshal, Deaver. You're the feller we run into the other day up at Riley's cabin? I am. Now come on out. I thought there was something about you. I got Obi under arrest, Deaver. He admits killing Giles here. He killed him. Did you and Giles slaughter his mule and his hogs? There ain't no reason to murder a man. No. No, it isn't. But tell me about you. Did you murder Riley? Well, wait a minute, Mark. You're going back to Dodge with us, Stephen. Oh, no, not me. Keep your hand away from that gun. Let's see how good you really are, Marshal. No! Good for you, Marshal. Good. You killed him. Now they're both dead. Yeah, they're both dead. But you murdered one of them, Obi. Uh, Jail. I can't go to jail, Marshal. I'd go crazy. I'd go crazy in jail, don't you understand? I can't go to jail. It was a hard thing to do, but I had no choice. And I took Obi back to Dodge and locked him up. A few weeks later, he went on trial. And after long deliberation, the judge sent us into life imprisonment. Obi stood up and said he'd rather be hung. And I took him back to jail. And I sat there with him for a while. I... I thank you for everything you said, Marshal. You didn't have to do that. Well, I just tried to get the judge to believe you went crazy and you didn't know what you were doing, Obi. I knew what I was doing. I told him I did. Yeah, I know. Why wouldn't he let him hang me, Marshal? And he did what he thought was just, Obi. He didn't think you deserved hanging. I don't know how I stood it this long in jail. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Obi. I, I wish I could help you. They got windows in the penitentiary, Marshal? Sure. Sure, sure they have. Well, I, I, I'll i be around later, Obi. Pretty hard on him, Chester. Where's Jim Branch, anyway? Oh, my. I ain't seen him since the trial was over. Well, maybe he'll come around later. Uh, I'm going to supper with Doc, Chester. We'll be at Delmonico's. All right, sir. Well, uh, man 
something like that could go crazy. Locked up, man? Oh, it's happened before. There's nothing I can do about it, Doc. Well, I know. I didn't mean it that way, Mac. Uh, pass me the beans, will you? These are peas, Matt, but you're welcome to them. All right, peas. Peas, then. Thank you. Uh, well, why don't you take a vacation, Matt? You know, go back east somewhere, oh, kind of like St. Louis or Kansas City or someplace like that. Maybe I don't like towns either. Well, that's just what I mean. You, you need a vacation, all right. Oh. Yeah. Well, if I were a rich croaker, maybe I could take one. A rich croaker? Croaker! Oh, croaker, man, how could you say... Oh, oh, all right, man, Doc. Would you go take it ready? easy, well, Doc. You'll yeah, bust something. It's a fine thing when a mere policeman can insult the noblest profession known to man. I was insulting you, Doc, not the profession. Oh, croaker. Oh, I might have known what it'd be like having supper with you tonight. You know? I'll buy you a drink after, huh? How's that? Well, I don't know. Well, I'll think about Mr. it. Dylan? Now, what's the matter, Chester? Obi Ridgers, he's dead. What? I heard a shot out back, and I run into his cell, and he was laying there dead. There's a gun on the floor. I, I don't know where he got hold of it. You better come look. Uh, he's dead all right, man. You think he killed himself, Doc? Well, the gun was held right close to his head. Maybe somebody called him over to the window and shot him. Maybe. But he could have done it himself. The bullet ended right here, Matt. Yeah. 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 So you're saying it could be either murder or suicide, huh? That's right. Well, why would anybody murder him, Mr. Dillon? It don't make sense. Well, it could be somebody who understood how Obi felt about being cooped up the rest of his life, Chester. And somebody who liked him. A good friend. You mean Jim Branch? I don't know who used that gun, but Obi's dead. And I'm going to find Jim. Jim Branch wouldn't talk one way or the other. So I charged him with both murder and abetting a suicide. And he was brought to trial. The trial didn't last long due to lack of evidence, and Jim was free. He left the country soon after, and I never heard of him again. And as Kitty had said, he and Obi were kind of like brothers. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Crucian, and John Daner. Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty, Roy Rowan speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, Fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. From all corners of the globe comes the news. Edited and reported for your listening pleasure on CBS Newsroom Sunday Desk. Every Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS radio stations. Three top reporters bring you the latest up-to-the-minute news in their specialized fields. Dick Joy tells you about news at home and overseas... Tom Harmon handles sports, and George Fisher reports the movie land news. That's CBS Newsroom Sunday Desk, tomorrow at the Star's Address. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh tomorrow on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>
Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. He's just plain vanished. And there's no note anywhere, Chester? No, sir, nothing. I looked again all over. Well, it's two days now. That isn't like Doc. And I still think he's just gone off on an emergency out in the country somewhere. Well, maybe, but he's always left word before. Well, what'll we do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know. Might start asking people, Chester. Uh, try the saloons and the store and uh, maybe the depot. Huh? All right, sir. I'll go right now. What? Well, I do declare. What? Riding right up front street is as big as life. What? <laughs> Why, that old devil. <sighs> well, you sure are a sight for sore eyes, Doc. Where in the world have you been, anyway? Hello, Chester. Matt? Well, you had us worried, Doc. Oh, that's so? Well, you've been gone two days. I know. Next time, leave word, Doc. I will. I surely will. If I can. Well, it sure would save us a lot of... Wait a minute. What around. do you mean, Doc, if you can? Just that. If they let me, uh, I'll leave word. Come on inside, huh? Okay, Doc, I'm curious. You want to tell me about it? Well, I can tell you part of it, the least important part. I made a promise about the rest. You know how it is, man. No, but you tell me. Well, the other night, Wednesday it was, I was peacefully asleep on my couch when a couple of riders tromped right into my office. They said a man was hurt bad on a place out past Fort Dodge. So naturally, I got up and went along with them. Well, then why didn't you leave a note and say so? They told me not to. They told you what? Let him talk, Chester. Of course, I figured then it must be a shooting. But my job is to take care of everybody, sinner and saved alike. And so when we finally got to this place the next day... What place? That's part of what I promised not to tell you. Oh, my. But like I was saying, there was a young man there who'd got himself shot in the back. The bullet lodged right in his spine. I dug it out and did all I could for him. And then I just sat there for quite a spell. And then I put my things away and I, I walked out into the other room. Well, Doc, how is it? I did what I could. What do you mean? He's dead. The shock of extracting that bullet was too much for him. It's a bad place, the spine. You killed him, huh, Doc? No. No, I didn't kill him. He's dead, ain't he? That boy wouldn't have lived more than a couple of days anyway with that bullet where it was. Whoever put it there murdered him. You want me to shut him up? Not yet. Doc, tell me something. You know that boy in there? I do. Mm-hmm. The three of us here, you know any of us? Him? I've seen him around somewhere. It's Dodge, I guess. Well, that settles it. He ain't walking out of here. Shut up. You know his name, Doc? No, I don't. Might come to me, though. Let me think. You don't understand, Doc. He wants to kill you already, and now you're trying to remember his name. That's just going to make it worse. You can't kill a doctor for following his oath. No. Shot that boy when he tried to get away and shoot you just as easy. Don't be a fool. I'm a doctor. And since there's nothing more I can do here, I've got to be available to other patients. Don't you know I'm the only doctor within a hundred miles of Dodge? Right now, it's one too many. Now, wait a minute. I'm kind of thinking the doc's right. You know, he ain't like an ordinary man. A doctor's, well, it's almost like he ain't quite human somehow. He's human enough to tell what he knows that hard-head marshal they got in Dodge. 
way I figured, it's just or the doc. I'm not interested in what you figure, mister. Right this minute, there may be some woman having a baby and needing me real bad. There may be several folks needing help. He's right. We can't kill him. Well, I can't. You do what I say and nothing else, you hear? And, Doc, listen to me. If I let you go, will you promise not to tell her about anybody you recognized here? And if I don't? And, Doctor, or no, Doctor, I'll kill you myself. Yes, I suppose you would. All right, I'm here as a doctor. And nothing else. I promise. Word of honor, Doc. My word of honor. Okay, get out. Well, that's quite a story, Doc. Oh, you played it right smart if you ask me who were the Doc. And I only recognize one of them, Chester, besides the man they'd shot. Have you thought of his name yet? Chester, don't you understand? I gave my word I wouldn't tell. Oh, but that was just so you could get away. Yes, but still, I gave my word. It doesn't matter how or why. But, Doc, they're just a bunch of killers. I know. Leave him alone, Chester. But I don't... Yes, sir? Matt? Yeah? Wouldn't you do the same if you were in my booth? That'd be a hard choice, Doc, but... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I suppose I wouldn't. I think any man would Leastwise, any man on it. I guess I wasn't really thinking about it that way. Well, I'm going to get myself some sleep. Matt, that was a good boy they murdered. I, I hope they hang for it. That blasphemy! How are we ever going to find him, Mr. John? I don't know, Chester. We don't even know who they killed. And just think. Doc could lead us straight to him right now. It doesn't make him the Doc happy, Chester. No, sir, it sure isn't. Sincerely, Matt Dillon, you... Marshal? Uh, Jake Worth. Why, you haven't come to Dodge in six months that I know of. I'm here now, Marshal. Oh? But trouble, Jake? I'd call it that. Well? You know that cottonwood? Big one down at Brandy Bend? Yeah. There's a hole down by the roots at the north side of it, Marshal. I put a sack in that hole this morning. It's got $20,000 in it. Twenty thousand. Well, that's a lot of money, Jake, even for you. It isn't, if Hank gets back all right. Hank? Well, that's your youngest boy, isn't it? Eighteen last month. He didn't show up the other night, Marshal, and next morning I found a note tacked on the crowd. Said to leave the money or they'd kill him. Well, come on, Jake. We'll try to get there before they pick up the money. Oh, no, Marshal, I won't take any chances. They'd shoot him sure if we did that. You should have told me before you left the money. You should have come here first. You didn't hear what I said, Marshal. I won't take the chance. All I want now is for you to watch for anybody who turns up rich around here. Jake, listen to me. You listen to me, Marshal. Nobody's going to do a thing till Hank's back safe on the ranch. Not one dang thing. Jake, if they killed Hank, you'd want him hung, wouldn't you? I'll hang him myself if it comes to that. All right, then let's go. Let's get down to Brandy Ben and wait for him. No, I already told you no. Jake! I think Hank's dead. You what? I, I think they've already shot him, and he's dead. What are you talking about? Where is he? I don't know. How come you think he's dead? Well, I... I, I can't tell you. Marshal, I've had about enough of this. Look, we're wasting time here. Come on, Jake. I'll tell you what I can on the way to the river. You better, by heaven, or one of us ain't never going to get to the river. Jake Worth was known as a hard, hot-tempered man, but he was straight as they come. He'd made one fortune in Texas cattle and another in buffalo hides, and now all he wanted was his ranch and his three sons to work it with him. The Worths were good men. They didn't cause any trouble, and they worked hard. It wasn't easy to tell Jake, but without mentioning Doc, I said what I could. 
And when we reached the Arkansas, we hid our horses in a clump of bushes and worked our way on foot up to the big cottonwood. And then we saw it. That's him. That's Hank. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Jake. <laughs> they killed him. They killed him all right. He was a good boy. Had his whole life to live yet. Why'd they do it? I gave him the money. Why'd they do it? I, I'm sorry, Jake. Marshal, I want the truth now, every bit of it. Well, that's all I know, Chick. Hank tried to break, and one of them shot him. But we'll get them. I'll take care of myself as soon as you tell me who they are. I don't know who don't they are. Don't lie to me, Marshal. You know a lot you're not telling me. I've told you all I can. That's Chick. my boy lying there, Marshal. He's been murdered, and if I didn't know you so well, I'd begin to think maybe you had something to do with it yourself. Easy now, Jim. Then why don't you tell because me? Because the man who told me about it had to promise not to name anybody. That's why. What man? Who is he? I'll get it out of him if I have to cut it out. I know. That's why I can't tell you who he is. What kind of a lawman are you, anyway? I've told you all I can, Jake. No. No, you haven't. Marshal, I don't believe your story about nobody promising nothing. You know who done it. You're going to tell me. I'm giving you 24 hours to name those men. And me and my boys are coming to Dodge. There'll be blood spilt, Marshal. Jake, I give you my word, I don't know who did it. I don't believe you. I'll help you take your boy home now. Go on back to Dodge. I'll manage here. You're making a bad mistake, Jack. 24 hours, Marshal. I'll be there. We'll find you wherever you'll be. Jake, I... So long, Jake. Ladies and gentlemen, at the conclusion of tonight's show, our star, William Conrad, steps out of the character of Matt Dillon to bring you an announcement which we are certain will be of great interest to all our listeners. So be sure to listen at the close of tonight's program for a special message from William Conrad. And now the second act of Gunsmoke. There was no use arguing with him. The man's grief had destroyed his reason. And the worst of it was, I knew his sons would do whatever Jake told him to do. Unless I could stop it somehow, I'd have to shoot it out with three good and perfectly innocent men. And for no reason at all. I thought about it all the way back to Dodge. And by the time I got there, I had an idea. I went up to Doc's and I talked it over with him. All right, Matt. I'll do whatever I can. Well, it might not work, Doc. And you'll be exposing yourself to a lot of danger. Have you thought about that? I have. And I've also been thinking about the men who killed Hank Worth. Well, we could wait till they start spending their money, or it'll one of them gets drunk and maybe talks too much somewhere. Yes, we could, but... Meantime, you and the Worths will have a gunfight. Oh, and that'd be a terrible thing to let happen. All right, then, Doc, let's go. I want to get to the ranch before dark. You know, Matt, I haven't been out here since Mrs. Worth died. It must be four or five years now. The place sure has changed. Yeah. I don't see anybody around, do you? Well, maybe they saw us first. Maybe they hid out. Yeah, maybe. Uh, 
That's far enough, Marshal. Watch him, boys. If he makes a move, shoot. Yes, Jake. Jake, I came here to stop a shooting, not to start one. You can stop it, Marshal. Just tell me who killed my son. If I knew, I'd be on his trail, Jake. What's Doc doing here, anyway? Tell him, Doc. I took the bullet out of Hank just before he died. What? That's right, Jake. Now come down here where we can talk like friends, and I'll explain it. Stay where you are, boys. All right, Doc, let's hear it. Well, they got me out of bed, Jake, and they led me out into the country. Hank had been shot in the back, and I extracted the bullet. But it was no use. He'd have died anyway. There were three men there, and I recognized one of them. Who was he? I had to promise I wouldn't tell Jake, or, or they'd have killed me. That well, don't matter now. Think about it, Jake. Doc gave him his word, and you're asking him to break it. Now think about it for a minute. I'm thinking, and I'm thinking about my boy, too. Hank's dead, Jake. We can't help him. Shot in the back, and the coward who did it's running free. You want to help get him, Jake? Don't ask fool questions, Marshal. Of course I want to get him. All right, then listen to me. Those men told Doc if he talked, they'd kill him. Yes, and they meant it, too. All right, so I got an idea, Jake. We'll spread it around that Doc has identified the killer. The news will reach him soon enough. And meantime, I'll lay low and have Chester tell everybody I've ridden out after them. Go on. Then we'll just wait. One or two or maybe all three of them will come into Dodge to kill Doc some night soon. I still might get away. I'll deputize you and your boys right now and you can wait for them with us. But you're going to have to stay hidden like me. Well, we won't mind that. Not if we get a chance at them, we won't. Good. Funny thing, though. What? man like Doc here, rather than break his word, he'll make himself a target for those killers. Yeah. Look, Jake... Doc and I are going to go back to Dodge now. I'll see that the story gets started. And in a day or two, you and your boys can ride in. But separately, though. Otherwise, it might cause talk. I understand. And come straight to Doc's. We'll get there. For the next few days, Doc never left his office. I figured that it'd make him look scared and draw the killers right into his place. The rest of us sat around in his back room and waited. Chester kept us supplied with food and coffee. And on the sixth night, about midnight, we got our game. Mr. Dillon, I think it's Sam. They just rode up Front Street, three of them. They're tying up outside right now. They acted too deliberate-like for ordinary riders, so I run up the back way to tell you. Good. Doc, come on in here, huh? What do you want me to do, Max? Take cover in here and stay out of sight, huh? Whatever you say, man. Let's go downstairs and meet them, Marshal. No. We might just scatter them that way, Jake. Mm. Now, listen. One of them will probably stand guard on the street while the other two come up here to get Doc. Chester, mm. you and the two boys go down the back way. Jake and I will wait in Doc's office. Now, don't jump that man until we go into action up here. You understand? Yes, right, guys. All right, then move and move fast. All right, come on, Jake. Now what? Well, we'll just wait here in the dark. Good. I'm going to bunch up Doc's blanket on the couch here so that they'll think he's in it. What? They're on the stairs now. All right, get back in the corner, Jake, or we'll be shooting each other. Yeah. Now, quiet. And don't start shooting till I do. Wake up, you lying dog. Just shoot him and get out of here. Wait, he ain't here. What? Get your hands up. You're it's under arrest. Both of you! You all right, Jake? Yeah, I got one of them. I'm all right. Doc. Doc, come on out. They're dead. Light the lamp, will you, yeah. Doc? All right, You okay, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, come on in, Chester. So we got him. He tried to get away when he heard the shooting up here, but he ran smack into one of the Worth boys. He's dead. Uh, bring the lamp over here, Doc. No, I don't know either one of these men. 
Our doc you can tell us now is one of these the man you recognized? This one here. I remembered later I treated him for a broken nose some time back. I never did know his name. He came up the trail with a herd, I think. Yeah. Uh, Doc, will uh, you take care of things? Sure, man. Well, Jake? Marshal, I mean the boys will be getting back to the ranch now. Sure. Marshal, I... What, Jake? I doubted you. I'm sorry for that. Oh, forget it. No. No, it's best I remembered. A man shouldn't make mistakes like that. Well, there was no harm done. The way it worked out. Uh, I'll buy you a drink before we leave, Marshal. I think I'd like that, Jake. Come on, let's go. Now, a special announcement. Here is our star, William Conrad. Thank you, George. You know, I believe this is the first time I've ever set aside the character of Matt Dillon to speak to you. But this is important to all of us here on the show, and I hope it will seem so to you. Starting next week, Gunsmoke will come to you at a new time, on a new day, sponsored by Chesterfield Cigarettes. Chester, Doc, Kitty, and I, together with all of our strong-minded, brawling, hard-living citizens of Dodge, who will come to you next Monday, July the 5th, so from now on, that's when you'll hear Gunsmoke, on Mondays. And we'd like to think that all of our listeners will find time this coming Monday night, July the 5th, to tune in to their local CBS radio station for Gunsmoke. Until then, good night. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Harry Bartell. Parley Bear is Chester, and Howard McNear is Doc. Join us again Monday, July 5th, as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. George Walsh speaking. For the top tunes of rural America, hear Saturday Night Country Style every week on the CBS Radio Network. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. What a pair. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, 
starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. It was a long ride from Dodge up to Ponca Creek in the Dakota Territory, and I killed a good horse getting there. But I caught Lee Trumbull. He was asleep in a clump of willow, and I took him without a fight. We rode his horse double into Sioux Falls, but we came the rest of the way back to Dodge in style by stagecoach. At least I thought we were traveling in style. Lee didn't seem to care much for it. In fact, he wouldn't even talk until the stage pulled into Dodge and drove up Front Street toward the plaza. You're making a bad mistake, Marshal. Is that so? I didn't kill anybody. There are two witnesses say you did, Lee. They're lying. Then why did you run? My brother Dolph, he said you was after me. That's why I run. You'll get a trial. You can talk about it then. I ain't gonna stand trial, Marshal. Dolph will get me out of jail before that. Is that so? I never figured Dolph is a man to do much of anything. You've been against us Trumbos ever since we come to Dodge, ain't you, Marshal? Yeah, I have. Neither one of you is any good. See what I mean? Yeah, there's your brother Dolph now, waiting to oh. welcome you back. Oh. Well, how'd he know I was coming? I wired Chester from Sioux Falls a week ago. Is that fanny oh, like a deputy of yours? His mail. Chester's not my deputy. Well, he sure acts like it. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? No. Nope. Here we are. You got my brother in there, Marshal? Come on out, Lee. You're going to be sorry for this. Yeah, that's what Lee's been telling me. Come on, Lee, get on out of there. I'm coming, Marshal, I'm coming. Shoot him, dog. Don't look at me, Marshal. I didn't even draw. No. No, you didn't, did you, Dolph? You didn't have to kick him like that. You hurt him. He'll get his wind back. I got him covered, Mr. Dillon. Uh, hello, Chester. Don't you try nothing like that again, Lee. It's all right, Chester. The fight's out of him. You want me to take Dolph's gun? Now, that's funny. I keep forgetting. You do wear a gun, don't you, Dolph? There's nothing wrong with wearing a gun, Marshal? There is the way you wear one. What do you mean? Well, you might run into somebody who doesn't know you're afraid to use it, and he might shoot you before he found that out. You calling me a coward, Marshal? <laughs> now, Chester. Yes, sir? I'm going over to the office. When Lee here stops groaning, hurt him over and lock him up, will you? Okay, sir. And if Dolph gives you any trouble, shoot him. Now, nah, Marshal. Get going, Dolph. Go on, move. You'll be sorry for this. I'll make you sorry for it. Oh, say, there's a fellow waiting for you over at the office, Mr. Dillon. He's a stranger to me, but he wanted to see you. All right, Chester. Oh, by the way, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. It's been most a month you've been gone. We sure did miss you here. Now, there were times when I missed being here, Chester. Uh, don't let Lee get away from you now, huh? I'd hate to make that ride all over again. No, sir, I won't. Oh, I sure won't. Oh, stop breathing like that, Lee, and get on your feet. You ain't hurt. Come on. Get up here. Let me on. Whoa. <laughs> Hello, Matt. Hack. Hack Brian. How are you? Uh, good to see you, Matt. <laughs> You're surprised to see me alive, huh, Matt? Why, Hack, it's been at least ten years, hasn't it? Man ain't born that could kill me. Leastways, I ain't run into him yet. Well, maybe you're just lucky. <laughs> Luckier than you, anyways. A lot luckier sometimes, the way I recall it. Now you're thinking about Santa Fe. Huh? Yeah. You wasn't very lucky that day, Matt. 
Hey, remember how it was? You backed into a corner with nothing but a beer bottle in your hand, and three of John Chisholm's drunk cowboys about to empty their guns into you. Yeah, yeah. And you walked in and killed every one of them. Yeah. <laughs> It was real surprised, wasn't it, Matt? Uh, John Chisholm's been after you ever since, hasn't he, Hack? Oh, them was just the first of Chisholm's men I've killed, Matt. Been riding with Billy the Kid till about half a year ago. Oh? Well, why'd you quit? Never could make out if Billy was working for or against Chisholm. Besides, it didn't pay enough. Oh, but you're the one, Matt. <laughs> when I got to Dodge last night, heard you was U.S. Marshal here, I just didn't believe it. <laughs> well, being a Marshal isn't that hard a job. Oh, you can handle it, all right, I know that. What I mean is, is kind of sudden, find a man you used to know being a U.S. Marshal. Well, I got to earn my keep somehow. Oh, sure, sure. Well, what are you doing at Dodge, anyway? I don't know, Matt. I don't know yet. I've been over to Wagon Bed Springs, stretching my legs, sleeping in a bed, doing a little gambling and the like. Yeah. Some fella here sent for me. I ain't seen him yet, but if it's a job he's got, I sure need the money. <laughs> well, good luck with it, Hack. We'll get together later and have a drink. Yeah? Right, straight ahead, Lee. I see that door there. The fellas is out there. What's back. this? Just a prisoner. What'd he do? I didn't do nothing. Shut up and keep walking, Lee. What you locking him up for, man? Murder. That's bad. That's real bad. Murder's always bad. I don't mean that. I mean locking a man up. I couldn't stand that, Matt. I never been in jail. I never ain't gonna be. <laughs> well, then you better stay sober around here, Hack. And you're taking it back about that drink. Oh, no. No. You'll be safe as long as you're with me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, Matt. I've been around you when it wasn't so safe. <laughs> I'll see you later. Yeah, sure, Hack. Oh. Hey, well, come on in, mister. I'm leaving. So long, Matt. So long, Hack. Marshal Dillon? Uh, hello, Ole. How are you? Marshal, I got something I got to tell you. It's my duty the way I see it. Well, what's the trouble? Hello, Ole. What you doing here? Well, I come to tell the Marshal something, Chester, but I sure don't like informing on people. You understand me, Marshal? Well, what's it about, Ole? Dolph Trumbo, that's what. You got his brother Lee in jail here. We sure have. I just locked him up myself. Well, Dolph's coming to get him out. He's over at the Alifaganza right now talking it up. Talking what up? Well, there's some men at the bar there, Marshal. And Dolph's buying them drinks and telling them his brother's plum innocent and they got to raid the jail here and get him out. You mean he's forming a mob? That's what he's doing, and I don't like it. There's going to be trouble, sure. Ole, thanks very much for telling me this, but uh, don't worry about the trouble. I'll put a stop to that right now. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. What a pair. What a buy. King-size Chesterfield. Now at the new low price. And Chesterfield regular. They're the quality twins. The same highest quality, the same low nicotine. Either way you like them, you get the same wonderful taste and mildness. A refreshing smoke every time. Change to Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. Yes, the Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. What a pair. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. They satisfy millions. They're best for you. Trumbo do something stupid like this, Mr. Dillon? Trying to form a mob to take his brother out of the jailhouse. Well, it works sometimes, Chester. Not in Dodge, it don't. Oh, not so far, anyway. Uh, here's the Oliver Ganza. Now, don't get in the way. Huh? No, sir. You're right, well. There's something else. There's nothing to be afraid of. Oh. You'll be led by one of the best gunmen in the whole country, 
Humphrey. I promise you that. And, and we'll have justice in charge. Once and for all. Justice. That. What do you want, Marshal? What are you doing here? <laughs> Ole told you, huh? I seen him sneak out. I just been talking, Marshal. No harm in talking, is there? Well, Lee's innocent anyway. He shouldn't be in jail. And, and, and I'm going to get him out, too. These men here, they're all with me. And we're going to... Quiet. Shut up! Bartender, this place is closed for the rest of the day. No more liquor. And you men get out of here and don't let me find any of you together again, not for a long time. Now get moving. Oh, here, Chester, I'll pay for the beer. You leaving, Mr. Dillon? Oh, Kitty just came downstairs. I haven't seen her yet. I think I'll go over and say hello. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, like for me to go across the street and see if they're keeping the Alapaganza closed? No, that's all right. <coughs> I told them they could open up again tonight. Oh, oh. Well, thanks for the beer, Mr. Dillon. Sure, Chester, sure. Welcome to Dodge, stranger. How are you, Kitty? Fine. I'd be even better if you brought two beers over instead of one. Uh -huh. But you can sit down anyway. <laughs> well, you can take this one, Kitty. It's kind of warm. I don't want it. Matthew, you suppose the day will ever come when having good manners will be a requirement for the marshal's office? <laughs> well, if it ever does, Kitty, I don't guess they'll need marshals anymore. Yeah, maybe you're right at that. Well, how have you been, huh? Everything okay? Well, I was making out pretty good, Matt, till I broke my toe. Broke your toe? Yep. <laughs> How'd you do that? In the line of duty, right here in this saloon. I got tromped on, dancing with a Texas cowboy. He should have been spending his trail money on red silk handkerchief and soda water instead of me. He couldn't have been over 16. Darn fool, kid. There's not much you can do for a broken toe, is it? No. At least it doesn't hurt when I'm sitting down. I uh, hear you broke up Dolph Trumbo's party at the Alifaganza this afternoon. Oh? Uh huh? <laughs> you hear just about everything, don't you, Kitty? <clears throat> Men. They talk more than women. <laughs> this place is full of men, day and night. You think if I closed my eyes and prayed real hard, they'd all go away? Well, if they did, what would you do for a living? That'll keep me awake. <laughs> Say, there's your friend Dolph now. Just came in. Huh? There's a stranger with him, Matt. Well, I'll be. What's the matter? Who is he? He's a gunman, Kitty. That's so? Yeah. I guess he's about the handiest man with a gun that ever hit Dodge. So Dolph's gone and hired him a gunman. Who is he, anyway? What's his name? He's a friend of mine, Kitty. A friend of yours? Yeah, a good friend. He saved my life once. But now I guess he's going to try to get it back. His name's Prine. Hack Prine. <laughs> The government never did pay me much for enforcing the law in Dodge, but even if they doubled it, there were times when I'd like to acquit. I sat there with Kitty and watched the two men at the bar. They had a drink, then they shook hands, and then Hack walked out. I got up, and I followed him. Where you staying? Dodge House. Huh? I've got a room. I, uh, I'd like to talk to you. Street will do. Okay. 
Dolph was trying to form a mob this afternoon, Hack. He wanted to raid his brother out of jail. I heard about it. When I went to break it up, I heard him saying they'd be led by one of the best gunmen in the country. Now, that wouldn't be Dolph himself. No. He's afraid of guns. He, uh... He meant you. Didn't he, Hack? I hadn't talked to him yet. He was just guessing I'd come in. And you have? Not with no mob. I told him that. I don't work with mobs. You should have known better than to say that. Well, how do you work, Hack? Alone, by myself. I'm a pretty good gunman, Matt. Yeah, yeah, I know. It saved my life once, sure, being a good gunman. Yeah. Matt, turn his brother loose. I get paid if you do. Look, Hack, Lee Trumbo murdered a man. He's going to stand trial for it. I don't get paid if he stands trial. But you get paid for shooting me? That's what Dolph said. That was his deal. Well? Oh, they tell me you're better with a gun you used to be, Matt. Hack, I don't want to fight you. Afraid, Matt? How'd you get to be marshal, anyways? It's a job. I took it. Well, I've been offered a job, too, and I took it. Yeah, but you had better jobs, Hack. Oh, it's been bothering me some, Matt. I took an awful chance saving your life once. Now I got to take another to kill you. That don't make much sense, does it? Look, Hack, why don't you forget it, huh? Go on back to Wagon Bed Springs. I'll lend you some money to see you through. No, huh? it ain't that easy, Matt. I back out on this, the word will get around. Nobody will hire me for nothing no more. My reputation won't be worth crow bait. Did Billy the Kid pay you to kill men? Of course not. Of course not. That was for pleasure. You know how I hate John Chisholm. And you come down a long way, Hack. Selling your gun. I killed a man for pay over to La Hunter. Didn't bother me none. Who was he? I don't know. Some gambler. Pretty good gunman, though. Tell me something, Hack. Did Dolph say how his brother murdered that man here? Dolph claims he didn't do it at all. Well, there were two witnesses who saw him do it. The man was a buffalo skinner, unarmed. He didn't even have a knife on him. But he refused to buy Lee Trumbo a drink, so Lee shot him. Unarmed? That's right. Shot an unarmed man? You think it over, Hack. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night. A man like Hack Prine had his own peculiar sense of honor. The idea of shooting me seemed to bother him less than the fact that Lee Trumbull would kill an unarmed man. Later that night, I heard he'd been seen having an argument with Dolph. So I figured I'd won. But another killing in Dodge, either me or Hack, had been avoided. Until early next morning, word came that a man had been shot at the Dodge house. I sent Chester on over while I went up and got Doc Adams. Mm, How do you know the man isn't already dead, Matt? I don't know, Doc. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll probably make more money off of him dead than alive. Oh? Well, I get paid for autopsies, don't I? Sure. But just try to collect for the ones I keep alive. Just you try it. And I'm glad I don't have to, Doc, but I still notice you buy a new buggy every spring. Oh, yes, and wear it out before. Racing across the prairie, delivering babies, setting bones, digging out bullets, delivering babies. Well, exercise keeps a man young, Doc. It's a good thing I don't depend on sympathy to keep me young. Ah, here we are. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, Oh, hello, Doc. Where is he, Chester? In that room right there, number 12. And you know who it is? It's Ole. Ole? Yes, sir. Ole. And Hack Prine shot him. What? It's Hack's room, Mr. Dillon. He did it all right. Well, let's take a look. Where's Hack now, Chester? I don't know, sir. Nobody's seen him for the past hour. I kept everybody out of the room, Mr. Dillon. All right, now stand aside here, boys. Let the marshal and doc through. Come on now, Dillon. Let them. Let me through. Let me through here. Uh, 
It's Oli, all right. He's dead, Matt. Real dead. Three, four hours, probably. Nobody heard a shot or nothing, Mr. Dillon. But when the clerk come on duty about an hour ago, he saw Hack Prine walk out of here. Why anybody would want to kill poor little Oli, I, I do not understand. I'll bet I know, Mr. Dillon. What, Chester? You didn't talk Hack out of trying to kill you after all. He went back to Dolph last night and told him he'd take the job. Then he figured the only way to get you into a fight was to shoot somebody so you'd have to come after him. Yeah, maybe. Now, come on, let's start looking for him. We will return for the last act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. What a pair. Les Paul and Mary Ford, America's most popular recording duo. You ought to know, you buy millions of their records. Les and Mary say, Chesterfields for me. I guess you could call us a real Chesterfield family. I've been enjoying them now for over six years. It's over 15 years for me. We believe it's the best cigarette ever made. Yes, they have just that refreshing taste and mildness that we like. What a pair. Chesterfield King Size, now at the new low price, and Chesterfield Regular, America's most popular two-way cigarette. I guess the Alapaganza is the only place we haven't looked in, Mr. Dillon. He's got to be there, unless maybe he's going to try to bushwhack you. Hack may be a paid killer, Chester, but he always faces man head on. Yes, sir. Oh, that come right from the Alapaganza. Yeah. Mr. Dillon, there's Hack. He's coming out. Yeah. All right, get off the street, Chester. Yes, sir. Morning, Matt. Hello, Hack. Just killed a man in that saloon there. Dolph Trumbo? I killed him. I gave him a chance, but he wouldn't draw. I killed him anyways. That's too bad, Hack. Ain't no man gonna frame me. I never thought you killed Ole, but I wanted to hear you say so. How'd you know I didn't do it? Well, it wouldn't be your style to kill a defenseless little fellow like that, would it? Of course not. So while you were out gambling last night, Dolph killed him and dumped him in your room. I found him there, and then I went after Dolph. Ain't no man can do that to me. Hack, according to the law, you murdered Dolph. I'm going to have to arrest you. What? You're going to have to stand trial for it. Oh, no, man. No, sir, I ain't going to jail. Not me, Matt. Never. I'm a lawman, Hack. I got to arrest you. Matt, I told Dolph last night I wasn't going to take his job. I told him I was going to leave town. You're under arrest, Hack. All right. I guess you've got to do it. Let's go for it, Matt. No, Hack, no. Let's see what happens. Hack. Hack. Oh, you... 
You're sure good, Matt. You're awful good. Yeah. Better this way, Matt. Than getting paid to fight you. Sure. Sure it is. There weren't no reason to, to fight you. Not that way. I can't see you no more, Matt. It's like like being underwater. I can't see nothing. Uh -huh. Mr. Dillon, that was awful good shooting. I never seen nothing as fast as that in my whole life. My, I'll bet he didn't know what hit him. The way he spun around there when, when you... Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, what's the matter? Mr. Dillon? My... Here is our star, William Conrad. Right now, I'd like to step out of my character as Marshal Matt Dillon to join George Fenneman as a Chesterfield salesman. You know, about the greatest compliment I've ever heard about any product is what smokers say about Chesterfield. They satisfy. So whether you smoke a regular or a king-size cigarette, Chesterfield is best. We hope you'll try them, and soon. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Vic Perrin, John Daner, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in... Gun smoke. Today, L and M filters have a nationwide demand never before equaled by any other cigarette in so short a time. The reason? This is it. It's the filter that counts, and L and M has the best. L and M's exclusive miracle tip contains alpha cellulose to give you effective filtration. Two other things are important. L and M's have much more flavor, much less nicotine. Buy America's highest quality and best filter tip cigarette. Light and mild L and M. Sure to listen to Dragnet, the story of your police force in action, tomorrow night, Tuesday, on another network. Next week at this same time, Chesterfield will bring you another story of the Old West on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. What a pair. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke.
Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job. And it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. It was a hard two-day ride back from Fort Wallace, where I'd gone on government business. And I was pretty saddle-weary when I reached Dodge late the second night. So I went straight to bed without seeing anybody. I'd been gone a couple of weeks, but I'd wired Chester a few days before when to expect me back. And he wasn't surprised when I walked into the office next morning. I figured you'd rode in last night sometime, Mr. Dillon, but I didn't want to bother you. Oh, bother me? Why, was there trouble last night, Chester? Well, no, sir, but everybody was sort of expecting you. Oh. Uh, where was you yesterday, anyway? I, I mean, where'd you ride from? Pawnee Creek. I camped at Rocky Bend. Oh, Rocky Bend's a good camp. I remember it. Oh, <laughs> I, I meant to tell you, Mr. Dillon, they hung up a new sign at the Texas Trail across the street there. Come on over here at the window and you can see it. Well, I'll look later, Chester. I'd like to go through my mail now. Yes, sir. Well, now who's that? What? About four men just pulled up in a wagon right out in the front there. They're getting down. Hey, they're heading this way. I don't believe I know any of them. <laughs> well, let them in anyway, huh, Chester? Oh, yes, sir. Come in, gentlemen. Come in. Where's Marshal Dillon? Uh, he's just sitting right there at his desk, mister. Marshal? I'm Red Samples. Hello? These other men here work for me, except him. Huggins, come up here. This is Jim Huggins, Marshal. Huggins? Hello, Marshal. There's another man laying in the back of the wagon out there, Marshal. He's been shot. Did you say shot? That's what I said. Oh, then I'd better run upstairs and get Doc Adams. I'll be back, Mr. Dillon. Doc Adams ain't going to do him any good. No? That man's dead, Marshal. He's been dead since yesterday morning. Uh, who is he? Lou Price. Lou Price? That's right. Same man you ran out of town about a month ago. You were pretty mad at him the way I heard it. Yeah, I was. He tried to put a knife under me. Nobody saw him try. How do you know that? He told me. Lou Price was a sort of partner of mine, Marshal. Oh? Buying up cattle, Marshal, all over Kansas. Buying lots of them. They'll have me a big ranch when I'm through, up on Pawnee Creek. Oh, well, that's fine. You were camped on Pawnee Creek the night before last, weren't you, Marshal? Yeah, I was. At Rocky Bend. That's right. Hear that, men? Heard them. The only reason I asked Marshal was that Jim Huggins happened to see you there. Now, is that so? I don't remember seeing him. Doesn't matter. As long as he saw you. Tell him, Huggins. It was him, all right. That's where Lou Price was shot, Marshal, at Rocky Bend. Poor Lou, he never had a chance. He wasn't even armed. Happened yesterday morning. I seen the whole thing. Huggins, tell us who killed Lou. He did. What? You did, Marshal. You're the man I saw. You shot him. All right, what's your game, Samples? I've got no game. My partner was murdered. You had a grudge against him. You just admitted before witnesses you were at Rocky Bend. Jim Huggins has identified you as the man he saw kill Lou. Good enough evidence for any court of law. You'll hang for it, Marshal. You got it all figured, haven't you? We're going down right now and swear it out legal on paper. Then I'm going to send it to the governor. Don't you try to get away, Marshal. We'll run you down, sure. Yeah, I expect you would, Samples. Your men look like professional gunmen. Except for Huggins there. I never saw Huggins till he ran into us yesterday. 
I don't bear you no grudge, Marshal. I'm only trying to do what's right. Sure. Sure you are. All right, let's get going, men. The sooner I get this to the governor, the sooner we'll see justice done. Remember what I said, Marshal. Don't you try to run. What a pair. What a buy. They're talking about king-size Chesterfield at the new low price. And Chesterfield regular. They're the quality twins. Either way you like them, you get the same highest quality, the same low nicotine, the same wonderful taste and mildness, a refreshing smoke every time. Yes, the Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made, and it's America's most popular two-way cigarette. So buy a carton today. King-size Chesterfield at the new low price. Or Chesterfield regular. What a pair they are. They satisfy millions. They're best for you. I'll say one thing for Red Samples. He had about as good a case against me as I'd ever heard of against any man. And there was nothing I could do about it but wait and see what happened next. Meantime, he spread the word around Dodge. And people began looking at me like I was a white buffalo. I guess it wasn't often they had a U.S. Marshal walking around with a murder charge against him. But finally, one night, a couple of weeks later, something did happen. I was sitting with Kitty watching the crowd at the Texas Trail. I'll fetch you a drink, Matt. Uh, no thanks, Kitty. You're expecting trouble of some kind, aren't you? <laughs> Seems to me I got enough trouble already. I know. Matt, I hate to say it, but I think half the people in Dodge believe you're guilty. Yeah, uh, sure. And the other half just doesn't care one way or the other. Well, I don't think you are. Uh, don't you? Of course I don't. And why don't we talk about something else? You're edgy. Sure, I'm edgy. I stay that way to keep from falling asleep all the time. Now, don't get all riled up. I didn't mean anything. I'm sorry, Kitty. I... I guess this business is getting on my nerves after all. Well, I should think it would. Why don't you go and get good and drunk? Forget the whole thing that way. Kitty, if I ever got drunk, I could name you ten men right here in Dodge who'd cut cards for the honor of shooting me down. Mr. Dillon? Oh, hello, Miss Kitty. Evening, Chester. Sit down. Thank you. I've been down to telegraph office, Mr. Dillon. Oh, any news? Yes, sir, but you won't like it. Here it is, sir. A telegraph from Washington, D.C. Well, how do you know I won't like it? Well... You see, I was standing there when he was writing it out, and I couldn't help watching him work and all that. I don't want to read it, Chester. You tell me what it says, huh? Well, if it's from the War Department, then it says they heard from the governor, and, well, you'd better read it, Mr. Dillon. No, you're doing fine. Go ahead. Well, you're suspended. What? You're suspended from U.S. Marshal, Mr. Dillon. And to make it legal and formal like they're sending somebody to arrest you and take you up to Hayes City for trial. I don't believe it. Neither do I, Miss Kitty, but that's what it says. It's the only way they see how to clear this up proper. Evening, Dylan. Miss Kitty. Oh, I see Chester beat me back with the news. What? How'd you know about this, Samples? I'm just as interested in this business as you are, Chester, so I sort of talked the clerk into giving me a copy of that telegram after you'd left. Well, you got no doubt... It's on okay, that Chester. It doesn't matter. Dylan, Dodge is going to breathe a lot easier now that you're suspended. He won't be around as marshal. I'm still around, Samples. But you're not marshal anymore. You won't be around for long, anyway. 
Tell me something, Samples. Sure. With me out of office, are you going to be breathing easier, too? I'll tell you, Dylan. There are two reasons I'll be glad to see you hang. One is for murdering my partner. And the other? Well, I always heard you were too strict here, and I like to do a little gambling now and then. Oh? In fact, I'm thinking of running a few tables myself. I see. It's more fun without some hard-nosed lawman looking over your shoulder all the time. You understand? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, I'll see you at the trial. I hope I'm around when they come to arrest you, Dylan. You probably will be. So long. What's he talking about, Mr. Dillon? You're being too strict. Well, there's plenty of gambling going on in Dodge right now. Not his kind of gambling, Chester. What do you mean? Well, he told me he's buying up cattle and getting himself a big ranch. But he's probably going to finance it from his gambling. And that takes a lot of money. Sure, steady money. Oh. And I've always run crooked gamblers out of Dodge. Matt, what are you going to do? I don't know, Kitty. I'd sure like to have a talk with that witness of theirs, Jim Huggins. Well, why don't you? Well, I can't find him. I got him hit out someplace. Matt, is there something I can do? No, nothing, Kitty. Matt, thanks anyway. Well, there she comes, Mr. Dillon, right on time. Now, there are not many people at the depot this morning, are there? No, sir, but anyway, I'm glad I talked you into walking down here with me. There is just nothing pleasures me more than watching a train come in. Well, at least it doesn't cost anything. My, I'd like to drive one of them, wouldn't you, Mr. Dillon? No, they're too noisy for me, Chester. Hello, Marshal. Hello, John. Maybe if I talk to the Santa Fe people, they'd let me try it sometime, you think? Hey, wait a minute. What? Over there, just getting off. The man with the long hair. Well, I'll be... It's Wild Bill Hickok. It sure is. Hey, Bill! Hey, Bill! Hello, Matt. How are you, Bill? How are you, Chester? Fine, Mr. Hickok, just fine. Hey, that's quite a surprise. Why didn't you let me know you were coming? I didn't know myself till just before I left Abilene. Oh, well, how is Abilene these days? Well, I'm still a sheriff there. Guess I will be till somebody gets around to shooting me. Oh, nobody's going to shoot you, Mr. Hickok. They keep trying, Chester. <laughs> they keep missing, too, don't they, Bill? Well, so far. Maybe that's just because nobody's tried to shoot me in the back yet. Yeah, you've always worried about that, haven't you? I'll tell you something, Matt. What? I don't think I'd mind so much if I was to be shot by a man like you. By me? You might take it in mind to try it. I never could tell which way he was going to jump next. Like, right now, sir. Wait a minute. Yeah? You came here to arrest me, didn't you? That's what I come for. Yeah, sure. They might have known they wouldn't send a tin horn. Guess they figured you might not take easy, Matt. I tried to tell them they could lose a good lawman this way. We're a pretty fair match, you and me. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Well? It's your play, Bill. No. I guess that can wait a while. Okay. I'm still on salary, man. So? Let's go have ourselves a drink. Good. You too, Chester? Thank you. I I'd be right proud to, Miss Hickok. I figure if I get a couple of drinks in you, Matt, I might worm your side of this business out of you. Why, Bill? Don't you believe their side? Well, I've seen you pretty mean and ornery, but even if I was to watch you judged and hung for it, I still wouldn't believe Matt Dillon killed an unarmed man. Thanks, Bill. 
Yeah, that girl headed this way. Ain't that Kitty? Yes, sir. It sure Matt. is. Matt, I've been looking everywhere for you. Well, it's Bill Hillcock. Hello, Kitty. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. What are you doing in Dodge? Well, I... I sort of come on business. Uh, you said you were looking for me, Kitty? Uh, Matt, I know where he is. Where who is? The witness they've been hiding, Jim Huggins. What? Well, where is he? Red Samples was in the Texas Trail drinking last night, and the bartender heard him tell one of his gunmen to take some food out to the loft at the O.K. stable. Yeah. Uh, Bill. Yeah? While you're buying me a drink, I think I'd kind of like to buy Kitty one. Later on, back at my office, I explained the situation to Bill Hickok, and we talked it over. And then we sat around the rest of the day talking about uh, old times and people and horses and guns. And along about evening, we went up and laid out our plan to Doc Adams. As soon as it got dark, we went over to the OK stable and took Jim Huggins out of the loft and got him across the street and up to Doc's office before he was real sure what was happening. Yeah, put him on the couch there, gentlemen. We want him to be comfortable. What are you doing with me? Move, Huggins. Do what Doc says. That's it. It's over here. Yeah, that's fine, Huggins. Now then, you just relax. When's Chester going to get here? He'll be along, Bill. Bill, huh? Who are you? I've never seen you before. Mister, you're going to see me double before the night's out. What? Hey, never mind, Huggins. You'll find out. Now then, now you tell me. Have you ever had any heart trouble? Heart trouble? Yes. You ever have dizzy spells, faint, have to lie down suddenly, uh, anything like that? Well, a horse kicked me in the head once. Made me awful dizzy. But I'm asking about your heart, not your brains. I don't want anybody to die here. The business is bad enough as it is. <laughs> what are you going to do with me? What's this all about? Oh, over here, Chester. I got it. I got plenty. That's good. Just put them on the table here, Chester. Ah, uh, let's... Uh, three quarts? Well, this is a man we're working on, uh, not an elephant, Chester. Well, I wanted to be sure there was enough, Doc. Open one up, Chester. There's a glass here. Yes, sir. Here you are, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. What is that? What are you doing? It's nothing but good whiskey, Huggins. And for once in your life, you're going to drink all of it you want. Maybe a little more. Here. Oh, no. I don't want to drink all that whiskey, Marshal. I couldn't hold all that. Oh, you can drink it slow, Huggins. But you're going to drink it. Now, go on. Go on. Get started. We will return for the last act of gun smoke in just a moment. They've got the taste and they've got mildest millions all agree. They're low in nicotine and they're the highest quality. Thirty years research went into this great cigarette. So here is all you say to get the finest smoking yet. Chester feels for me, Chester feels for me. You just say it's Chester feels for me. Remember, friends, Chesterfield is tested and approved by 30 years of scientific tobacco research. For the taste and mildness you want, next time say Chesterfield's for me. Buy a carton of king-size Chesterfield at the new low price or Chesterfield regular. What a pair they are. They're best for you. Sure, you got it all, Bill? Yeah, just about, Matt. Yeah. There she is. Want to read it over? Oh, you heard everything I did. Oh, very well, gentlemen. 
Your friend Huggins has got one of the biggest hangovers coming up any man will have to endure. Is he still out, Doc? He won't hurt him any, though. I sent Chester out for some coffee. Uh, I could use a little coffee myself, Doc. There'll be enough. Oh, say, wasn't it something how that Huggins talked once he got started? I told you, you get enough whiskey in the man and he'd start bragging. Well, you were sure right, Doc. He's not going to feel so big and smart when he wakes up. Oh, I don't know. The man was awful drunk. He may not even remember what he said. Oh, he'll remember when we tell him we even know where he hid the money Red Samples paid him. Yeah, that's Samples. Imagine him shooting his own partner. Well, he's smart, Doc. You shoot your partner, you get his half, don't you? That's a fine way for a lawman to be talking. You mean an ex-lawman, don't you? You know, Bill, I'm just starting to get mad about all this. Come on, let's get going. Ah, oh, Matt, you calm down the spell. We got to get Huggins to sign all I got wrote down here first. Doc, how long will it be before he'll know what he's doing? Oh, maybe, maybe five, six hours. Look, Bill, you do what you like, but I'm going after samples before he finds out his witness is missing. It don't seem quite legal till we get Huggins' signature. Maybe not, but my arrest in samples isn't going to be quite legal anyway. I'll arrest him. No, you won't, Bill. He's mine. All right, man. But I'm coming along. Okay. But just stay out of it. Matt, once you get your tail up and your stinger out, you're the hardest man to stop I ever saw. Matt, I've been thinking... Supposing we hadn't got Huggins to talk, what have you done then? You mean what I have fought you when you tried to arrest me? It's been on my mind, son. I wouldn't have fought you. Because we're a good match for each other? I'll fight any man alive if I think I'm in the right. Of course. I don't know you ever been afraid of anything. I've been afraid lots of times, Bill. And so have you. Well, maybe... I guess I've worked on the side of the law too long to go against it just because I'm the one that's caught. Well, here's the Oliveraganza. I'll be in here. Which one samples, man? The end of the bar, the one in the middle. The other two are his gunmen. Come on. Samples? Samples, I'm taking you to jail. You gone crazy, Dylan? You're the one that's going to jail. It's no use, Samples. Jim Huggins has confessed the whole deal. What? You killed Lou Price, and you paid Huggins to testify that I did it. You paid him $500 and promised him another $500 after the trial. He's lying. Who's going to believe that? I believe it. And don't look at your hired help. They're not going to get you out of this. You can't throw anybody in jail, Dylan. You ain't a marshal anymore. No, that's not stopping me. It ain't legal. Wait a minute, gentlemen. It's true Matt Dillon ain't a marshal right now, but I'm making this arrest, and I'm deputizing him to help me. Who are you? Sheriff, up at Abilene. <laughs> Samples? I want them two hound dogs of yours to move a little to one side where I can keep an eye on them easier. Forgetting it's three against two. That's fair enough odds for us. Start shooting. No, Bill. There's no need for killing. I want these men alive. You ain't taking me alive, Dylan. You, nor Hickok, nor anybody else. I ain't gonna hang. Drop your gun belt, Samples. Why? We just might be lucky enough to kill you. Take Dylan first, men, and then go for Hickok. Wait, Samples! Now! <laughs> All right. What about you two? They never moved a finger, Matt. They're too scared. All right, you gunmen. Pick up samples and carry him out of here. Aren't you going to take their guns first, Matt? You don't hobble a horse with a busted leg, Bill. Let them keep their guns. <laughs> Thank you.
Later, Hickok and I decided to run Jim Huggins and Sample's two gunmen out of town. And the way they took off, we figured they reached California before they stopped to breathe. The next day, Bill went back to Abilene and took Huggins' confession with him. And a week later, I had a wire of apology from the governor. Uh, Washington took a little longer. They just sent me my regular paycheck with the time of my suspension carefully deducted, which left me almost enough money to pay for the liquor I poured into Jim Huggins. our star, William Conrad. I'd just like to repeat what George Fenneman told you earlier. The Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. I hope you'll try them. Regular or king size, I'm sure you'll find Chesterfield is best for you. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Neston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vic Perrin, and James Nusser. Harley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Filter tip smokers, this is it. L and M filters. At last, a filter tip cigarette with much more flavor, much less nicotine. L and M's miracle tip contains alpha cellulose for effective filtration. It's the filter that counts, and L and M has the best. Yes, this is it. As Patricia Morrison puts it, L and M filters are just what the doctor ordered. Buy L and M filters. The light and mild smoke. Without your letters, your friend in the service feels out of touch, lonely, and it's tough to be lonesome. The USO knows a letter always makes a fellow feel better. Mail from you brings the warmth of home and friends to him wherever he is. So, write today. Remember, it's tough to be left out at mail call. Next week at the same time, Chesterfield will bring you another transcribed story of the Western Frontier on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. to you by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. What a pair. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. 
It's a chancy job that makes a man watchful and a little lonely. sure like to meet whoever's running the kitchen in this place. Oh, why, Kitty? A cook that can make antelope stew taste like prairie dog ought to be something to see. Well, at least it's hot. No, it isn't. Well, mine is. You forgetting you dumped half that bowl of chili peppers in yours? <laughs> well, I've eaten here before, Kitty. Oh, hello, Marshal. Hello, John. You know what I'd do if I owned this place, Matt? Uh, tear it down? No. Look, it's got tables and chairs and knives and forks and spoons. And yeah. Out back, they got a kitchen all set up with a stove and everything. So? Well, it's all here. I'd open a restaurant. <laughs> You're spoiled, Kitty. Dodge isn't St. Louis, you know. St. Louis? I was there six months, four years ago. Hello, Matt. Hey, Kitty. How are you, Doc? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, Matt. sit down, Doc. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, well... What are you eating? Stew? That's what they call it, Doc. Ah. Well, I'll try a little anyway. Then I'm going to bed. At noon? I was up all night, Kitty, out at the Brandt place. Mrs. Brandt have her baby? Uh Uh-huh, a boy. That's five I've delivered out there. You know, it seems to me it's about time they gave you one, Oh, no, 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 gave me one. (laughs) I've got enough trouble all by myself. (laughs) But seriously, I'll tell you something, Matt. It's got so I'm afraid to be driving onto the prairie at all. More Indians, Doc? I ran into Sam Butler outside. He just drove in with his whole family and all his belongings loaded onto his wagon. Says he's quitting. Well, why? The Polynesians wiped out another family up near his place on the Smoky Hill River a couple of days ago. Uh, that's the second raid in the last two weeks. No wonder he's scared. Matt, he's telling everyone who will listen. That it's a shameful thing for the law to be hiding out in Dodge while whole families are being slaughtered in the country. He is, huh? Yes. I thought you'd like to know. Hey, you sit with Kitty, Doc. I, uh, I'm going to have a talk with Sam Butler. Sure. Uh, I'll see you later. <laughs> Stays out there and exposes his family to them murdering savages is plumb crazy. Yeah, right there. You can't fight a Pawnee war party all by yourself. And we sure ain't getting no help from the law around here. We can die and rot for all the law cares. Hello, Sam. Well, where you been hiding, Marshal? I uh, hear the Pawnees made another raid up near you. If you call shooting and scalping a man and his wife and their two boys a raid, those men never had a chance to fight far as I see. Men? Well, boys, but they were coming on 14 or 15, old enough to handle a rifle. But they got caught outside and never even made the house. I seen them lying there with my own eyes, Marshal. And if you'd seen him, you'd be doing something about it instead of sitting around here and dying. I'm not hired to fight Indians, Sam. That's the Army's job. You ought to be out helping the Army. Every lawman in the country ought to. The Army doesn't need help. But there's something strange about those Pawnees. What's strange about them? They killed white men before. I'm sorry you're quitting, Sam. We need settlers out here. Not dead ones, you don't. No. No. No, not dead ones. What a pair. What a buy. They're talking about king-size Chesterfield at the new low price. And Chesterfield regular. They're the quality twins. Either way you like them, you get the same highest quality. The same low nicotine. The same wonderful taste and mildness. A refreshing smoke every time. 
Yes, the Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. And it's America's most popular two-way cigarette. So buy a carton today. King-size Chesterfield at the new low price. Or Chesterfield regular. What a pair they are. They satisfy millions. They're best for you. Chester and I left Dodge that afternoon. And toward evening the next day, we ran across a troop of cavalry camped on the Smoky Hill River. It was commanded by an officer who was new to this part of the country, a Captain Starr. He was anxious to make a success of his first expedition, but so far he hadn't even seen an Indian. I decided to stay with him for a while, and I'm glad I did. The next afternoon, while we were on the march, his scouts reported another settler's cabin burned. The family killed. At my request, Captain Starr filed his troop out in patrols while he and Chester and I rode forward to the scene of the slaughter. My scouts say these people haven't been dead very long, Marshal. Uh, this morning, probably. At dawn, Captain. Well, then those Indians can't be too far off. No, but Indians have a way of disappearing. There it is, Mr. Dillon. Burned right into the ground. Uh, it's just like that last cabin. There are bodies scattered around out front. Well, let's get up there. Come on, lad. It's a little girl. Oh, they scalped them, every one of them. Even that little girl. They even scalped her. At least they didn't torture them. Did they torture the other families, Captain? No, they didn't, Marshal. They shot them just like this and scalped them. Uh, where are you going, Marshal? Uh, what is it? Captain Starr... Last night you told me this is your first chore of duty in Indian country. That's right, Marshal. I'll take a good look around here, Captain. Well, I have. All right. All three of these settler families were killed in the open, outside their cabins. Does that mean anything to you? Those Pawnees are pretty tricky. I guess they really surprised them. Yeah, they sure did. There are not many arrows around. If these people had had a chance to put up a fight, there'd be a lot of arrows. They were shot, Marshal, with rifles. Bonnies don't usually waste ammunition, Captain. There's a reason for it here, though. Well, what reason? Look at the ground. There are no tracks. Every sign of tracks have been dragged out with a blanket. I say, you're... You're right. I, uh, I hadn't noticed that. Well, there's another thing you haven't noticed, or maybe you didn't know about. Oh, what's that? That boy there. How old would you say he was? Oh. About the same age as the boys at the last place. Uh, maybe 12, 13. Well, Captain, that's old enough to be a brave in a couple of years if he was a Pawnee. What do you mean, if he was a Pawnee? They usually keep a boy that age. They don't kill him. They take him and try to make a brave out of him. Oh, I, <clears throat> I didn't know that. I know what he's driving at, Captain. You don't think it was Pawnees that done this. 
Ain't that right, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, that's right. But the Pawnees are the only tribe around here we know of, Marshal. Captain, it's them tracks. Pawnees wouldn't hide their tracks. No, they wouldn't. What? A man wearing moccasins doesn't care about his tracks, Captain. He's got nothing to hide. I'm afraid I don't understand, It Marshal. wasn't Pawnees that did this. It wasn't Indians at all. It was white men. Marshal Dillon, it's impossible for me to believe white men could have done this. Is it, Captain? No white man would shoot that little girl over there and then scalp her. Did you ever hear what Chivington did to the Cheyennes at Sand Creek? Kill and scalp them all, he said, big and little. Nits make lights. Congress has repudiated that whole affair, Marshal. Well, it still happened. And it was still white men that did it. I... I suppose you're... You're right. Yeah, I'm right. But why did they do it? Horses. You see that corral out there? This man must have had six or seven head of horses. Yes, the other settlers did too. They stole the horses and probably whatever they could find in the cabins. And right now they're sitting around camp somewhere drinking coffee and laughing at all of us Indian hunters. Well, I'll find them. Now, it's a big country, Captain. Well, I got a troop of cavalry out there, Marshal, over a hundred men. All right, suppose you do find some riders with a bunch of horses. How are you going to know they're the men you're after? Well, the, these... These horses are branded, aren't they? With what brands? I don't know, but they must be registered somewhere. Maybe. But while you're out finding out all that, some other family's going to be slaughtered. There isn't time, Captain. I didn't, uh, realize how new I am at this game, Marshal. Oh, what would you suggest? Well, uh, there, there used to be a corral about five miles upriver from here. If it's still standing, we'll... We'll bait it with a couple of dozen head of good cavalry horses. Then they'll come to us. Good idea. And I'll have my troop deployed and ready to move in. No, that wouldn't work. You can't hide a hundred men, Captain. You'll have to keep your cavalry clear away from there. But how... Chester and I'll be there. We'll wait for them. Dillon. I'll throw him on the fire, Chester. Let's have some more smoke, huh? Yes, sir. <coughs> well, stand back, Chester. Yes, sir. Well, they ought to see that if they're anywhere this side of the Rocky Mountains. They're sure to be scouting around, Mr. Dillon. They ain't stole enough horses yet to leave the country. Yeah, besides, they're feeling mighty safe. They'll come. <clears throat> Mr. Dillon? Yeah? I've been thinking. Now, what's bothering you? Well, sir, there's only two of us. And I'm wondering how many there are of them. Now, you want to go back and find the cavalry? Well, I feel a whole lot safer. They'll go on, then. Oh, we... You, you didn't answer my question, Mr. Dillon. How many do you think we're waiting for? Yeah, there's no way of telling, Chester. Well, if there's a whole parcel of them, how in the world are we going to take them? I don't care how we take them. You're pretty mad, ain't you? Well, I can't get that little girl out of my mind. Yes, sir, I know. Now, look up. Hmm? Here comes somebody. Hmm. He's all alone. Just some cowboy, probably. Maybe. Yeah, sure it is. He's seen the smoke from our fire, and now he's wondering what that old corral's doing full of horses. And he might be scouting it for the others. Those men don't take many chances. Well, how are we going to find out? Well, maybe we won't till it's too late. Uh, heat up some coffee for him, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. Uh, I think I'll have a cup of it, too, huh? Right, 
Morning. Oh, get on, stranger. We'll have some hot coffee up in a minute. Uh, let's tie my horse here. There. Sure use some coffee. Had to make dry camp last night. Oh? Uh-huh. Well, you couldn't have been very far away. Why didn't you ride on down to the river here? Tell you why, mister. I was lost. I rode till after dark. And I got lost. Well, your horse could have found it for you. Maybe my horse ain't smart as yours. No offense. Sit down. Chester's bringing the coffee now. I've been sitting all morning. Here you are, mister. Oh. We ain't got no sugar. You men are traveling pretty light, ain't you? What do you mean? Here's your coffee. Oh, thanks, Chester. You mean all them horses. Mighty big remote and no wagon. Not much grub I can see. We're driving those horses to Cheyenne. There's only two of us. We couldn't handle a wagon and the herd both. Only two of you? Yeah, that's right. Well, mister, look at I'm drifting. Maybe you could use another hand. There may be. Where are you from? Dakota Territory. Name of Lee Stapp. I sure would like to see Cheyenne. I ain't never been there. Well, why don't you ride up there alone? It'd be chasing a herd of horses all the way. Well, I'm broke, mister. Wouldn't have much of a party in Cheyenne broke, would I? No, I don't guess you wouldn't. I'm a good hand. I work cheap. How about it? You're a good hand, huh? Of course I am. Did you take a look at those horses we got? Yeah, I sure did. I ain't never seen none better. Well, they're good horses, and we take good care of them. Well, okay. What's that got to do with hiring me? Mister, I wouldn't hire you to herd sheep. What? You said you made dry camp last night. How come you tie your horse up without water anymore? while you stand here slopping up coffee? Well, it's my horse, ain't it? Sure. How's the coffee? Coffee? Is it any good? Well, yeah, sure it is. Well, then have some more of it. Hey, what's that? <laughs> Chester. Yes, sir. Here, catch his gun. Got it. All right, now go get some rope. We'll tie him up while he's still out. Yeah, but, Mr. Dillon, you sure he ain't just a cowboy like he said? I was pretty sure, Chester, but this made me real sure. It was sticking out of his pocket. Oh, my. I'll get the rope, and we ought to hang him with it. Turn for the last act of gun smoke in just a moment. In regular or king size, you can get them either way. The best smoke ever made, the Chesterfield you buy today. Smokers coast to coast are changing, it's a cinch to do. Here's all you have to say to get the one that's best for you. Chesterfield's for me, Chesterfield's for me. You just say it's Chesterfield's for me. Friends, for your vacation, take along plenty of Chesterfield. Buy them by the carton. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. What a pair. They're the quality twins. The same highest quality. The same low nicotine. Either way you like them, they're best for you. Smoke Chesterfield. It's America's most popular two-way cigarette. See anything yet, Chester? Yes, sir. There's some dust about a mile away, Mr. Dillon. Is it moving? Right this way. I'd guess maybe a half dozen riders. Now, your friends don't take many chances, do they, Stan? They ain't friends of mine. Well, I'll tell them that when they get here. Uh, you better turn me loose, or else you ain't gonna tell nobody nothing. 
You mean they won't like it? You're being all tied up that way? You ain't got a chance, Marshal. My golly, he's about right, Mr. Dillon. How are we going to fight six men? You know, I've been thinking, Chester, we could use Stapp here as a hostage. No, no, Marshal, don't do it. I don't aim to, Stapp. They wouldn't care whether you die or not. Men like you don't have that kind of friends. But we can't stand up to six men, Mr. Dillon. We, we wouldn't have a chance. No, we wouldn't, Chester. I'm going to do something I never did before in my life. What? You'll see. But first, get a bandana and fix Stapp up so he can't talk. Well, that won't do you no good. Shut up and get on your feet. Here's a bandana. Here, I'll do it. All right, on your feet. Stand you. Now turn around. <laughs> Get our rifles, Chester. Yes, sir. There. That'll keep you quiet, Step. All right, now walk. Here's yours, Mr. Dillon. Oh, thanks. You get on behind that log over there, Chester. Yes, sir. I'll keep Step here with me. All right, lie down, Step. And if you make any noise, I'll split your skull. Mm-hmm. Now, go on. Lie down. Mm-hmm. You okay, Chester? Yes, you're fine. Keep the sun off your rifle. They're getting pretty close. Now, quiet. Mr. Dillon? What? What are we going to do now? Hide it out from here? Chester, I'd hate for either of us to get killed by men like them. When I start shooting, you start. Take whoever's on your side first and then work in. It's a surprise them, huh? Because they'll never know it. Shut up now. Here they come. Get your hands up in the air. Chester, come over here. We killed four of them, Mr. Dillon. Four of them. Rod Stapp up and bring him up to the fire. I'll handle these two. Well, you two stop just in time. You can turn around now. Who are you? What would you ambush us for? Well, you went and killed four men. I'm a U.S. Marshal, mister. You're lying. Am I? What kind of marshal would ambush a bunch of men like that? My kind. I untied his bandana, Mr. Dillon. No reason you shouldn't talk now. That was murder. That's what that was. That was plain murder. Sure was. Even if he is a marshal, he'll hang for this. He never give us a chance. You're right, mister. I didn't give you a chance. There were too many of you. Besides, I never knew any man that deserved a chance less than you. What are you talking about? We ain't done nothing. You haven't, huh? Well, I found this on your friend Stapp, mister. Here. Take a good look at it. Well, what's this? This ain't nothing, just a little yellow ribbon. Burned the rest of it. You blasted fool, Stapp. 
I, I, I didn't get nothing else. It was just kind of a souvenir. I, I told you to get rid of everything. Stap, I'm sorry you came in alone. I wish you'd been with the others. But I'll see you hanged. All three of you. And it's that little girl's yellow hair ribbon that's gonna hang you. L and M goes king size. Yes, L and M goes king size. Now, L and M is king size as well as regular. Both have the same low price. Both have the miracle tip for the effective filtration you need. Yes, it's the filter that counts. And L and M has the best. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine, a light and mild smoke. Yes, this is it. L and M filters, just what the doctor ordered. Buy a carton, king size or regular, both at the same low price. L and M Filters, America's highest quality and best filter tip cigarette. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Joseph Kearns, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gun Smoke. the physical danger of war is over for your friend in the service. His morale is threatened now more than ever. He worries about being the forgotten man. And when there's no mail from home, that's when loneliness really settles in. And it's tough to be lonesome. The USO knows there's nothing like a letter to make a fellow feel better. Why don't you let your friend in the service know you're thinking of him? If you're a cousin, neighbor, schoolmate, or a member of his church, club, or union, write to him today. Remember, it's tough to be left out at mail call. And remember, too, next week at this same time, Chesterfield will bring you another transcribed story of the Western Frontier on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. to you by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. What a pair. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Oh. 
Oh, no, I'm not, Chester. I'm looking for a cup of coffee. Thought I'd go into Delmonico's here. You want to join me? Well, sir, I'd like to, but maybe I'd better go on down to the depot. Oh, what for? The mail. I never got there at noon. That's why I thought you was going now. Well, I don't care about the mail, Chester. Yeah, but come to think of it, you did start out at noon, didn't you? <laughs> what happened? I got robbed. Got robbed? Yes, sir. Over at the Alphaganza. Oh, you've been gambling all afternoon, huh? Not all afternoon, Mr. Dillon. I watched the game for about an hour before I set in. <laughs> well, you should have gone on watching it. Oh, yes, sir, you're right. Absolutely right. Cost me my last ten dollars. But I thought sure I'd win this time. Oh, why? Because it was my last ten dollars for the month. I had to. <laughs> well, that's about as good a reason for winning as any, I guess. Yes, sir. You know, there's just too much money for my pay, Mr. Dillon. Anyway, I might have won if I hadn't got cheated. Oh, it's a crooked game? The fellow dealing was crooked, and I know he was. But I sure didn't want to start no argument with him. No, sir, not him. Well, why? Who was he? I don't know. Some stranger calls himself Sam Kircher. What? Sam Kircher. You know him? Oh, but I've heard of him. Who is he? He's a gunman, Chester. Oh, I recognize that. That's why I didn't make no fuss about his crooked dealing. Now, you were smart. Kircher's the kind of man who enjoys killing. He's got a big reputation for it out in Arizona. Well, what you doing here, I wonder? I don't know, Chester. But let's go find out. That's him, Mr. Dillon. Just getting up from the table over there. I guess the game's finished. Funny you'd tell you his name, Chester. A man like that usually doesn't talk so much. No, sir, but I didn't think nothing about it at the time. I... I He's coming over here at the bar, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Glass of whiskey, bartender. Hello, Kircher. Where have you been, Dillon? What? Took you long enough to get here. It's been a half hour since I cheated your friend here out of his money. Cheated me, you see? I told you he did. But how do you know I was a friend of Mr. Dillon? I asked. Smart of me, wasn't it? What'd you ask for? What difference did it make? Never mind, Chester. What are you doing in Dodge, Kircher? I got tired of Arizona. Why? Nobody left worth bothering about there. You mean there's nobody left worth your killing, is that it? Man can get rusty facing down bums and greenhorns, Dylan. What's the matter with Tombstone? Wyatt Earp wrote me it's a lively town these days. Oh, too many of them Earps. And they got Doc Halliday with them, too. Man be a fool to ride into that camp. Well, you draw a line somewhere, don't you? One man at a time is good enough for me, Dylan. <laughs> I ain't greedy. Now, you're kind of greedy about money. What do you mean? You admitted cheating Chester out of his ten dollars. I had a reason for that, Dylan. Now, did you? Yeah. He was hanging around watching the game, and I found out who he was. So when he sat down, I took him. I can deal faster than that. I wanted him to know and run tell you about it. Why? I wanted to meet you, Dylan. Always like to get to know the leading citizens of a place. You got your own way of going about it. Are you objecting? Ordinarily, I object to cheating at cards, yeah. But with you, I don't think it matters much. Now, what are you doing in Dodge, Kircher? I was nearby, up in Colorado. I heard about you there, Dylan. You got quite a reputation. I'm a lawman, Kircher, not a gunman. I don't care about my reputation. I do. Now, yeah. you came here to kill me, huh? That's what I came for, Dylan. Kircher, I'm going to tell you something. What? Men like you are as useless as wolves. I hate every one of your kind. And that'll make it easier for you to fight me, Dylan. I'll meet you out in the plaza, sundown, tomorrow.
What a pair. What a buy. We're talking about king-size Chesterfield at the new low price. And Chesterfield regular. They're the quality twins. The best cigarette ever made. Either way you like them, you get the same highest quality. Same low nicotine. The same wonderful taste and mildness. A refreshing smoke every time. So change to Chesterfield. America's most popular two-way cigarette. Buy a carton today. You'll get highest quality with king-size Chesterfield at the new low price. You get highest quality with Chesterfield regular. What a pair they are. They satisfy millions. They're best for you. thinking about sundown all day long. I feel terrible about this. Oh, why? It isn't your trouble. Yes, sir, I know, but if I hadn't said in that game yesterday, things might be different. Ah, uh, Sam Kirchard have found me soon enough. That's what he said he came here for. I heard him, but I still feel guilty. What's the matter, Chester? You afraid he'll kill me? Is he really good? Well, he's beat a lot of men. You're going to fight him, ain't you? Yeah, that's the worst part of this job, Chester, having men like Sam Kircher come around looking for another notch on his gun. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, you don't have to fight him, Mr. Dillon. No. No, I don't. I could avoid it. How? Uh, Run away. Oh, uh... Look out the window here, Mr. Dillon. The plaza's plumb deserted. Sure. Guess the word's got around. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what? He's coming. Sam Kircher. Walking across the plaza. <coughs> well, it must be sundown. Yes, sir, it is. Uh, don't come out the door, Chester, or you'll be behind me. I'm only going as far as the boardwalk. I won't. I'll stay right here. But if anything happens, then I'm coming out, by golly. Don't be a fool. Come on out in the street, Dylan. What you standing there for? What's the matter with you? You scared? Don't you come down here, Dylan. There's a lot of people hid out watching us. Been a long time since a marshal's killed and dodged. I don't want to hear your talk, Kircher. Let's get this over. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Well, he didn't hardly have his gun out before you hit him the first time. I was watching him. I didn't wait for him. I drew first. You did? Giving a man a chance to be arrested is one thing. Shooting down a killer is another. Yes, sir. This is nothing but slaughter. Brainless slaughter. Like I said, it's the worst part of this miserable job. <laughs> I guess it helped ridden the country of a man like Sam Kircher, shooting him down, killing him. But the trouble was that it made you feel like a part of his own senselessness when you did it. And everybody congratulating you afterwards and looking up to you. That didn't help any. That's one thing that got men like Kircher started off wrong in the first place. All the talk, all the admiration for gunfighters. 
Like with a kid I met at the Texas Trail one night a couple of months later. He was sitting with Kitty when I came in. Evening, Matt. Trump. Oh, thanks, Kitty. This is Marshal Dillon, Pate. I know. I've seen him. Pate, huh? Well, I never saw you around before, Pate. He rode in yesterday, Matt. His first time. Good thing, too. He's only 16. Yeah, that's young. Especially for a town like Dodge. Where are you from, Pete? On the west of here. Ah, uh, cowboy? I was. That's what I've been arguing with him about, Matt. He says he's through being a cowboy. Oh, uh, is that so? Why? I got other things to do. Like what? I'm going to buy me a gun, Marshal. A gun? Sure. And I'm going to learn to use it, too. A man's no good without a gun. Oh? Pate, you start carrying a gun and you get handy with it and you'll grow up to be a U.S. Marshal or something. No kidding. I mean it. I never saw a man start using a gun yet that he didn't have to go on using it the rest of his life, however long that is. Tell me something, Pate. What uh, gave you this idea? What's wrong with it? Everybody carries a gun. Of course, everybody can't use them real good. But I'll learn. I'll get good. Good as you are, Marshal. Oh? Sure. Maybe even better. Who knows? That's what I mean. It all leads to nothing but getting killed. Who cares how good you are with a gun? There's always somebody better. She's right, Pete. Uh, why don't you forget about this and go find yourself a job out in the country somewhere and go to work, huh? I'm going to have to, Marshal. I'm plumb broke right now. Oh, good. That's fine. You know anybody around here? Nope. Well, look, I'll tell you. Emmett Bowers is due in town tomorrow. He runs a big outfit, and he can always use an extra hand. You meet me in the lobby of the Dodge House tomorrow morning, and, well, we'll have a talk with him. Okay. I better be going now. i got to find me a place to sleep. Oh, uh, Pete. Uh, here. Here's a dollar. You, you can pay me back later. No. No, I couldn't take it. No, thanks. Good night. Good night, Kitty. So long, Pete. Good night. <laughs> He's got a lot of pride, that kid. Yeah. But it's mostly the wrong kind. Hmm, maybe. Well, you'll probably forget about this gunfighting business once he's back out in the country where he belongs. Well, I hope so. There are enough gunmen around already. Oh, Pate's all right. Don't worry about him. No, I won't, Kitty. Unless he comes back someday. Pate was at the Dodge House the next morning, and we found him at Bowers there and got him a job right off. They rode out of town together that evening, and I watched him go, hoping that a lot of hard work would give Pate something to think about besides becoming a gunfighter. Anyway, I'd done what I could, and I forgot about it. Till a couple of months later, when I happened to go into Jonah's General Store... Dillon. Hello, Miss Jonas. Well, how come you're running the store? Why, hadn't you heard, Marshal? Oh, no, heard what? My husband's got the ague real bad. I've been taking care of him and running the store, too. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. But how do you manage to do both? Well, I moved his bed into the storeroom out back. Matter of fact, Doc Adams is in there with him now. Huh? Oh, that poor man, Marshal. He's had chills one day and fever the next for nigh on to a week. Well, Doc, I'll fix him up. Doc can cure almost anything. I can cure anything but a liar, Matt. What? Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, I didn't know you were listening. I was listening, and I heard what you said. And it was a long way from what you told me the other day. Why, what do you mean, Doc? Mrs. Jonas, he told me the only thing croakers were good for was performing autopsies and signing death certificates. <gasps> That's exactly what he said. Death certificate. Now, don't let him scare you, ma'am. Nobody ever died of ague yet, doctor or no doctor. Oh, Matt, why aren't you out patrolling Front Street or keeping the peace somewhere like you're paid to do? (laughs) 
Man can't work all the time, Doc. Oh, he can. Uh, yes, well, I'll just remember that the next time you come hounding me out of bed in the middle of the night to patch up some bad man that you've just torn apart. Uh, when you're through here, I'll buy you a glass of beer, Doc. It's awful hot today. No, uh, I don't mind the heat. Uh, yeah, I'll take you up on it, though. Just... <laughs> Say, Mrs. Jonas, <laughs> if your husband complains about his ears roaring, it's the quinine I gave him. So just you don't worry about it. Oh, all hello, right. Marshal. Well, hello, Pate. How are you? I'm okay. Oh, uh, Pate, you know Miss Jonas here? Ma'am. Hello, Pate. And Doc Adams. How do you do? Doc? Pate's been riding for Emmett Bowers the uh, last couple of months. Oh, that's fine. Well, Emmett's a good boss, I've always heard. He's all right. Are they treating you okay out there? It's like any other job punching cows, Marshal. Short grub and long hours. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, what you doing in town? Did you come in with Emmett? No. I come in alone. Oh? Uh-huh. You, uh, didn't quit, did you? I quit. I drew my time last night. Yeah, I was afraid so. Ma'am? Mm-hmm? I want me a six-gun and a holster and a belt. And all the ammunition the rest of my money will buy. Well, now, son, ain't you a little young to be carrying a gun? I'm 16. And if I'm old enough to do a man's work, I guess I'm old enough to live like a man. Live like a man? Yes, you mean die like one, don't you, young fella? I ain't afraid to die. Mm, I don't know. I've dug bullets out of all kinds of men, young and old. And no matter how they talk, every one of them's been afraid. I get good enough, I'll do the killing. If I'm given a decent chance. Pate, tell me something. How'd you get started on all this in the first place? I don't mind telling you, Marshal. Now... Now? Now I got money for a gun, and I can start practicing. Oh, wait a minute. Is there some particular man you're after? Is that it? Yeah. That's it, Marshal. Well, who is he? You. Me? I'm going to fight you, Marshal. And I'm going to kill you if I can. Well, why? I never saw you before in my life till you came here. Pate's my first name, Marshal. So? My last name's Kircher. I heard about how you shot my brother, so I come here to take his place. Tate, Sam Kircher was nothing but a killer. He was no good. You drew first on him. What difference does it make? Your brother came after me for only one reason, to kill me so he could be a big man. You think I'm going to take a chance being killed for anything as brainless as that? There's rules to gunfighting, Marshal. He wasn't ready to draw. Where'd you get all these crazy ideas, kid? Who taught you that killing people is a game of some sort? My brother told me all about it a long time ago. Yeah, sure. Now, for him, it was a game. That's what was wrong with him. He'd have beat you if he'd have been ready. Pate, do you wait for a mad dog to bite you before you try to stop him? And your brother was ready. He rode in the Dodge ready. Well, I'll be ready for you. In a few weeks, I will. You will, huh? Look, Pate, I've been handling a gun for years. What makes you think that you can go against me in a few weeks? Unless you're planning something else. No, Marshal, I'll never shoot anybody in the back. Not even you. You're not bad, Pate, but you sure got everything mixed up. Why? Because I'm only 16? You see what I can do, Marshal. You see. Well, what if I won't draw on you? I'll kill you anyway. Like you say, what difference does it make? All right. If you're going to act like your brother, I'll treat you like your brother. And when you come gunning for me, I'll shoot you down as fast as I did him. So go ahead and practice. Practice all you like. But when you face me, I'll have three bullets in you before you clear your holster. I don't care how old you are. Your best cigarette buy today is Chesterfield. There's Chesterfield king size at the new low price. And for your convenience, Chesterfield regular. What a pair. 
Either way, you get the taste and mildness you want. A refreshing smoke every time. Either way, you get highest quality, low nicotine. Buy a carton of Chesterfields. They're best for you. In regular or king size, you can get them either way. The best smoke ever made the Chesterfield you buy today. Smokers coast to coast are changing. It's a cinch to do. Here's all you have to say to get the one that's best for you. Chesterfield's for me. Chesterfield's for me. You just say it's Chesterfield's for me. If I thought getting mad would scare some sense under Pate Kircher, I was wrong. He went ahead and bought his six-gun. And every day, he spent hours down by the Arkansas practicing with it. In a few years, that kind of concentration might have made him into a fair gunfighter. But as it turned out, he didn't get a few years. He didn't get more than about ten days. And those ten days got spent fast. One evening, I was sitting on the porch not far from the Texas Trail, watching the crowd push up and down Front Street. Oh, hello, Marshal. Hello, John. Matt. Matt. Oh, hello, Kitty. Matt, Chess is in the trail there, and he asked me to come find you. Oh, why? What's the trouble? You know, Jack Rining... Yeah, I know him. Well, he's at the bar in there, and he's making fun of young Pate. Chester isn't sure how much Pate's going to take from him. Well, Ryan is more than just a bully, Kitty. He's dangerous. Well, Chester tried to make him stop, but it didn't do any good, Matt. I hope Pate isn't fool enough to try to take him. Ryan will kill him, sure, if he does. I tried to tell him he shouldn't be wearing a gun, but you know Pate. He won't listen to anybody. Uh, well, you better wait out here. I aim to. Leave the kid alone, Ryan. He ain't bothering you none. Get out of the way, Chester. Everybody else, get out of the way, Come too. On, Mr. I'm giving you one more chance, Faith. You throw that gun away or you start using it. Go ahead and draw, Ryan. I ain't afraid of you. Okay. I will. No, don't do it, Ryan. No. Ah! <laughs> All right, shut up, everybody. My hand. Shut up. You busted my hand, Marshal. What'd you do that for? You think you're a fight? It's like shooting a man in the back. You, you ruined my hand. You're about to murder this boy, Ryan, and I should have shot you in the head. Now go on over to Doc's if your hand bothers you. It bothers me. It's it, it smashed. Good. I wonder how many lives that's going to save. Now go on, get out of here. I'm going. I'm going. You ruined me, that's what you've done. We'll see about this. Oh, he'd have killed him? Sure, Mr. Dillon. Pete never even got his gun out. Uh, that's true, I didn't. I kind of froze. I, I don't know why. Pete, Jack Rynan's the same kind of man your brother was, always looking to kill somebody. And if you still think it's a game of some kind, go on wearing that gun. And when the time comes, I'll see you buried with it. But that's all I'll do for you. All right, come on, Chester. Let's get out of here. Yes, sir. Marshal. Marshal, wait a minute. Marshal? Yeah. You saved my life just now. He sure did. One more second, you'd have had a bullet clean through you. I know that. But I don't understand. What don't you understand? Well, you, you could have let him kill me, and then I wouldn't be after you no more, would I? Not dead, you wouldn't. But you, you saved the life of a man who sworn to kill you, Marshal. Yeah, that's right. Well, why'd you do it? Because you didn't have a chance with him, Pete. Not a chance. I'm kind of confused, Marshal. You are? I sure am. Well, it's about time. And maybe you'll figure it out now, Pete, if you give yourself half a chance. Marshal, I... I always could think better when I'm riding a horse. 
I'm going back to my job. Good. I'm glad to hear that, Pete. Would you do me a favor? Not sure. Well, punching cows will keep me so busy I won't have time to practice much. Would you hold on to my gun for me? What? Here. Yeah, sure I will, Pete. Sure I will. I'll keep it for you. For a long time, I hope. L and M goes king size. Yes, L and M goes king size. Now, L and M is king size as well as regular. Both have the same low price. Both have the miracle tip for the effective filtration you need. Yes, it's the filter that counts. And L and M has the best. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine, a light and mild smoke. Yes, this is it. L and M filters, just what the doctor ordered. Buy a carton, king size. Or regular, both at the same low price. L and M filters, America's highest quality and best filter tip cigarette. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Lawrence Dobkin, V.V. Janis, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Next week at this same time, Chesterfield will bring you another transcribed story of the Western Frontier on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. What a pair. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. <laughs> Dylan? 
Dylan. Oh, hello, Chester. I sure am glad you're back. I've only been gone a couple of hours. Well, that's all it takes, a couple of hours. Oni Becker's been shot. Huh? Oni Becker? You know him, that little sodbuster lives out near Clear Spring. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's up at Doc. Do you want to see him? Yeah. Well, tell me about it, Chester. Well, sir, all I know is he was gambling this morning over at the Texas Trail. He left there a little afternoon, and then some fellas found him laying in an alley with a bullet in him. Well, can he talk? No, sir. He's been unconscious the whole time. But Doc's working on him in here. Oh. Oh, hello, Matt. How is he, Doc? He's dead, Matt. About ten minutes ago. Oh. I need Becker. Now, who'd have shot a harmless little man like that? Harmless is right. He didn't even have a pocket knife on him. And besides, he was shot in the back. Maybe it was an accident of some kind. Accident? Chester, I once tried to save a man who'd pulled a scythe across the back of his neck by accident. Yes, and I remember a boy who fell between the slats of a fence and got hung. But I never heard of a man shooting himself in the back by accident. Well, I meant maybe somebody else done it. Of course somebody else did it. I know that. I meant by mistake. Oh, Chester. Chester, are you sure you've been keeping your hat on when you're walking around in the sun? Oh, you're just mad because Oni Becker died on you, There was nothing I could do to save him. He bled to death. Inside. Oh, you did what you could, Doc. Yes, well, I I think I did. Did the... Arne, say anything? Anything at all? No, Matt. He never even opened his eyes. Well, he was shot in the back, so it wasn't anybody he was fighting with. Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. Only was fighting or at least having an argument over a car this morning with that gambler, what's his name, Al Clovis, over the Texas Trail. He was. Well, why didn't you say so before, Chester? Well, I, I never heard of this uh, Al Clovis. Oh, he's only been here about a week, Doc. Chester, you wait here. I'm going over the Texas Trail. Hello, John. Looking for somebody, Matt? Oh, hiya, Kitty. Uh, is Al Clovis here? I was wondering when you'd get around to him. Uh, what do you mean? I heard about Oni Becker, and Al Clovis threatened him this noon just before Oni went out and got shot. Uh, Almost seemed like Al was trying to start a fight with him, Matt. Where was Clovis when it happened, Kitty? He wasn't in here. Uh, Kitty, you know Al Clovis better than I do. Would you say he's the... Kind of a man who would murder Odie Becker because of an argument over cards, you know, shoot him in the back. I don't know him that well, Matt. Yeah, well, maybe he had another reason to kill him. If he did it. Shooting little Oni Becker is like shooting a pet deer. It makes about as much sense. Yeah. But usually when a man gets murdered, there's a reason of some kind for it. You mean it'd take more than plain anger to follow a man down an alley and shoot him in the back? Well, ordinarily it would. Oh, Clovis must have wanted Oni dead for some special reason, Matt. Maybe Oni had something on him. Yeah, maybe. He was in here a while ago, but he left. Well, I'll find him. He might be at the depot, Matt. Uh, at the depot? He said something about going to St. Louis. Now everything's been taken care of here. I didn't know what he meant at the time, but he said it loud, and I know the train leaves at 4.30. 4.30? Uh, That's about that now, isn't it? Well, maybe he said it just to throw you off his trail. Yeah, well, I'll find out. I'll see you later, Kitty. You better hurry, Matt. This is George Fenneman. In choosing your cigarette, be sure to remember this. You will like Chesterfield best because only Chesterfield has the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. Tobaccos that are highest in quality, low in nicotine, best for you. You and I smoke for relaxation, for comfort, for satisfaction. And in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like a Chesterfield. Get a carton of Chesterfield today. 
Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. Both at the same price in most places. In regular or king size, you can get them either way. The best smoke ever made the Chesterfield you buy today. Smokers coast to coast are changing, it's a cinch to do. Here's all you have to say to get the one that's best for you. Chesterfield's for me, Chesterfield's for me. You just say it's Chesterfield's for me. More card go, Mr. Dillon. If Al Clovis ain't in there, he ain't on this train. Well, he might have fooled us after all, Chester. Chester, he could be riding west while we're heading east. We'll never find him if he is. Well, let's take a look into this car before we walk in, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I sure don't see him. Not in there, I don't. Yeah. yeah unless that's him down there, lying back with his hat pulled over his face. It could be. Well, it better be. Now, come on. Okay, sir. Hey, wake up, mister. Mm. Come on, come on, wake up. Mm. Quit bothering me. What do you want here? Marshal Dillon. Huh. What are you doing here? Keep your hands on your knees, Clovis. Tight. Well, what's this all about, Marshal? You carrying a gun? Why should I carry a gun? Stand up, Clovis. Come on, stand up. Okay. What for? All right, search him, Chester. Yes, sir. Now, keep the one side of him out of my way. Don't you try nothing, Clovis. Well, why should I? I told you I wasn't armed. No, ain't nothing on him. All right. Okay, you can sit down, Clovis. I don't understand this, Marshal. What are you looking for? I'm looking for the man who murdered Oni Becker this afternoon. <laughs> you mean you followed me and got on this train because you thought I killed Oni? It's about 100 miles to Great Bend, Clovis. We'll get off there and take tomorrow's train back to Dodge. Oh, you're making a big mistake, Marshal. While you're riding up and down on this railroad, whoever did kill Oni Becker's leaving the country for good. You'll never catch him now. What you're trying to say is that you don't admit killing him yourself, isn't it? I'm not a murderer, Marshal. No, we'll see. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You heard Oni and I had a little argument this morning. Didn't you? Sure. That doesn't prove anything. I argue with lots of men. You threatened to kill him. Ah, that was just to scare him. He was being kind of stubborn about it all. You know what those farmers are like. But I suppose it takes a stubborn man to grow potatoes. Well, if you're so innocent, why did you announce everything had been taken care of and that you were going to St. Louis? Did I say that, Marshal? You know, Clovis, I can always kick you in the head and take you back to Dodge in a sack. Now, why did you run? I'm not running. There's no reason why I should. That's the truth, Marshal. Where were you when Oni Becker was killed? <laughs> I was wondering when you'd ask me that. I suppose you got an alibi. You know Mr. Botkin, don't you, Marshal? I ought to. Botkin's run the Dodge Bank ever since it was an old whiskey barrel. Well, I was with him in his office at the bank, Marshal. I suppose you'll take his word for it. Yeah, sure I will. Well, we were discussing the money I placed in the bank when I arrived in Dodge a week ago. $5,000, Marshal. Mr. Botkin is going to transfer it to St. Louis for me. Chester. Yes, sir? Go up and tell the engineer to stop the train at Jane's Crossing. Stop the train? There's a ranch about a mile from there where we can borrow some horses. Well, I thought you said we were spending the night at Great Bend, Marshal. I changed my mind, Clovis. Your story doesn't make much sense, and I want to get back to Dodge and find out why. <laughs> Hey, 
it must be about midnight. Sure is, and I'm tired. Haven't been on a horse in years. Oh, well, why didn't you say so, Clovis? We'd have borrowed a wagon for you. Never mind, Chester. Now, you take him on down to the jail and lock him up, huh? I'm going to stop here at Mr. Botkin's house. His light's still on. Want me to go in with you, Marshal? I'll let you know what he has to say, Clovis. I'll be along in a little while, Chester. All right, sir. Matt Dillon, Mr. Barkin. Oh. Uh, well, Marshal, come in. Come in. I wouldn't have bothered you this late, Mr. Barkin, but I saw your light was on and I figured you were still up. Up? Of course I'm up. How could I sleep tonight? Uh, why? What's wrong? Where have you been, Marshal? The whole town of Dodge has been looking for you. Fine time for you to be up riding off somewhere, I must say. Well, tell me what happened. What happened? Don't you know even yet? What are you doing here at my house? Well, if you'll calm down, I'll tell you. You tell me, I'd better tell you, Marshal. While you're out gallivanting around in the prairie somewheres, my bank was held up. What? About five o'clock, just as we were closing. Three men that got away with over $25,000. Every cent of cash I had in that vault, Marshal. Well, didn't anybody try to follow them? No, they tied me and them cashiers up so tight they were miles out of town before we could get loose. A few men saw him leave, but they were afraid to do anything about it. And, of course, the United States Marshal, he wasn't even in town. Did you get a look at him? No. No, they were masked. Nobody I found can even identify their horses. They're just gone, Marshal, with $25,000. Look, Mr. Buck, and I came here to ask you a question. It might have something to do with your bank being robbed. Oh? Well, what is it? Was Al Clovis with you in your office about noon today? Clovis? Yes, he was for a couple of hours. Why? He had some money on deposit? Yeah. That $5,000 cash. Of course, that's gone, too. That's part of the money they took. I'm afraid Clovis is broke now. Along with me and a lot of other people. Well, maybe he isn't as broke as you think. Oh, he's broke. Unless you can get that money back, Marshal. Look, I got an idea. I might find it for you, Mr. Barkin. And it won't take very long, either. all locked up, Mr. Dillon. He won't be taking no more trains for a while. Good. What'd you find out from Mr. Botkin? And I'll tell you and Clovis at the same time, Chester. Well, he's right in the first cell. Well, Marshal, come to turn me loose. Mr. Botkin says your alibi is good, Clovis. If you'd have believed me in the first place, you'd have saved us all a lot of trouble. Yeah. Well, let me out. I don't want to spend the night here. You better get used to it, Clovis. You're going to be spending a lot of nights in here. What? At least a month or two of them. No. They can't keep me here, Marshal. It's illegal. Is it? Of course it is. Well, maybe you know more about the law than I do, Clovis, but I run this jail, and you're going to stay here a long time. Now, what's more, I'm going to tell the whole town where you are. Come on, Chester. Marshal, I demand to be released at once. Now, come back here. It'll cost you your job if you keep me here. Shut the door, Chester. Marshal, you can't do this. Marshal. You really gonna keep him locked up, Mr. Dillon? I am. But he ain't done nothing. I mean, if Mr. Botkin said he is with him... Oh, Clovis didn't kill only Becker, if that's what you mean. Well, then why don't you turn him loose? Chester, the bank was robbed at $25,000 today. It was? Yeah, just after we got on the train. Looks to me like Oni Becker was murdered just to get me to follow Al Clovis out of town. Well. well... We'll find out in a few minutes. I don't think Clovis can stand the idea of sitting in jail while his partners ride off with all that money. You mean he was supposed to get out of here and meet them as soon as his alibi was made good, huh? 
That's the only way it makes sense to me. Marshal. Marshal Dillon. Well, it didn't take as long as I thought. Come on. Marshal, I got to talk to you. All right, go ahead. You really going to keep me in jail here? You mean that? That's all you wanted? Don't bother don't, me again. Don't, don't go, Marshal. What do you want, then? It's late, Clovis. I want to get to bed. Uh, Marshal, I'll make you a deal. About what? If I help you get back whatever was stolen from the bank today, can I keep my 5000 out of it? How did you know the bank was robbed, Clovis? You're smart, Marshal. I can tell you got this all figured, holding me in jail and all. But I'm smart, too. Are you? Smart enough to know you need me as much as I need you. You'll never find those men without me, Marshal. But I can take you to where they are, and I'll identify them for you. Why? All I want out of it is my $5,000. Now, that's mine. You can do what you like with the rest. The court will have to decide about your 5000 not me. Will you think there's a chance I might get it? Well, I don't know. But you're a gambler, aren't you? It'll help my showing you where they are, won't it? Yeah, it'll help. Okay. I'm supposed to meet them tonight or early tomorrow, Marshal. They won't wait longer than that. All right, who are they? Clint? They're not friends of mine, Marshal. I never saw them before two weeks ago in St. Louis. And they're all hiding behind summer names. Yeah. How far is the way the meeting place? Hey, it's an old cabin, about 20 miles from here. They there now? Nobody stopped them here, did they? No, thanks to you. But I'm helping you now, Marshal. If I find your partners, you are. Chester, hmm? go get our horses. We going out there tonight, Mr. Dillon? Would you rather try it in broad daylight, Chester? No, sir. One-way cigarettes, one size, that is, are almost obsolete because they just don't give smokers what they want. Either way, you'll like Chesterfield best. It's America's most popular two-way cigarette because only Chesterfield gives you the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. Tobaccos that are highest in quality, low in nicotine, best for you. You and I smoke for relaxation, for comfort, for satisfaction. And in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like a Chesterfield. You smoke with the greatest possible pleasure when your cigarette is Chesterfield. Yes, these six words, highest in quality, low in nicotine, mean Chesterfield is best for you. Get a carton of Chesterfield. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size both at the same price in most places. Sure you can find this cabin, Clovis? I made the ride out here one night just to be sure. I swear I can't hardly see nothing. I wish that moon wasn't all scudded up with clouds. Chester, you still don't understand that if you can see them, they can see you. Chester, I know you're right, Mr. Dillon. It sure looks like rain, though. We're almost there. Good. Uh, Marshal. Yeah. How are you going to take them, three men? What's the matter, Clovis? You getting scared? Uh, you know what they'll, what they'll do to me if you don't take them, Marshal. Now, like I said, you're a gambler, aren't you? 
Hey, look, why don't you give me a gun? I'll help you. We'll manage. You can trust me, Marshal. I'm on your side now. Clovis, I wouldn't trust a man like you if you were in church praying. Wait. Somewhere over there. Ooh. Yeah. There it is. A little clump of elder. The cabin's in there. Eh? Can you see the light? Yeah, yeah. Are you sure that's it? Of course I am. Okay, let's get out. Chester, I'm going to go up on foot and have a look. You stay here with Clovis. Okay, Chief. What if they hear him and come out and shoot him? Mr. Dillon ain't exactly green at this game, Clovis. <laughs> they wouldn't kill me. They'd burn me or something first. Can't blame them much. I wish I'd stayed in jail. Wished I'd let them keep the money. Something's sure to go wrong here. Unless maybe I outsmart him. You ain't gonna outsmart nobody, Clovis, so forget about it. Okay, okay. I declare I never seen a darker night than this is. No. Neither did I. Here, get off. Get off. Uh, uh, get off. What's the matter? It's my horse. He's standing on my foot. We'll push him off. I can't. Oh, help me, Chester. No, for pity's sake. Come on. Ow. Move him. That's all you gotta do. Back. Uh, Here, what are you doing? Clovis? I got your gun, Chester. Now shut up. Don't move. But you give shut me up, that I said. gun. I... That's better. What's that? Thunder, Clovis. You'll be hearing a different kind when Mr. Dillon gets back here. He's not coming back here. We're going to him. And if he shoots anybody, it'll be you, because you're going to be right in front of me. Like this. All right. Start walking, Chester. Go on. That's far enough. Stop here. We'll pick up the marshal now and go on to the cabin. Now call him and tell him how you're fixed. Go on and call him. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? He ain't nowhere around Yes, here. he is. Tell him. Go on. Clovis got my gun, Mr. Dillon. Tell him if he doesn't walk over here with his hands up, I'll shoot you. He's going to take us both to the cabin, Mr. Dillon. He says he'll shoot me. You heard him, Marshal. I'll kill him, sure, if you try anything. He ain't close enough. I tell you, he's probably clear up there at the cabin. Okay. Okay, start walking, Chester. Go straight ahead. Once I get you inside the cabin, he'll have to give up. Unless he wants you dead. You hurt, Chester? No, sir. His gun just went off when you hit him. All right, get the gun quick. Come on, come on. I got it, Mr. Dillon. All right, let's get up to that cabin. They know we're out here now. Oh, they're getting away, Mr. Dillon. They're gone. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I just don't know what to say. And don't say anything. Let's try to find our horses. We'll get Clovis later. We'll never find them horses in the dark this way. Uh, rain. Well, that's it. There won't be a track left now. Well, there go three killers and $25,000. John, I, I just feel awful about this. How'd he get your gun away from you anyway? Well, see, he said his horse was standing on his foot. So, I so was... you walked up and let him pull your gun right out of the holster, huh? Yes, sir. That's about the way it happened. Dylan, you should have let him take me into that cabin. They'd have killed me, but you could have caught them. 
They wouldn't have got away like they did. Yeah, I know. I was close enough to hear what Clovis said. Well, then why'd you save me? Everything would have been okay. Oh, had... yeah. Yeah, everything would have been okay. Oh, most everything, Chester. Well, let's just don't stand here in the rain talking about it. Come on. My, what a terrible mess. Ah, it was my choice, Chester. Not yours. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. Dillon? Would you like a whorehound drop? L and M filters are sweeping the country, and the reason's simple. No filter compares with L&M's exclusive miracle tip for quality or for effectiveness. And notice how easy it draws. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine. Yes, only L&M gives you effective filtration, and no other cigarette has it. Our statement of quality goes unchallenged. L&M is America's highest quality and best filter tip cigarette. Buy L and M's, now king size or regular, both at the same low price. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner and Lawrence Dobkin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Remember next week at this same time, Chesterfield will bring you another transcribed story of the Western Frontier on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. size, regular, both at the same low price. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. William Conrad, a transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Look in the window over there. In the restaurant, Mr. Dillon. What? And Doc's got himself a girl. What? Well, I'll be... <laughs> I never saw her before, Chester. 
He's waving at us. He wants us to come in. Oh, all right. Now, look, you come in and say hello and then go on out of the telegraph office. Huh? Might be important. Okay, sir. Now, that girl must be a real good friend, Mr. Dillon, if Doc's buying her dinner. Yeah, if he is. He better be. Hey, she ain't half ugly. Shh. I uh, wouldn't put it exactly that way to her. Oh, well, hello Chester. there, Matt. <laughs> Chester. Hello, Doc. Hello, Doc. Ah, well, Abby. Abby, this is Marshal Dillon. And Chester Proudfoot. Abby Twilling. How do you do, gentlemen? Miss Twilling. How do you do? <laughs> sit down, sit down. Well, thank you, Doc. Well, I- I'll be back directly, Doc. i got to go across to the depot. <laughs> There's a telegraph waiting for Mr. Dillon. I'll be here, Chester. Okay, sir. I'll hurry. Doc's been... Uh... Telling me about you, Marshal. Oh. Oh, now don't look at me like that, now, man. <laughs> and she wants to know all about Dodge, and I've been trying to tell her uh, what to expect. <laughs> well, in Dodge, you can expect almost anything, Miss Twilling. So I hear. But Abby's seen her share of violence, Matt. She was a nurse in the war. Oh. Well, that's how I met Doc. We worked in the same hospital for nearly a year. Oh, oh best dog out nurse I ever saw. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to talk her into settling down here. Oh, Dodge could use somebody like her. Are you moving on, Miss Twilling? Why, I... I haven't any plans, Marshal. I've been working in St. Louis, but it's lonely, and I got restless and decided to ride the Santa Fe as far west as it goes. <laughs> I'm on sort of a vacation, you might say. Somebody on the train mentioned my name, and she looked me up right off. Well, it's been a long time, Doc. Oh, yeah, too long. Oh, you stay here, Abby. We'll keep you busy. Uh, Oh, yes, and who knows? Maybe we'll even find you a husband. (laughs) Uh, Oh, oh, my, I'm sorry. That's all right, Doc. You see, my husband was killed in the war, Marshal, the first year. That's why I went into nursing. Oh, I see. Well, my... I think I'd better get back to the hotel. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, I'll take you, Abby. Yes. <laughs> You're going to wait here for Chester, Matt? Oh, he's coming now. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet you, Miss Twilling. Thank you, Marshal. Good night. Good night. I'll see you later, Doc. Sure, Matt. This way, Abby. Uh, well, Chester. Uh, Miss Twilling, Doc. Well, I, I got it, Mr. Dillon. Here you are. Oh, thanks, Chester. Sit down while I read it. Who's it from? Oh, it's from Wyatt Earp, out in Arizona. It is? Is he coming here? No. No, it says, uh, Coney Thorne, released from state prison last week. I hear he's looking for you, so you better go on wearing that gun a while longer. Good luck, W. Earp. Who's Coney Thorne, Mr. Dillon? What's he want of you? Well, I expect he wants to kill me, Chester. What? What for? Well, I arrested him out in Arizona a long time ago. He was one of the suspects in the stage holdup. So I had to bring him in, even though I thought he had nothing to do with it. Well, then why'd he go to prison? Well, I wasn't on the jury, Chester. And anyway, I left that part of the country before he was tried. I heard later that he was sent to prison. Well, you didn't have nothing to do with it. No, I arrested him. And according to this telegram, he thinks I had a lot to do with it. And he's really coming here, huh? Coney Thorne wasn't a bad man, Chester. But prison may have changed him some. Yeah, he'll probably be here next week sometime. <laughs> filters are sweeping the country. L&M, the filter tip cigarette everyone's talking about. Everyone's changing to. Here's what John Robert Powers told us. I never realized a filter cigarette could taste this good, and at the same time, filter so much more effectively. I'm convinced this is it. And Patricia Morrison says, I changed to L&M filters, and I'm so glad I did. Because here's a filter cigarette that really tastes the way a cigarette should. David Wayne wrote, L&M's have the best filter of them all. Miracle Tip is right. There's nothing like it. Yes, L&M filters are truly sweeping the country, breaking more sales records every day. The reason? 
It's the filter that counts, and no filter compares with L&M's Miracle Tip. Notice how easy it draws. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine. Yes. This is it. L&M filters. This is it. Something new. Now two sizes. L&M filters. New king size and regular two. This is it. L&M filters. L&M filters with the miracle tip. So join the trend to L&M. King size, regular. Both at the same low price. of things I didn't like about being a lawman, and having to face a man who was out purely for revenge was one of them. It didn't matter what his reasons were. When Coney Thorne arrived, I had to shoot it out with him. A man who'd traveled all the way to Dodge City from Arizona wasn't going to be put off by argument. However, a week passed and he didn't show up, and I began to hope that maybe he had changed his mind. Until one day when I was sitting with Kitty watching the crowd from the porch of the Dodge House. Well, must be supper time. Here comes the noon stage. <laughs> the way he's driving those horses, he shouldn't be late. <laughs> he's never been on time yet unless there was an Indian scare going on. Not many passengers. Three. No, another one getting out. Yeah. All strangers. No, not all of them, Kitty. Not to me. What? That last man I got out. I've been waiting for him. Coney Thorne. I might as well get this over with right now. Uh, look, Kitty, you uh, better go inside, huh? Yeah, I sure will. Good luck, man. Yeah. took you so long. I was expecting you last week. How'd you know I was coming? Now, you must have told somebody. You got friends everywhere, ain't you, Marshal? I never thought you had anything to do with that holdup, Coney. I told you at the time I was sorry I had to take you in. I've been five years in prison, Marshal, no matter what you thought. I'm not apologizing. But you're free now, Coney. Why do you want to die? What makes you think I'm going to die? Well, a man in prison doesn't get much chance to handle a gun. You must be pretty rusty by now. A lot of ways to kill a man, Marshal. In the back? Think about it. Now, you've changed, Coney. You were a man once. Five years in prison, Marshal, wasn't any good. Nearly went crazy. I would have till I got to thinking about who put me there. That saved my mind, kind of. Yeah, but you're out now. It's all over. No, not yet. I ain't gonna fight you, Marshal. Not till I'm ready. Not till I figure out how to kill you. I'm gonna make you go crazy waiting the way I've done. And I'll sleep all the better knowing you're gonna have to have one eye open every minute from now on. You're not the first man who's wanted to kill me. Maybe not. But I'm gonna be the first to do it. Oh, oh, there you are. Good morning, Matt. Ah, hello, Doc. Well, how come you're up so early? Well, I got a call last night, Matt, about three o'clock. A fellow of the Dodge House was keeping everybody awake. Huh? <laughs> Well, it sounds more like they should have called me. No, no, he wasn't drunk, man. He was delirious. It was brain fever, most people call it. Oh? Well, I couldn't leave him there alone, so I got Abby Twilling to take a room next to his. Uh, the first chance you got, you put her to work, huh? Well, a man that sick has to have care, Matt. Well, you talk like he's going to die. <laughs> Not with Abby working on him. No, <laughs> he isn't. Well, that's fine. Yeah, the man's name is Coney Thorne, Matt. What? Yeah, he won't be up and about for another week, though. I thought he looked sick when he got off the stage yesterday. Well, he was. Now, maybe it was the fever that made him talk like he was 
planning to shoot me in the back. What's that? Yeah, that wasn't like Coney. He was never that kind of a man. Good morning, Mr. Dillon. Doc. Oh, good morning, Chester. Oh, where'd you get that mail at this hour? It ain't mail, Doc. It's a telegraph here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, you know, sometimes I wish they'd never invented the telegraph. But maybe it's Washington, Matt, offering you a raise. <laughs> they'd send me last month's check by mail, I'd be satisfied. Well, what is it, Mr. Dillon? It's from a U.S. Marshal in Phoenix. He says if Coney Thorne has left Arizona, he's broken his parole. And if he turns up here looking for me, to arrest him. I didn't know he was on parole. No, neither did I. But they're willing to pay the expense of sending him back under escort. You going all the way to Arizona with him, Mr. Dillon? No, 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 of course not. I'll hire somebody. Well, you can't put that man in jail, Matt. Now, why not? He's uh... too sick. And I won't have Abby nursing a man in jail. It's bad enough in the hotel. Well, as long as he can't run away. He'll be in bed for a week. And if you don't tell him about this, he won't run anyway. Okay, Doc. I'll, I'll leave him alone. For a week. I kept track of Coney's progress through Doc. And the rest of Dodge did, too. Everybody in town knew he'd come there to shoot me, and it seemed like they were all waiting for him to get well and try it. And there were a number of men who would have been right happy if he'd done it. I waited for over a week, and he was still in bed. So finally, I went over to the hotel to have a talk with him. Oh, Marshal Dillon. Hello, Abby. Uh, can, can we come in? Why, of course, come in. Thank you. Hello, Chester. Hello, Miss Twilling. Now, oh, where's your patient? Oh, this is my room, Marshal. He's right through there. I have it arranged this way so he won't be disturbed. Now, is, uh, is he still sick, Abby? He's better. Well, Doc says that he could get up. Please, Marshal, give him a little more time, a couple of days. It's very important. It is? I know what he came here for. It doesn't matter to you if he stays in bed a while longer, does it? No, but uh, if he's well, why are you keeping him in bed? It's good for him. Coney needs a rest like this. You've no idea how much he needs it. Please, Marshal. Uh, Abby. Yes? You, uh, you, you've got to know Coney pretty well, haven't you? Yes, I have. What kind of a man would you say he is? He's a good man, Marshal. But he's suffered a lot being in prison the way he was. And, well, it, it's like soldiers I've seen who've been through too much. They change for a while, anyway. But if they're given a chance, the right kind of a chance, they find their way back sometimes. Uh, uh, that, that's what you're doing, giving him a chance, huh? I'm trying, Marshal. Well, how does he feel about it? I'm not sure yet. Uh, uh Chester. Yes, sir? I changed my mind about talking to Connie. Thank you, Marshal. I, uh, guess I'll know how you make out, Abby, one way or the other. I swear I don't understand what she was talking about, Mr. Dillon. Well, I don't understand it either, Chester, but uh, my guess is that Abby's fallen in love with him. What? <laughs> that, that don't make sense. That seldom does. That doesn't keep it from happening. No, sir. Kind of scary, ain't it? Well, Abby's a little scared. She's not sure about Coney. But anyway, he trusts her enough to have told her about being out on parole. That's why she figured I'd heard about it and had come to arrest him. What you gonna do? Well, Abby asked for a couple of more days, Chester. I think she deserves them. Kitty, I'm just coming in to say hello. Oh, the air's better out here, Matt. 
I never saw that saloon so crowded as it is tonight. Oh, a couple of new herds arrived today. Yeah, I know. I danced with every cowboy that came with them. I had to get out of there while I could still walk. <laughs> well, as long as they're dancing, they're not fighting. Oh, you ever dance with one of them, Mutt? Oh, is it that bad? Oh. Dylan? Hello, Miss Kitty. Evening, Chester. Mr. Dillon, right across the street there, I, I, I just seen Coney Thorne. What? Well, where was he headed? He, he was knocking on the front door of the stage office, and nobody didn't answer, so he went around back. Oh. Uh, I'll see you later, Kitty. Sure. Looks like Coney's trying to run off, Mr. Dillon. Well, there's no stage till tomorrow morning, Chester. Besides, he doesn't know I'm going to arrest him. Well, at least he didn't come gunning for you as soon as he got out of bed. Well, maybe he wants to be sure of a seat on the stage first. He said he went around to the back of the office. Yes, sir, right up the alley here. Yeah. Look, uh, you better stay back a little, huh? Hmm? Being in bed so long might have made Coney a little nervous. Well, yes, sir. He didn't hit me. But I didn't hit him either. He had a horse waiting out there. Come on, if we hurry, we can still follow him. Every day. The reason? It's the filter that counts. And no filter compares with L&M's Miracle Tip for quality or effectiveness. And notice how easy it draws. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine. Effective filtration. Our statement of quality goes unchallenged. L&M is America's highest quality and best filter tip cigarette. Buy L&M King Size. Buy L&M Regular. Buy L&M's by the carton. King Size. Regular. Both at the same low price. L&M. Light and mild. the full moon to help us, Chester and I didn't have much trouble staying on Coney Thorne's trail once we hit it. We pulled up now and then and listened, and we could hear his horse running hard, not too far ahead of us. But he didn't run long. Coney had made a poor choice in the mount that he'd stolen and had sold on him within an hour. We found the horse standing riderless with his head down, his legs weak and quivering. That poor horse is plumb bedrock, Mr. Dillon. He ought to be shot. Oh, never mind the horse, Chester. Let's find Coney. He can't be very far. There's no place to hide out here. Huh. There's something over there, Chester. Hmm? Off to the left there. Hmm. It ain't moving. Yeah, well, let's take a look. Look, you ride straight from here, and I'll come in on an angle. Okay, sir. Chester, but be careful. Is he dead, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester, but he's all through shooting. Yeah, Chester... Yes, sir. Go down here, take a look. Well, that ain't Coney Thorn. No. You ever seen this man before? No, sir. I don't know who it is. He ain't dead. No, 
know, but he's bleeding pretty bad. I'm afraid he soon will be. Who are you, fellow? Hey, what's your name? Marshal. Yeah, that's right, I'm the Marshal. Now, why did you try to shoot me back in Dodge tonight? You can't do nothing to me now. No harm in talking. I heard that fellow was going to shoot you. That Coney Thorn? I don't know his name. I don't know nothing about him. Well, then what's he got to do with your trying to shoot me? Nothing. Only I figured I could do it, and they'd blame him. Well, why? I never saw you before. Why did you want to shoot me? Kill a marshal? That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? Kill a marshal? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be pretty good. Didn't work. Shooting you had done him. Well, it made him feel better for some reason, Jesse. But why? I don't know. That's the idea of shooting a marshal and getting away with it, I guess. He didn't have any more sensible a reason. No, sir. Well, let's get him buried. It'll be daylight before we get back to Dodge as it is. I still got to find Coney. <laughs> Mr. Dillon is just about to leave. We got back just in time. Now, why would Coney be taking the stage? He hasn't finished his business here yet. No, but he was trying to get in the office when I seen him last night. Well, by heaven, there he is. Yes, sir, and Abby, too. Now, what are they up to? Now, let's ask him. Let him stand, Chuck. Yes, sir. You, uh, going someplace, Coney? Well, I heard about last night, Marshal. But it wasn't me he shot at you. You know it wasn't. I found the man that did it. I ain't gonna kill you. That's all over, Marshal. It is? It was like being crazy, Marshal. For a long time. And I got the fever, and Abby was there talking to me all the time. Taking care of me. Now, somehow, I ain't mad at nobody. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Coney. Being in prison so long when I was innocent, it was bad, Marshal. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Coney, uh, you shouldn't have left Arizona. You broke your parole. I'm going to have to send you back. He's going back, Marshal. Right now. With me. What? We're going to be married. And, and then he's going to turn himself in. Is that true, Coney? I'll get another year. But Abby says it's the only way. You're going to get married, huh? We'll make out, Marshal. But please, please don't arrest him here. Let him go alone with me. It isn't much. You can give him that. Chester. Yes, sir? Go over to the telegraph office and write something out and send it to the Marshal in Phoenix, huh? Well, what'll I say? Tell him thanks for the warning. And tell him if Coney Thorne did leave Arizona and came here to shoot me, I'd arrest him quick. But knowing Coney, I think he's learned his lesson. He's got more sense. Yes, sir. Now get going. (laughs) All of you. Now our star, William Conrad. 
Thank you. If you're a filter tip smoker, you should be smoking l ms Everyone agrees l ms are just what the doctor ordered. The first filter that really does the job and a real good taste to go with it. Maybe you'll prefer l ms king size, as I do. But either size, I know you'll like them, and I know you'll stick with them. l ms Try them. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vivi Janis, and James Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. The makers of L&M Filters also present for your television pleasure the new Stu Irwin Show. It's a happy half hour with June and Stu Irwin, which begins October 20th in most cities. Please check your local television listings for time and channel for L&M's Stu Irwin Show. Hear Gunsmoke every Saturday, this same time, this same station. Hear the great new Perry Como radio show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, also on CBS Radio. CBS Radio Network. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.